Story One of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling. Mowgli's Brothers. Now ran the kite, brings home the night that mang the bat sets free. The herds are shut in byre and hut, for loosed till dawn are we. This is the hour of pride and power, talon and tush and claw. Oh, hear the call, good hunting all, that keep the jungle law. Night Song in the Jungle It was seven o'clock on a very warm evening in the Sioni Hills, when Father Wolf woke up from his day's rest, scratched himself, yawned and spread out his paws one after the other, to get rid of the sleepy feeling in their tips. Mother Wolf lay with her big gray nose dropped across her four tumbling, squealing cubs, and the moon shone into the mouth of the cave where they all lived. Arr, said Father Wolf, it is time to hunt again. He was going to spring downhill when a little shadow with a bushy tail crossed the threshold and whined, Good luck go with you, O oh chief of the wolves and good luck and strong white teeth go with noble children that they may never forget the hungry in this world it was the jackal tabaki the dish licker and the wolves of india despise tabaki because he runs about making mischief and telling tales and eating rags and pieces of leather from the village rubbish heaps but they are afraid of him too because tabaki more than anyone else in the jungle is apt to go mad, and then he forgets that he was ever afraid of anyone, and runs through the forest biting everything in his way. Even the tiger runs and hides when little Tabaki goes mad, for madness is the most disgraceful thing that can overtake a wild creature. We call it hydrophobia, but they call it Dewani, the madness, and run. Enter then and look, said Father Wolf stiffly, but there is no food here. For a wolf, no, said Tabaki, but for so mean a person as myself, a dry bone is a good feast. Who are we, the gilder log, the jackal people, to pick and choose? He scuttled to the back of the cave, where he found the bone of a buck with some meat on it, and sat cracking the end merrily. All thanks for this good meal, he said, licking his lips. How beautiful are the noble children! How large are their eyes! And so young, too! Indeed, indeed, I might have remembered that the children of kings are men from the beginning. Now, Tabaki knew, as well as anyone else, that there is nothing so unlucky as to compliment children to their faces. It pleased him to see Mother and Father Wolf look uncomfortable. Tabaki sat still rejoicing in the mischief that he had made, and then he said spitefully, Shere Khan, the big one, has shifted his hunting grounds. He will hunt among these hills for the next moon, so he has told me. Shere Khan was the tiger who lived near the Wangunga River, twenty miles away. He has no right, Father Wolf began angrily. By the law of the jungle he has no right to change his quarters without due warning. He will frighten every head of game within ten miles, and I, I have to kill for two these days. His mother did not call him Lungri, the lame one, for nothing, said Mother Wolf quietly. He has been lame in one foot from his birth. That is why he has only killed cattle. Now the villagers of the Wangunga are angry with him, and he has come here to make our villagers angry. They will scour the jungle for him when he is far away and we and our children must run when the grass is set alight. Indeed, we are very grateful to Shere Khan. "'Shall I tell him of your gratitude?' said Tabaki. "'Out!' snapped Father Wolf. "'Out and hunt with thy master. Thou hast done harm enough for one night.' "'I go,' said Tabaki quietly. "'Ye can hear Shere Khan below in the thickets. I might have saved myself the message.' Father Wolf listened, and below in the valley that ran down to a little river he heard the dry, angry, snarly sing-song whine of a tiger who has caught nothing, and does not care if all the jungle knows it. The fool, said Father Wolf, to begin a night's work with that noise. Does he think that our buck are like his fat Wangonga bullocks? Hush! It is neither bullock 
nor buck he hunts to-night said mother wolf it is man the wine had changed to a sort of humming purr that seemed to come from every quarter of the compass it was the noise that bewilders woodcutters and gypsies sleeping in the open and makes them run sometimes into the very mouth of the tiger man said father wolf showing all his white teeth Fah! are there not enough beetles and frogs in the tanks that he must eat man and on our ground too the law of the jungle which never orders anything without a reason forbids every beast to eat man except when he is killing to show his children how to kill and then he must hunt outside the hunting grounds of his pack or tribe the real reason for this is that man-killing means sooner or later the arrival of white men on elephants with guns and hundreds of brown men with gongs and rockets and torches then everybody in the jungle suffers the reasons the beasts give among themselves is that man is the weakest and most defenseless of all living things and it is unsportsmanlike to touch him they say and it is true that man-eaters become mangy and lose their teeth the purr grew louder and ended in the full-throated ar of the tiger's charge then there was a howl an untigerish howl from shere khan he has missed said mother wolf what is it father wolf ran out a few paces and heard shere khan muttering and mumbling savagely as he tumbled about in the scrub the fool has had no more sense than to jump at a woodcutter's campfire and has burned his feet said father wolf with a grunt tabaki is with him something is coming uphill said mother wolf twitching one ear get ready the bushes rustled a little in the thicket and father wolf dropped with his haunches under him ready for his leap then if you had been watching you would have seen the most wonderful thing in the world the wolf checked in mid-spring he made his bound before he saw what it was he was jumping at and then he tried to stop himself the result was that he shot up straight into the air for four or five feet landing almost where he left ground man he snapped a man's cub look directly in front of him holding on by a low branch stood a naked brown baby who could just walk as soft and as dimpled a little atom as ever came to a wolf's cave at night he looked up into father wolf's face and laughed is that a man's cub said mother wolf i have never seen one bring it here a wolf accustomed to moving his own cubs can if necessary mouth an egg without breaking it and though father wolf's jaws closed right on the child's back not a tooth even scratched the skin as he laid it down among the cubs how little how naked and how bold said mother wolf softly the baby was pushing his way between the cubs to get close to the warm hide aha he is taking his meal with the others and so this is a man's cub now was there ever a wolf that could boast a man's cub among her children i have heard now and again of such a thing but never in our pack or in my time said father wolf he is altogether without hair and I could kill him with a touch of my foot. But see, he looks up and is not afraid. The moonlight was blocked out of the mouth of the cave, for Shere Khan's great square head and shoulders were thrust into the entrance. Tabaki, behind him, was squeaking, My lord, my lord, it went in here. Shere Khan does us great honor, said Father Wolf, but his eyes were very angry. What does Shere Khan need? My quarry a man's cub went this way said shere khan its parents have run off give it to me shere khan had jumped at a woodcutter's campfire as father wolf had said and was furious from the pain of his burned feet but father wolf knew that the mouth of the cave was too narrow for a tiger to come in by even where he was shere khan's shoulders and forepaws were cramped for want of room as a man's would be if he tried to fight in a barrel the wolves are a free people said father wolf they take orders from the head of the pack and not from any striped cattle killer the man's cub is ours to kill if we choose ye choose and ye do not choose 
What talk is this of choosing? By the bull that I killed, am I to stand nosing into your dog's den for my fair dues? It is I, Sher Khan, who speak. The tiger's roar filled the cave with thunder. Mother Wolf shook herself clear of the cubs and sprang forward, her eyes like two green moons in the darkness, facing the blazing eyes of Sher Khan. And it is I, Raksha, the demon, who answers. The man's cub is mine, Lungri, mine to me. He shall not be killed. He shall live to run with the pack and to hunt with the pack. And in the end, look you, hunter of little naked cubs, frog-eater, fish-killer, he shall hunt thee. Now get hence, or by the sambor that I killed, I eat no starved cattle. Back thou goest to thy mother, burned beast of the jungle, lamer than ever thou camest into the world. Go! Father Wolf looked on amazed. He had almost forgotten the days when he won Mother Wolf in fair fight from five other wolves, when she ran in the pack and was not called the demon for compliment's sake. Shere Khan might have faced Father Wolf, but he could not stand up against Mother Wolf, for he knew that where he was she had all the advantage of the ground, and would fight to the death. So he backed out of the cave mouth, growling, and when he was clear he shouted, Each dog barks in his own yard. We shall see what the pack will say to this fostering of man-cubs. The cub is mine, and to my teeth he will come in the end, O oh, bush-tailed thieves. Mother Wolf threw herself down, panting among the cubs, and Father Wolf said to her gravely, Shere Khan speaks this much truth. The cub must be shown to the pack. Wilt thou still keep him, mother? Keep him, she gasped. He came naked, by night, alone, and very hungry, yet he was not afraid. Look, he has pushed one of my babes to one side already. And that lame butcher would have killed him, and would have run off to the Wangunga while the villagers here hunted through all our lairs in revenge. Keep him? Assuredly I will keep him. Lie still, little frog, O oh, thou Mowgli, for Mowgli the frog I will call thee. The time will come when thou wilt hunt Shere Khan, as he has hunted thee. But what will our pack say? said Father Wolf. The law of the jungle lays down very clearly that any wolf may, when he marries, withdraw from the pack he belongs to, but as soon as his cubs are old enough to stand on their feet, he must bring them to pack council, which is generally held once a month at full moon, in order that the other wolves may identify them. After that inspection the cubs are free to run where they please, and until they have killed their first buck, no excuse is accepted if a grown wolf of the pack kills one of them. The punishment is death where the murderer can be found, and if you think for a minute you will see that this must be so. Father Wolf waited till his cubs could run a little, and then, on the night of the pack meeting, took them and Mowgli and Mother Wolf to the Council Rock, a hilltop covered with stones and boulders, where a hundred wolves could hide. Akela, the great grey lone wolf, who led all the pack by strength and cunning, lay out at full length on his rock, and below him sat forty or more wolves of every size and color, from badger-colored veterans who could handle a buck alone, to young black three-year-olds who thought they could. The lone wolf had led them for a year now. He had fallen twice into a wolf-trap in his youth, and once he had been beaten and left for dead, so he knew the manners and customs of men. There was very little talking at the rock. The cubs tumbled over each other in the center of the circle, where their mothers and fathers sat, and now and again a senior wolf would go quietly up to a cub, look at him carefully, and return to his place on noiseless feet. Sometimes a mother would push her cub far out into the moonlight, to be sure that he was not overlooked. Akela from his rock would cry, Ye know the law, ye know the law, look well, O wolves. And the anxious mothers would take up the call, Look, look well, O wolves. 
At last, and Mother Wolf's neck bristles lifted as the time came, Father Wolf pushed Mowgli the Frog, as they called him, into the center, where he sat laughing and playing with some pebbles that glistened in the moonlight. Akela never raised his head from his paws, but went on with his monotonous cry, Look well! A muffled roar came up from behind the rocks, the voice of Shere Khan crying, The cub is mine, mine to me. What have the free people to do with a man's cub? Akela never even twitched his ears. All he said was, Look well, O wolves. What have the free people to do with the orders of any, save the free people? Look well. There was a chorus of deep growls, and a young wolf in his fourth year flung back Shere Khan's question to Akela. What have the free people to do with a man's cub? Now the law of the jungle lays down that if there is any dispute as to the right of a cub to be accepted by the pack, he must be spoken for by at least two members of the pack who are not his father and mother. "'Who speaks for this cub?' said Akela. "'Among the free people, who speaks?' There was no answer, and Mother Wolf got ready for what she knew would be her last fight, if things came to fighting. Then the only other creature who was allowed at the pack council, Baloo, the sleepy brown bear who teaches the wolf cubs the law of the jungle, old Baloo, who can come and go where he pleases, because he eats only nuts and roots and honey, rose upon his hind quarters and grunted. Hmm. The man's cub, the man's cub, he said. I speak for the man's cub. There is no harm in a man's cub. I have no gift of words, but I speak the truth. Let him run with the pack, and be entered with the others. I myself will teach him. We need yet another, said Akela. Baloo has spoken, and he is our teacher for the young cubs. Who speaks besides Baloo? A black shadow dropped down into the circle. It was Bagheera, the black panther, inky black all over, but with the panther markings showing up in certain lights like the pattern of watered silk. Everybody knew Bagheera, and nobody cared to cross his path, for he was as cunning as Tabaki, as bold as the wild buffalo, and as reckless as the wounded elephant. But he had a voice as soft as wild honey dripping from a tree, and a skin softer than down. O oh, Akela, and ye free people, he purred, I have no right in your assembly, but the law of the jungle says that if there is a doubt which is not a killing matter in regard to a new cub, the life of that cub may be bought at a price. And the law does not say who may or may not pay that price. Am I right? Good, good, said the young wolves, who are always hungry. Listen to Bagheera. The cub can be bought for a price. It is the law. Knowing that I have no right to speak here, I ask your leave. Speak, then, cried twenty voices. To kill a naked cub is shame. Besides, he may make better sport for you when he is grown. Baloo has spoken in his behalf. Now to Baloo's word, I will add one bull, and a fat one, newly killed, not half a mile from here, if ye will accept the man's cub according to the law. Is it difficult? There was a clamor of scores of voices, saying, What matter? He will die in the winter rains, he will scorch in the sun. What harm can a naked frog do us? Let him run with the pack. Where is the bull, Bagheera? Let him be accepted. And then came Akela's deep bay, crying, Look well, look well, O wolves. Mowgli was still deeply interested in the pebbles, and he did not notice when the wolves came and looked at him one by one. At last they all went down the hill for the dead bull, and only Akela, Bagheera, Baloo, and Mowgli's own wolves were left. Shere Khan roared still in the night, for he was very angry that Mowgli had not been handed over to him. "'I roar well,' said Bagheera under his whiskers, "'for the time will come when this naked thing will make thee roar to another tune, or I know nothing of man.' "'It is well done,' said Akela. 
Men and their cubs are very wise. He may be a help in time. Truly a help in time of need, for none can hope to lead the pack forever, said Bagheera. Akela said nothing. He was thinking of the time that comes to every leader of every pack, when his strength goes from him, and he gets feebler and feebler, till at last he is killed by the wolves, and a new leader comes up to be killed in his turn. Take him away, he said to Father Wolf, and train him as befits one of the free people. And that is how Mowgli was entered into the Sioni wolf pack for the price of a bull and on Baloo's good word. Now you must be content to skip ten or eleven whole years, and only guess at all the wonderful life that Mowgli led among the wolves, because if it were written out it would fill ever so many books. He grew up with the cubs, though they, of course, were grown wolves almost before he was a child. And Father Wolf taught him his business, and the meaning of things in the jungle, till every rustle in the grass, every breath of the warm night air, every note of the owls above his head, every scratch of a bat's claws as it roosted for a while in a tree, and every splash of every little fish jumping in a pool, meant just as much to him as the work of his office means to a businessman. When he was not learning, he sat out in the sun and slept, and ate and went to sleep again. When he felt dirty or hot, he swam in the forest pools. And when he wanted honey, Baloo told him that honey and nuts were just as pleasant to eat as raw meat. He climbed up for it, and that Bagheera showed him how to do. Bagheera would lie out on a branch and call, Come along, little brother, and at first Mowgli would cling like the sloth, but afterward he would fling himself through the branches almost as boldly as the gray ape. He took his place at the council rock, too, when the pack met, and there he discovered that if he stared hard at any wolf, the wolf would be forced to drop his eyes, and so he used to stare for fun. At other times he would pick the long thorns out of the pads of his friends, for wolves suffer terribly from thorns and burrs in their coats. He would go down the hillside into the cultivated lands by night, and look very curiously at the villagers in their huts. But he had a mistrust of men, because Bagheera showed him a square box with a drop-gate so cunningly hidden in the jungle that he nearly walked into it, and told him that it was a trap. He loved, better than anything else, to go with Bagheera into the dark warm heart of the forest, to sleep all through the drowsy day, and at night see how Bagheera did his killing. Bagheera killed right and left as he felt hungry, and so did Mowgli, with one exception. As soon as he was old enough to understand things, Bagheera told him that he must never touch cattle, because he had been bought into the pack at the price of a bull's life. "'All the jungle is thine,' said Bagheera, "'and thou canst kill everything that thou art strong enough to kill. But for the sake of the bull that bought thee, thou must never kill or eat any cattle, young or old. That is the law of the jungle.' Mowgli obeyed faithfully. And he grew and grew strong, as a boy must grow, who does not know that he is learning any lessons, and who has nothing in the world to think of except things to eat. Mother Wolf told him once or twice that Shere Khan was not a creature to be trusted, and that some day he must kill Shere Khan. But though a young wolf would have remembered that advice every hour, Mowgli forgot it because he was only a boy, though he would have called himself a wolf if he had been able to speak in any human tongue. Shere Khan was always crossing his path in the jungle, for as Akela grew older and feebler, the lame tiger had come to be great friends with the younger wolves of the pack, who followed him for scraps, a thing Akela would never have allowed if he had dared to push his authority to the proper bounds. Then Shere Khan would flatter them, and wonder that such fine young hunters were content to be led by a dying wolf and a man's cub. They tell me, Shere Khan would say, that at council ye dare not look him between the eyes. 
and the young wolves would growl and bristle. Bagheera, who had eyes and ears everywhere, knew something of this, and once or twice he told Mowgli in so many words that Shere Khan would kill him some day. Mowgli would laugh and answer, I have the pack, and I have thee, and Baloo, though he is so lazy, might strike a blow or two for my sake. Why should I be afraid? It was one very warm day that a new notion came to Bagheera, born of something that he had heard. Perhaps Ikki, the porcupine, had told him, but he said to Mowgli, when they were deep in the jungle, as the boy lay with his head on Bagheera's beautiful black skin, Little brother, how often have I told thee that Shere Khan is thy enemy? As many times as there are nuts on that palm, said Mowgli, who naturally could not count. What of it? I am sleepy, Bagheera, and Shere Khan is all long tail and loud talk, like Mao the peacock. But this is no time for sleeping. Baloo knows it, I know it, the pack knows it, and even the foolish, foolish deer know. Tabaki has told thee, too. Ho, ho, said Mowgli. Tabaki came to me not long ago with some rude talk, that I was a naked man's cub and not fit to dig pig-nuts. But I caught Tabaki by the tail, and swung him twice against the palm-tree, to teach him better manners. That was foolishness, for though Tabaki is a mischief-maker, he would have told thee of something that concerned thee closely. Hope in those eyes, little brother. Shere Khan dare not kill thee in the jungle, but remember, Akela is very old, and soon the day comes when he cannot kill his buck, and then he will be leader no more. Many of the wolves that looked thee over when thou wast brought to the council first are old too. And the young wolves believe, as Shere Khan has taught them, that a man-cub has no place with the pack. In a little time thou wilt be a man. And what is a man that he should not run with his brothers? said Mowgli. I was born in the jungle. I have obeyed the law of the jungle, and there is no wolf of ours from whose paws I have not pulled a thorn. Surely they are my brothers. Bagheera stretched himself at full length and half shut his eyes. "'Little brother,' said he, "'feel under my jaw.' Mowgli put up his strong brown hand, and just under Bagheera's silky chin, where the giant rolling muscles were all hid by the glossy hair, he came upon a little bald spot. "'There is no one in the jungle that knows that I, Bagheera, carry that mark, the mark of the collar. And yet, little brother, I was born among men, and it was among men that my mother died, in the cages of the king's palace at Odepur. It was because of this that I paid the price for thee at the council, when thou wast a little naked cub. Yes, I too was born among men. I had never seen the jungle. They fed me behind bars from an iron pan, till one night— I felt that I was Bagheera, the panther, and no man's plaything, and I broke the silly lock with one blow of my paw and came away. And because I had learned the ways of men, I became more terrible in the jungle than Shere Khan. Is it not so? Yes, said Mowgli. All the jungle fear Bagheera, all except Mowgli. Oh, thou art a man's cub, said the black panther very tenderly. And even as I return to my jungle, so thou must go back to men at last, to the men who are thy brothers, if thou art not killed in the council. But why? But why should any wish to kill me? said Mowgli. Look at me, said Bagheera, and Mowgli looked at him steadily between the eyes. The big panther turned his head away in half a minute. That is why, he said, shifting his paw on the leaves. Not even I can look thee between the eyes, and I was born among men, and I love thee, little brother. The others, they hate thee, because their eyes cannot meet thine, because thou art wise, because thou hast pulled out thorns from their feet, because thou art a man. I did not know these things, said Mowgli sullenly, and he frowned under his heavy black eyebrows. What is the law of the jungle? Strike first, and then give tongue. By thy very carelessness they know that thou art a man. But be wise. 
It is in my heart that when Akela misses his next kill, and at each hunt it costs him more to pin the buck, the pack will turn against him and against thee. They will hold a jungle council at the rock, and then, and then— I have it, said Bagheera, leaping up. Go thou down quickly to the men's huts in the valley, and take some of the red flower which they grow there, so that when the time comes thou mayest have even a stronger friend than I or Baloo or those of the pack that love thee. Get the red flower. By the red flower Bagheera meant fire. Only no creature in the jungle will call fire by its proper name. Every beast lives in the deadly fear of it, and invents a hundred ways of describing it. The red flower, said Mowgli, that grows outside their huts in the twilight? I will get some. There speaks the man's cub, said Bagheera proudly. Remember that it grows in little pots. Get one swiftly, and keep it by thee for time of need. Good, said Mowgli. I go. But art thou sure, O oh my Bagheera? He slipped his arm around the splendid neck and looked deep into the big eyes. Art thou sure that all this is Shere Khan's doing? By the broken lock that freed me, I am sure, little brother. Then by the bull that bought me, I will pay Shere Khan full tale for this, and it may be a little over, said Mowgli, and he bounded away. That is a man, that is all a man, said Bagheera to himself, lying down again. Oh, Shere Khan, never was a blacker hunting than that frog hunt of thine ten years ago. Mowgli was far and far through the forest, running hard, and his heart was hot in him. He came to the cave as the evening mist rose, and drew breath, and looked down the valley. The cubs were out, but Mother Wolf at the back of the cave knew by his breathing that something was troubling her frog. "'What is it, son?' she said. "'Some bat's chatter of Shere Khan,' he called back. "'I hunt among the ploughed fields to-night.' and he plunged downward through the bushes to the stream at the bottom of the valley. There he checked, for he heard the yell of the pack hunting, heard the bellows of a hunted sombre, and the snort as the buck turned at bay. Then there were wicked, bitter howls from the young wolves. Akela, Akela, let the lone wolf show his strength. Room for the leader of the pack. Spring, Akela! The lone wolf must have sprung and missed his hold, for Mowgli heard the snap of his teeth, and then a yelp as the Sambur knocked him over with his forefoot. He did not wait for anything more, but dashed on, and the yells grew fainter behind him as he ran into the croplands where the villagers lived. Bagheera spoke truth, he panted, as he nestled down in some cattle fodder by the window of a hut. Tomorrow is one day both for Akela and for me. Then he pressed his face close to the window, and watched the fire on the hearth. He saw the husbandman's wife get up and feed it in the night with black lumps, and when the morning came and the mists were all white and cold, he saw the man's child pick up a wicker pot plastered inside with earth, fill it with lumps of red-hot charcoal, and put it under his blanket, and go out to tend the cows and the byre. "'Is that all?' said Mowgli. If a cub can do it, there is nothing to fear. So he strode round the corner and met the boy, took the pot from his hand, and disappeared into the mist, while the boy howled with fear. They are very like me, said Mowgli, blowing into the pot as he had seen the woman do. This thing will die if I do not give it things to eat. And he dropped twigs and dried bark on the red stuff. Halfway up the hill he met Bagheera with the morning dew shining like moonstones on his coat. "'Akela has missed,' said the panther. "'They would have killed him last night, but they needed thee also. They were looking for thee on the hill. I was among the ploughed lands. I am ready, see?' Mowgli held up the fire-pot. "'Good. Now I have seen men thrust a dry branch into that stuff, and presently the red flower blossomed at the end of it.' Art thou not afraid? No, why should I fear? I remember now, if it is not a dream, how, before I was a wolf, I lay beside the red flower, and it was warm and pleasant. 
All that day Mowgli sat in the cave tending his fire-pot and dipping dry branches into it to see how they looked. He found a branch that satisfied him, and in the evening, when Tabaki came to the cave and told him rudely enough that he was wanted at the council rock, he laughed till Tabaki ran away. Then Mowgli went to the council, still laughing. Akela, the lone wolf, lay by the side of the rock as a sign that the leadership of the pack was open, and Shere Khan, with his following of scrap-fed wolves, walked to and fro openly, being flattered. Bagheera lay close to Mowgli, and the fire-pot was between Mowgli's knees. When they were all gathered together, Shere Khan began to speak, a thing he would never have dared to do when Akela was in his prime. "'He has no right,' whispered Bagheera. "'Say so. He is a dog's son. He will be frightened.' Mowgli sprang to his feet. "'Free people!' he cried. Does Shere Khan lead the pack? What has a tiger to do with our leadership? Seeing that the leadership is yet open, and being asked to speak, Shere Khan began, By whom, said Mowgli, are we all jackals to fawn on this cattle butcher? The leadership of the pack is with the pack alone. There were yells of silence, thou man's cub. Let him speak. He has kept our law. And at last the seniors of the pack thundered, let the dead wolf speak. When a leader of the pack has missed his kill, he is called the dead wolf as long as he lives, which is not long. Akela raised his old head wearily. Free people, and ye too, jackals of Shere Khan, for twelve seasons I have led ye to and from the kill, and in all that time no one has been trapped or maimed. Now I have missed my kill. Ye know how that plot was made. Ye know how ye brought me up to an untried buck to make my weakness known. It was cleverly done. Your right is to kill me here on the council rock now. Therefore I ask, who comes to make an end of the lone wolf? For it is my right by the law of the jungle that ye come one by one. There was a long hush, for no single wolf cared to fight Akela to the death. Then Shere Khan roared, Bah! What have we to do with this toothless fool? He is doomed to die. It is the man-cub who has lived too long. Free people, he was my meat from the first. Give him to me. I am weary of this man-wolf folly. He has troubled the jungle for ten seasons. Give me the man-cub or I will hunt here always, and not give you one bone. He is a man, a man's child, and from the marrow of my bones I hate him. Then more than half of the pack yelled, A man, a man, what has a man to do with us? Let him go to his own place. And turn all the people of the villages against us? clamored Shere Khan. No, give him to me. He is a man, and none of us can look him between the eyes. Akela lifted his head again and said, He has eaten our food, he has slept with us, he has driven game for us, he has broken no word of the law of the jungle. Also I paid for him with a bull when he was accepted. The worth of a bull is little, but Bagheera's honor is something that he will perhaps fight for, said Bagheera in his gentlest voice. A bull paid ten years ago, the pack snarled. What do we care for bones ten years old? Or for a pledge? said Bagheera, his white teeth bared under his lip. Well are ye called the free people. No man's cub can run with the people of the jungle, howled Shere Khan. Give him to me. He is our brother in all but blood, Akela went on, and ye would kill him here. In truth I have lived too long. Some of ye are eaters of cattle, and others I have heard that, under Shere Khan's teaching, ye go by dark night and snatch children from the villager's doorstep. Therefore I know ye to be cowards, and it is to cowards I speak. It is certain that I must die, and my life is of no worth, or I would offer that in the man-cub's place. But for the sake of the honor of the pack, a little matter that by being without a leader ye have forgotten. I promise 
that if ye let the man-cub go to his own place, I will not, when my time comes to die, bear one tooth against ye. I will die without fighting. That will at least save the pack three lives. More I cannot do. But if ye will, I can save ye the shame that comes of killing a brother against whom there is no fault, a brother spoken for and bought into the pack according to the law of the jungle. He is a man, a man, a man, snarled the pack, and most of the wolves began to gather round Shere Khan, whose tail was beginning to switch. Now the business is in thy hands, said Bagheera to Mowgli. We can do no more except fight. Mowgli stood upright, the fire-pot in his hands. Then he stretched out his arms and yawned in the face of the council. But he was furious with rage and sorrow, for wolf-like the wolves have never told him how they hated him. Listen, you, he cried, there is no need for this dog's jabber. Ye have told me so often to-night that I am a man, and indeed I would have been a wolf with you to my life's end, that I feel your words are true. So I do not call ye my brothers any more, but Sag, dogs, as a man would. What ye will do and what ye will not do is not yours to say. That matter is with me, and that we may see the matter more plainly, I, the man, have brought here a little of the red flower which ye dogs fear. He flung the fire-pot on the ground, and some of the red coals lit a tuft of dried moss that flared up, as all the council drew back in terror before the leaping flames. Mowgli thrust his dead branch into the fire till the twigs lit and crackled, and whirled it above his head among the cowering wolves. "'Thou art the master,' said Bakira in an undertone. "'Save Akela from the death. He was ever thy friend.' Akela, the grim old wolf, who had never asked for mercy in his life, gave one piteous look at Mowgli as the boy stood all naked, his long black hair tossing over his shoulders in the light of the blazing branch that made the shadows jump and quiver. "'Good,' said Mowgli, staring round slowly. "'I see that ye are dogs. I go from you to my own people, if they be my own people.' The jungle is shut to me, and I must forget your talk and your companionship. But I will be more merciful than ye are. Because I was all but your brother in blood, I promise that when I am a man among men, I will not betray ye to men as ye have betrayed me. He kicked the fire with his foot, and the sparks flew up. There shall be no war between any of us in the pack, but here is a debt to pay before I go. He strode forward to where Shere Khan sat blinking stupidly at the flames, and caught him by the tuft of his chin. Bagheera followed in case of accidents. "'Up, dog!' Mowgli cried. "'Up when a man speaks, or I will set that coat ablaze!' Shere Khan's ears lay flat back on his head, and he shut his eyes, for the blazing branch was very near. This cattle-killer said he would kill me and the council, because he had not killed me when I was a cub. Thus and thus, then, do we beat dogs when we are men. Stir a whisker, Lungri, and I ram the red flower down thy gullet. He beat Shere Khan over the head with the branch, and the tiger whimpered and whined in an agony of fear. Pa, Singed jungle cat, go now. But remember when next I come to the Council Rock, as a man should come, it will be with Shere Khan's hide on my head. For the rest, Akela goes free to live as he pleases. Ye will not kill him, because that is not my will. Nor do I think that ye will sit here any longer, lolling out your tongues as though ye were somebodies, instead of dogs whom I drive out. Thus, go." The fire was burning furiously at the end of the branch, and Mowgli struck right and left round the circle, and the wolves ran howling with the sparks burning their fur. At last there were only Akela, Bakira, and perhaps ten wolves that had taken Mowgli's part. 
Then something began to hurt Mowgli inside him, as he had never been hurt in his life before, and he caught his breath and sobbed, and the tears ran down his face. "'What is it? What is it?' he said. "'I do not wish to leave the jungle, and I do not know what this is. Am I dying, Bagheera?' "'No, little brother. That is only tears such as men use,' said Bagheera. Now I know thou art a man, and a man's cub no longer. The jungle is shut indeed to thee henceforward. Let them fall, Mowgli, they are only tears. So Mowgli sat and cried as though his heart would break, and he had never cried in all his life before. Now, he said, I will go to men, but first I must say farewell to my mother. And he went to the cave where she lived with Father Wolf, and he cried on her coat, while the four cubs howled miserably. "'Ye will not forget me,' said Mowgli. "'Never while we can follow a trail,' said the cubs. "'Come to the foot of the hill when thou art a man, and we will talk to thee, and we will come into the croplands to play with thee by night.' "'Come soon,' said Father Wolf. "'O oh, wise little frog, come again soon, for we be old, thy mother and I.' "'Come soon,' said Mother Wolf, little naked son of mine. For listen, child of man, I love thee more than I ever loved my cubs. I will surely come, said Mowgli, and when I come it will be to lay out Shere Khan's hide upon the council rock. Do not forget me. Tell them in the jungle never to forget me. The dawn was beginning to break when Mowgli went down the hillside alone to meet those mysterious things that are called men. Hunting Song of the Sioni Pack As the dawn was breaking, the sambor belled once, twice, and again. And a doe leaped up, and a doe leaped up, from the pond in the wood where the wild deer sup. This I, scouting alone, beheld, once, twice, and again. As the dawn was breaking, the sambor belled once, twice, and again. And a wolf stole back, and a wolf stole back to carry the word to the waiting pack, and we sought and we found and we bayed on his track once, twice, and again. As the dawn was breaking, the wolf pack yelled once, twice, and again, feet in the jungle that leave no mark, eyes that can see in the dark, the dark, tongue, give tongue to it, hark, O oh, hark, once, twice, and again. End of Story One Mowgli's Brothers Story number two of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling Kaa's Hunting His spots are the joy of the leopard, his horns are the buffalo's pride. Be clean, for the strength of the hunter is known by the gloss of his hide. If ye find that the bullock can toss you, or the heavy-browed sambor can gore, ye need not stop work to inform us. We knew it ten seasons before. Oppress not the cubs of the stranger, but hail them as sister and brother, for though they are little and fubsy, it may be the bear is their mother. There is none like to me, says the cub in the pride of his earliest kill, but the jungle is large, and the cub he is small. Let him think and be still. Maxims of Baloo all that is told here happened some time before Mowgli was turned out of the Sioni wolf pack or revenged himself on Shere Khan the tiger. It was in the days when Baloo was teaching him the law of the jungle. The big, serious old brown bear was delighted to have so quick a pupil, for the young wolves will only learn as much of the law of the jungle as applies to their own pack and tribe and run away as soon as they can repeat the hunting verse. Feet that make no noise, eyes that can see in the dark, ears that can hear the winds in their lairs, and sharp white teeth. All of these are the marks of our brothers, except Tabaki the jackal and the hyena whom we hate. But Mowgli, as a man-cub, had to learn a great deal more than this. Sometimes Bagheera the black panther would come lounging through the jungle, to see how his pet was coming on, and would purr with his head against a tree, while Mowgli recited the day's lesson to Baloo. 
The boy could climb almost as well as he could swim, and swim almost as well as he could run. So Baloo, the teacher of the law, taught him the wood and water laws, how to tell a rotten branch from a sound one, how to speak politely to the wild bees when he came upon a hive of them fifty feet above ground, what to say to Mang the Bat when he disturbed him in the branches at midday, and how to warn the water snakes in the pools before he splashed down among them. None of the jungle people like to be disturbed, and all are ready to fly at an intruder. Then, too, Mowgli was taught the stranger's hunting call, which must be repeated aloud till it is answered, whenever one of the jungle people hunts outside his own grounds. It means, translated, give me leave to hunt here because I am hungry, and the answer is, hunt then for food, but not for pleasure. All this will show you how much Mowgli had to learn by heart, and he grew very tired of saying the same thing over a hundred times. But, as Baloo said to Bagheera one day, when Mowgli had been cuffed and run off in a temper, a man's cub is a man's cub, and he must learn all the law of the jungle. But think how small he is, said the Black Panther, who would have spoiled Mowgli if he had had his own way. How can his little head carry all thy long talk? Is there anything in the jungle too little to be killed? No, that is why I teach him these things, and that is why I hit him very softly when he forgets. Softly? What dost thou know of softness, old iron feet? Bagheera grunted. His face is all bruised to-day by thy softness. Huh. Better he should be bruised from head to foot by me who love him, than that he should come to harm through ignorance, Baloo answered very earnestly. I am now teaching him the master words of the jungle that shall protect him with the birds and the snake people and all that hunt on four feet except his own pack. He can now claim protection, if he will only remember the words, from all in the jungle. Is not that worth a little beating? Well, look to it then that thou dost not kill the man-cub. He is no tree-trunk to sharpen thy blunt claws upon. But what are those master words? I am more likely to give help than to ask it. Bagheera stretched out one paw, and admired the steel-blue, ripping chisel talons at the end of it. Still I should like to know. I will call Mowgli, and he shall say them, if he will. Come, little brother. My head is ringing like a bee-tree said a sullen little voice over their heads, and Mowgli slid down a tree-trunk, very angry and indignant, adding, as he reached the ground, I come for Bahira, and not for thee, fat old Baloo. That is all one to me, said Baloo, though he was hurt and grieved. Tell Bahira, then, the master words of the jungle that I have taught thee this day. Master words for which people, said Mowgli, delighted to show off. The jungle has many tongues, I know them all. A little thou knowest, but not much. See, O Bagheera, they never thank their teacher. Not one small wolfling has ever come back to thank old Baloo for his teaching. Say the word for the hunting people, then, great scholar. We be of one blood, ye and I, said Mowgli, giving the words the bare accent which all the hunting people use. Good. Now for the birds," Mowgli repeated, with the kite's whistle at the end of the sentence. Now for the snake people," said Bagheera. The answer was a perfectly indescribable hiss, and Mowgli kicked up his feet behind, clapped his hands together to applaud himself, and jumped on to Bagheera's back, where he sat sideways, drumming his heels on the glossy skin and making the worst faces he could think of at Baloo. "'There, there, that was worth a little bruise,' said the brown bear tenderly. "'Some day thou wilt remember me.' Then he turned aside to tell Bagheera how he had begged the master words from Hathi the wild elephant, who knows all about these things, and how Hathi had taken Mowgli down to a pool to get the snake-word from a water-snake, 
because Baloo could not pronounce it, and how Mowgli was now reasonably safe against all accidents in the jungle, because neither snake, bird, nor beast would hurt him. No one then is to be feared, Baloo wound up, patting his big furry stomach with pride. Except his own tribe, said Bagheera under his breath, and then aloud to Mowgli, Have a care for my ribs, little brother. What is all this dancing up and down? Mowgli had been trying to make himself heard by pulling at Bagheera's shoulder fur and kicking hard. When the two listened to him, he was shouting at the top of his voice, And so I shall have a tribe of my own, and lead them through the branches all day long. What is this new folly, little dreamer of dreams? said Bagheera. Yes, and throw branches and dirt at old Baloo, Mowgli went on. They have promised me this. Ah! Oh! Baloo's big paw scooped Mowgli off Bagheera's back, and as the boy lay between the big forepaws he could see the bear was angry. Mowgli, said Baloo, thou hast been talking with the Bandar Log, the monkey people. Mowgli looked at Bagheera to see if the panther was angry too and Bagheera's eyes were as hard as jade-stones. "'Thou hast been with the monkey people, the gray apes, the people without a law, the eaters of everything. That is great shame.' "'When Baloo hurt my head,' said Mowgli, he was still on his back, "'I went away, and the gray apes came down from the trees and had pity on me. No one else cared.' He snuffled a little. The pity of the monkey people, Baloo snorted, the stillness of the mountain stream, the cool of the summer sun. And then, man-cub, and then, and then they gave me nuts and pleasant things to eat, and they, they carried me in their arms, up to the top of the trees, and said I was their blood brother, except that I had no tail, and should be their leader some day. They have no leader said Bagheera. They lie. They have always lied. They were very kind, and bade me come again. Why have I never been taken among the monkey people? They stand on their feet, as I do. They do not hit me with their hard paws. They play all day. Let me get up, bad Baloo. Let me up. I will play with them again. Listen, man-cub, said the bear and his voice rumbled like thunder on a hot night. I have taught thee all the laws of the jungle for all the peoples of the jungle, except the monkey people who live in the trees. They have no law. They are outcasts. They have no speech of their own, but use the stolen words which they overhear when they listen and peep and wait up above in the branches. Their way is not our way. They are without leaders. They have no remembrance. They boast and chatter and pretend that they are a great people about to do great affairs in the jungle, but the falling of a nut turns their minds to laughter, and all is forgotten. We of the jungle have no dealings with them. We do not drink where the monkeys drink. We do not go where the monkeys go. We do not hunt where they hunt. We do not die where they die. Hast thou ever heard me speak of the Bandar Log till to-day? No, said Mowgli in a whisper, for the forest was very still now Baloo had finished. The jungle people, put them out of their mouths and out of their minds. They are very many, evil, dirty, shameless, and they desire, if they have any fixed desire, to be noticed by the jungle people. But we do not notice them even when they throw nuts and filth on our heads. He had hardly spoken when a shower of nuts and twigs spattered down through the branches, and they could hear coughings and howlings and angry jumpings high up in the air among the thin branches. The monkey people are forbidden, said Baloo, forbidden to the jungle people. Remember. Forbidden said Bagheera, but I still think Baloo should have warned thee against them. I? I? How was I to guess he would play with such dirt? 
The monkey people! Faw! A fresh shower came down on their heads, and the two trotted away, taking Mowgli with them. What Baloo had to say about the monkeys was perfectly true. They belonged to the treetops, and as beasts very seldom look up, there was no occasion for the monkeys and the jungle people to cross each other's path. But whenever they found a sick wolf or a wounded tiger or bear, the monkeys would torment him and throw sticks and nuts at any beast for fun and in the hope of being noticed. Then they would howl and shriek senseless songs and invite the jungle people to climb up their trees and fight them, or they would start furious battles over nothing among themselves and leave the dead monkeys where the jungle people could see them. They were always just going to have a leader and laws and customs of their own, but they never did, because their memories would not hold over from day to day, and so they compromised things by making up a saying, What Bandalore think now the jungle will think later, and that comforted them a great deal. None of the beasts could reach them, but on the other hand none of the beasts would notice them and that was why they were so pleased when Mowgli came to play with them, and they heard how angry Baloo was. They never meant to do any more. The Bandar Log never meant anything at all. But one of them invented what seemed to him a brilliant idea, and he told all the others that Mowgli would be a useful person to keep in the tribe, because he could weave sticks together for protection from the wind. So if they caught him, they could make him teach them. Of course Mowgli, as a woodcutter's child, inherited all sorts of instincts, and used to make little huts of fallen branches without thinking how he came to do it. The monkey people watching in the trees considered his play most wonderful. This time, they said, they were really going to have a leader and become the wisest people in the jungle so wise that every one else would notice and envy them. Therefore they followed Baloo and Bagheera and Mowgli through the jungle very quietly till it was time for the midday nap, and Mowgli, who was very much ashamed of himself, slept between the panther and the bear, resolving to have no more to do with the monkey people. The next thing he remembered was feeling hands on his legs and arms hard, strong little hands, and then a swash of branches in his face, and then he was staring down through the swaying boughs as Baloo woke the jungle with his deep cries, and Bagheera bounded up the trunk with every tooth bared. The Bandar log howled with triumph and scuffled away to the upper branches, where Bagheera dared not follow, shouting, He has noticed us! Bagheera has noticed us! All the jungle people admire us for our skill and our cunning. Then they began their flight, and the flight of the monkey people through tree-land is one of the things nobody can describe. They have their regular roads and cross-roads, up hills and down hills, all laid out from fifty to seventy or a hundred feet above the ground, and by these they can travel even at night if necessary. Two of the strongest monkeys caught Mowgli under the arms and swung off with him through the treetops, twenty feet at a bound. Had they been alone, they could have gone twice as fast, but the boy's weight held them back. Sick and giddy as Mowgli was, he could not help enjoying the wild rush, though the glimpses of earth far down below frightened him, and the terrible check and jerk at the end of the swing over nothing but empty air brought his heart between his teeth. His escort would rush him up a tree till he felt the thinnest topmost branches crackle and bend under them, and then, with a cough and a whoop, would fling themselves into the air outward and downward, and bring up, hanging by their hands or their feet, to the lower limbs of the next tree. Sometimes he could see for miles and miles across the still green jungle as a man on the top of a mast can see from miles across the sea, and then the branches and leaves would lash him across the face, and he and his two guards would be almost down to earth again. So, bounding and crashing and whooping and yelling, the whole tribe of Bandar Log swept along the tree roads with Mowgli their prisoner. 
For a time he was afraid of being dropped. Then he grew angry, but knew better than to struggle. And then he began to think. The first thing was to send back word to Baloo and Bagheera, for at the pace the monkeys were going he knew his friends would be left far behind. It was useless to look down, for he could only see the top sides of the branches, so he stared upward and saw, far away in the blue, Ron the Kite balancing and wheeling as he kept watch over the jungle, waiting for things to die. Ron saw that the monkeys were carrying something, and dropped a few hundred yards to find out whether their load was good to eat. He whistled with surprise when he saw Mowgli being dragged up to a treetop, and heard him give the kite call for, We be of one blood, thou and I. The waves of the branches closed over the boy, but Ron balanced away to the next tree, in time to see the little brown face come up again. "'Mark my trail!' Mowgli shouted. "'Tell Baloo of the Sioni Pack, and Bagheera of the Council Rock.' "'In whose name, brother?' Ron had never seen Mowgli before, though of course he had heard of him. "'Mowgli the Frog! Man-cub they call me! Mark my trail!' The last words were shrieked as he was being swung through the air, but Ron nodded and rose up till he looked no bigger than a speck of dust, and there he hung, watching with his telescope eyes the swaying of the treetops as Mowgli's escort whirled along. <laughs> they never go far, he said with a chuckle. They never do what they set out to do. Always pecking at new things are the Bandar log. This time, if I have any eyesight, they have pecked down trouble for themselves, for Baloo is no fledgling, and Bagheera can, as I know, kill more than goats. So he rocked his wings, his feet gathered up under him, and waited. Meantime Baloo and Bagheera were furious with rage and grief. Bagheera climbed as he had never climbed before, but the thin branches broke beneath his weight, and he slipped down, his claws full of bark. "'Why didst thou not warn the man-cub?' he roared to poor Baloo, who had set off at a clumsy trot in the hope of overtaking the monkeys. "'What was the use of half slaying him with blows if thou didst not warn him?' "'Haste, oh, haste! We—we we may catch them yet!' Baloo panted. At that speed it would not tire a wounded cow, teacher of the law, cub-beater. A mile of that rolling to and fro would burst thee open. Sit still and think. Make a plan. This is no time for chasing. They may drop him if we follow too close. Arula! Oh, they may have dropped him already, being tired of carrying him. Who can trust the bandar log? Put dead bats on my head, give me black bones to eat, roll me into the hives of the wild bees, that I may be stung to death, and bury me with the hyena, for I am most miserable of bears. Arul, Allah, oh, ah, oh, Mowgli, Mowgli, why did I not warn thee against the monkey folk, instead of breaking thy head? Now perhaps I may have knocked the day's lesson out of his mind and he will be alone in the jungle without the master words." Baloo clasped his paws over his ears, and rolled to and fro, moaning. "'At least he gave me all the words correctly a little time ago,' said Bagheera impatiently. "'Baloo, thou hast neither memory nor respect. What would the jungle think if I, the Black Panther, curled myself up like Icky the Porcupine and howled? What do I care what the jungle thinks? He may be dead by now. Unless and until they drop him from the branches in sport, or kill him out of idleness, I have no fear for the man-cub. He is wise and well taught, and above all he has the eyes that make the jungle people afraid. But, and it is a great evil, he is in the power of the Bandar log, and they, because they live in trees, have no fear of any of our people." Bagheera licked one forepaw thoughtfully. 
fool that I am, oh, fat, brown, root-digging fool that I am," said Baloo, uncoiling himself with a jerk. It is true what Hathi the wild elephant says, to each his own fear, and they the Bandar log fear Ka the rock snake. He can climb as well as they can. He steals the young monkeys in the night. The whisper of his name makes their wicked tails cold. Let us go to Ka. What will he do for us? He is not of our tribe, being footless, and with most evil eyes," said Bagheera. He is very old and very cunning. Above all, he is always hungry," said Baloo hopefully. Promise him many goats. He sleeps for a full month after he has once eaten. He may be asleep now. And even were he awake, what if he would rather kill his own goats? Bagheera, who did not know much about Ka, was naturally suspicious. Then, in that case, thou and I together, old hunter, must make him see reason. Here Baloo rubbed his faded brown shoulder against the panther, and they went off to look for Ka, the rock python. They found him stretched out on a warm ledge in the afternoon sun, admiring his beautiful new coat, for he had been in retirement for the last ten days, changing his skin, and now he was very splendid, darting his big blunt-nosed head along the ground, and twisting the thirty feet of his body into fantastic knots and curves, and licking his lips as he thought of his dinner to come. He has not eaten, said Baloo with a grunt of relief, as soon as he saw the beautifully mottled brown and yellow jacket. Be careful, Bagheera. He is always a little blind after he has changed his skin, and very quick to strike. Ka was not a poison snake. In fact, he rather despised the poison snakes as cowards. But his strength lay in his hug. And when he had once lapped his huge coils round anybody, there was no more to be said. Good hunting, cried Baloo, sitting up on his haunches. Like all snakes of his breed, Ka was rather deaf, and did not hear the call at first. Then he curled up, ready for any accident, his head lowered. "'Good hunting for us all,' he answered. "'Oho, Baloo! What dost thou do here?' "'Good hunting, Bagheera. One of us at least needs food. Is there any news of game afoot? A doe now, or even a young buck? I am as empty as a dried well. We are hunting, said Baloo carelessly. He knew that you must not hurry Ka. He is too big. Give me permission to come with you, said Ka. A blow more or less is nothing to thee, Bagheera or Baloo. But I, I have to wait and wait for days in a wood-path, and climb half a night on the mere chance of a young ape. Pshaw! The branches are not what they were when I was young. Rotten twigs and dry boughs are they all." "'Maybe thy great weight has something to do with the matter,' said Baloo. "'I am a fair length, a fair length,' said Ka with a little pride. But for all that it is the fault of this new-grown timber. I came very near to falling on my last hunt, very near indeed and the noise of my slipping, for my tail was not tight wrapped around the tree, waked the bandor log, and they call me most evil names." "'Footless yellow earthworm,' said Bagheera under his whiskers, as though he were trying to remember something. "'Have they called me that?' said Ka. "'Something of that kind. It was that they shouted to us last moon, but we never noticed them. They will say anything even that thou hast lost all thy teeth, and wilt not face anything bigger than a kid, because they are indeed shameless, these Bandarlog, because thou art afraid of the he-goat's horns," Bagheera went on sweetly. Now a snake, especially a wary old python like Ka, very seldom shows that he is angry. But Baloo and Bagheera could see the big swallowing muscles on either side of Ka's throat ripple and bulge. The Bandar log have shifted their grounds, he said quietly. When I came up into the sun today, 
I heard them whooping among the treetops. It, it is the Bandar log that we follow now, said Baloo, but the words stuck in his throat, for that was the first time in his memory that one of the jungle people had owned to being interested in the doings of the monkeys. Beyond doubt, then, it is no small thing that takes two such hunters, leaders in their own jungle, I am certain, on the trail of the Bandar log. Ka replied courteously as he swelled with curiosity. Indeed, Baloo began, I am no more than the old and sometimes very foolish teacher of the law to the Sioni wolf cubs, and Bagheera here is Bagheera, said the Black Panther, and his jaws shut with a snap, for he did not believe in being humble. The trouble is this, Ka, those nut stealers and pickers of palm leaves have stolen away our man-cub of whom thou hast perhaps heard. I heard some news from Icky. His quills make him presumptuous, of a man-thing that was entered into a wolf-pack, but I did not believe. Icky is full of stories half heard and very badly told. But it is true. He is such a man-cub as never was, said Baloo, the best and wisest and boldest of man-cubs, my own pupil who shall make the name of Baloo famous through all the jungles, and besides I—we love him, Ka." "'Tss, tss,' said Ka, weaving his head to and fro. "'I also have known what love is. There are tales I could tell that—' "'That need a clear night when we are all well fed to praise properly,' said Bagheera quickly. "'Our man-cub is in the hands of the Bandar log now and we know that of all the jungle people they fear Ka alone. They fear me alone. They have good reason, said Ka, chattering, foolish, vain. Vain, foolish, chattering are the monkeys. But a man-thing in their hands is in no good luck. They grow tired of the nuts they pick and throw them down. They carry a branch half a day, meaning to do great things with it, and then they snap it in two. That man-thing is not to be envied. They called me also Yellow Fish, was it not?" "'Worm, worm, earthworm,' said Bagheera, as well as other things which I cannot now say for shame." "'We must remind them to speak well of their master, Asp. We must help their wandering memories. Now whither went they with the cub? The jungle alone knows, toward the sunset, I believe, said Baloo. We have thought that thou wouldst know, Ka. I? How? I take them when they come in my way, but I do not hunt the bandar logs, or frogs, or green scum on a water-hole, for that matter. Up, 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 hello, 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 look up, Baloo of the Sioni wolf-pack. Baloo looked up to see where the voice came from. And there was Ron the kite, sweeping down with the sun shining on the upturned flanges of his wings. It was near Ron's bedtime, but he had ranged all over the jungle, looking for the bear, and had missed him in the thick foliage. "'What is it?' said Baloo. "'I have seen Mowgli among the Bandar log. He bade me tell you. I watched. The Bandar log have taken him beyond the river to the monkey city, to the cold lairs. They may stay there for a night, or ten nights, or an hour. I have told the bats to watch through the dark time. That is my message. Good hunting, all you below." "'Full gorge and a deep sleep to you, Ron,' cried Bagheera. "'I will remember thee in my next kill, and put aside the head for thee alone, O best of kites.' "'It is nothing, it is nothing. The boy held the master word. I could have done no less.' and Ron circled up again to his roost. "'He has not forgotten to use his tongue,' said Baloo with a chuckle of pride. "'To think of one so young remembering the master word for the birds to, while he was being pulled across trees!' "'It was most firmly driven into him,' said Bagheera. "'But I am proud of him, and now we must go to the cold lairs.' They all knew where that place was. But few of the jungle people ever went there, because what they called the Cold Lairs was an old deserted city, lost and buried in the jungle, 
and beasts seldom use a place that men have once used. The wild boar will, but the hunting tribes do not. Besides, the monkeys live there as much as they could be said to live anywhere, and no self-respecting animal would come with an eye shot of it except in times of drought, when the half-ruined tanks and reservoirs held a little water. It is a half-night's journey at full speed, said Bagheera, and Baloo looked very serious. I will go as fast as I can, he said anxiously. We dare not wait for thee. Follow, Baloo. We must go on the quick foot, Ka and I. Feet or no feet, I can keep abreast of all thy four, said Ka shortly. Baloo made one effort to hurry, but had to sit down panting, and so they left him to come on later while Bagheera hurried forward at the quick panther canter. Ka said nothing, but strive as Bagheera might. The huge rock python held level with him. When they came to a hill stream, Bagheera gained, because he bounded across while Ka swam, his head and two feet of his neck clearing the water, but on level ground Ka made up the distance. By the broken lock that freed me, said Bagheera when twilight had fallen, Thou art no slow goer. I am hungry, said Ka. Besides, they call me Speckled Frog. Worm, earthworm, and yellow to boot. All one, let us go on. And Ka seemed to pour himself along the ground, finding the shortest road with his steady eyes and keeping to it. In the coal lairs the monkey people were not thinking of Mowgli's friends at all. They had brought the boy to the lost city, and were very much pleased with themselves for the time. Mowgli had never seen an Indian city before, and though this was almost a heap of ruins, it seemed very wonderful and splendid. Some king had built it long ago on a little hill. You could still trace the stone causeways that led up to the ruined gates, where the last splinters of wood hung to the worn, rusted hinges. Trees had grown into and out of the walls. The battlements were tumbled down and decayed, and wild creepers hung out of the windows of the towers on the walls in bushy, hanging clumps. A great roofless palace crowned the hill and the marble of the courtyards and the fountains was split and stained with red and green, and the very cobblestones in the courtyard, where the king's elephants used to live, had been thrust up and apart by grasses and young trees. From the palace you could see the rows and rows of roofless houses that made up the city, looking like empty honeycombs filled with blackness. The shapeless block of stone that had been an idol in the square where four roads met, the pits and dimples at street corners where the public wells once stood, and the shattered domes of temples with wild figs sprouting on their sides. The monkeys called the place their city, and pretended to despise the jungle people because they lived in the forest, and yet they never knew what the buildings were made for, nor how to use them. They would sit in circles on the hall of the king's council chamber, and scratch for fleas and pretend to be men, or they would run in and out of the roofless houses and collect pieces of plaster and old bricks in a corner, and forget where they had hidden them, and fight and cry in scuffling crowds, and then break off to play up and down the terraces of the king's garden, where they would shake the rose trees and the oranges in sport to see the fruit and flowers fall. They explored all the passages and dark tunnels in the palace, and the hundreds of little dark rooms, but they never remembered what they had seen and what they had not, and so drifted about in ones and twos, or crowds, telling each other that they were doing as men did. They drank at the tanks and made the water all muddy, and then they fought over it, and then they would all rush together in mobs and shout, there is no one in the jungle so wise and good and clever and strong and gentle as the Bandar Log. Then all would begin again till they grew tired of the city, and went back to the treetops, hoping the jungle people would notice them. Mowgli, who had been trained under the law of the jungle, did not like or understand this kind of life. The monkeys dragged him into the coal lairs late in the afternoon and instead of going to sleep, as Mowgli would have done after a long journey, 
They joined hands and danced about and sang their foolish songs. One of the monkeys made a speech and told his companions that Mowgli's capture marked a new thing in the history of the Bander Log, for Mowgli was going to show them how to weave sticks and canes together as a protection against rain and cold. Mowgli picked up some creepers and began to work them in and out, and the monkeys tried to imitate, but in a very few minutes they lost interest, and began to pull their friends' tails or jump up and down on all fours, coughing. "'I wish to eat,' said Mowgli. "'I am a stranger in this part of the jungle. Bring me food, or give me leave to hunt here.' Twenty or thirty monkeys bounded away to bring him nuts and wild papaws. But they fell to fighting on the road, and it was too much trouble to go back with what was left of the fruit. Mowgli was sore and angry as well as hungry, and he roamed through the empty city, giving the stranger's hunting call from time to time, but no one answered him, and Mowgli felt that he had reached a very bad place indeed. All that Baloo has said about the Bandar Log is true, he thought to himself. They have no law no hunting call and no leaders, nothing but foolish words and little picking thievish hands. So if I am starved or killed here, it will be all my own fault. But I must try to return to my own jungle. Baloo will surely beat me, but that is better than chasing silly rose-leaves with the bandar log. No sooner had he walked to the city wall than the monkeys pulled him back telling him that he did not know how happy he was, and pinching him to make him grateful. He set his teeth and said nothing, but went with the shouting monkeys to a terrace above the red sandstone reservoirs that were half full of rainwater. There was a ruined summer-house of white marble in the center of the terrace, built for queens dead a hundred years ago. The domed roof had fallen in and blocked up the underground passage from the palace by which the queens used to enter, but the walls were made of screens of marble tracery, beautiful milk-white fretwork, set with agates and cornelians and jasper and lapis lazuli, and as the moon came up behind the hill it shone through the open work, casting shadows on the ground like black velvet embroidery. Sore, sleepy, and hungry as he was, Mowgli could not help laughing when the Bandar Log began, twenty at a time, to tell him how great and wise and strong and gentle they were, and how foolish he was to wish to leave them. We are great, we are free, we are wonderful, we are the most wonderful people in all the jungle. We all say so, and so it must be true, they shouted. Now as you are a new listener, and can carry our words back to the jungle people, so that they may notice us in future, we will tell you all about our most excellent selves." Mowgli made no objection, and the monkeys gathered by hundreds and hundreds on the terrace to listen to their own speakers, singing the praises of the Bandar Log, and whenever a speaker stopped for want of breath, they would all shout together, this is true, we all say so." Mowgli nodded and blinked and said, yes, when they asked him a question, and his head spun with the noise. Tabaki the jackal must have bitten all these people, he said to himself, and now they have madness. Certainly this is Dewani the madness. Do they never go to sleep? Now there is a cloud coming to cover that moon. If it were only a big enough cloud, I might try to run away in the darkness, but I am tired." That same cloud was being watched by two good friends in the ruined ditch below the city wall, for Bagheera and Ka, knowing well how dangerous the monkey people were in large numbers, did not wish to run any risks. The monkeys never fight unless they are a hundred to one, and few in the jungle care for those odds. I will go to the west wall. Ka whispered, and come down swiftly with the slope of the ground in my favor. They will not throw themselves upon my back in their hundreds, but— I know it, said Bagheera. Would that Baloo were here, but we must do what we can. When that cloud covers the moon, I shall go to the terrace. They hold some sort of council there over the boy. 
"'Good hunting,' said Ka grimly, and glided away to the west wall. That happened to be the least ruined of any, and the big snake was delayed a while before he could find a way up the stones. The cloud hid the moon, and as Mowgli wondered what would come next, he heard Bagheera's light feet on the terrace. The black panther had raced up the slope almost without a sound, and was striking, he knew better than to waste time in biting, right and left among the monkeys, who were seated round Mowgli in circles fifty and sixty deep. There was a howl of fright and rage, and then, as Bagheera tripped on the rolling, kicking bodies beneath him, a monkey shouted, "'There is only one here! Kill him! Kill!' A scuffling mass of monkeys, biting, scratching, tearing, and pulling, closed over Bagheera, while five or six laid hold of Mowgli, dragged him up the wall of the summer-house, and pushed him through the hole of the broken dome. A man-trained boy would have been badly bruised, for the fall was a good fifteen feet, but Mowgli fell as Baloo had taught him to fall, and landed on his feet. "'Stay there!' shouted the monkeys, "'till we have killed thy friends, and later we will play with thee, if the poison people leave thee alive.' "'We be of one blood, ye and I,' said Mowgli, quickly giving the snake's call. He could hear rustling and hissing in the rubbish all round him, and gave the call a second time to make sure. "'Even so, down hoods all,' said a half-dozen low voices. "'Every ruin in India becomes, sooner or later, a dwelling-place of snakes, and the old summer-house was alive with cobras. Stand still, little brother, for thy feet may do us harm." Mowgli stood as quietly as he could, peering through the open work and listening to the furious din of the fight round the black panther, the yells and chatterings and scufflings, and Bagheera's deep hoarse cough as he backed and bucked and twisted and plunged under the heaps of his enemies. For the first time since he was born, Bagheera was fighting for his life. Baloo must be at hand. Bagheera would not have come alone, Mowgli thought, and then he called aloud, To the tank, Bagheera, roll to the water tanks. Roll and plunge. Get to the water. Bagheera heard, and the cry that told him Mowgli was safe gave him new courage. He worked his way desperately, inch by inch, straight for the reservoirs, halting in silence. Then, from the ruined wall nearest the jungle, rose up the rumbling war-shout of Baloo. The old bear had done his best, but he could not come before. Bagheera! he shouted. I am here! I climb! I haste! Aurur! The stones slip under my feet. Wait my coming, O most infamous Bandarlog! He panted up the terrace, only to disappear to the head in a wave of monkeys. But he threw himself squarely on his haunches, and, spreading out his forepaws, hugged as many as he could hold, and then began to hit with a regular bat, 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 like the flipping strokes of a paddle-wheel. A crash and a splash told Mowgli that Bagheera had fought his way to the tank, where the monkeys could not follow. The panther lay gasping for breath, his head just out of the water, while the monkeys stood three deep on the red steps, dancing up and down with rage, ready to spring upon him from all sides if he came out to help Baloo. It was then that Bagheera lifted up his dripping chin, and in despair gave the snake's call for protection. We be of one blood, ye and I, for he believed that Ka had turned tail at the last minute. Even Baloo, half smothered under the monkeys on the edge of the terrace, could not help chuckling as he heard the black panther asking for help. Ka had only just worked his way over the west wall, landing with a wrench that dislodged a coping stone into the ditch. He had no intention of losing any advantage of the ground, and coiled and uncoiled himself once or twice, to be sure that every foot of his long body was in working order. 
All that while the fight with Baloo went on, and the monkeys yelled in the tank round Bagheera, and Mang the Bat, flying to and fro, carried the news of the great battle over the jungle, till even Hathi the wild elephant trumpeted, and far away scattered bands of the monkey folk woke and came leaping along the tree roads to help their comrades in the cold lairs, and the noise of the fight roused all the day birds from miles around. Then Ka came straight, quickly and anxious to kill. The fighting strength of a python is in the driving blow of his head, backed by all the strength and weight of his body. If you can imagine a lance or a battering ram, or a hammer weighing nearly half a ton, driven by a cool, quiet mind living in the middle of it, you can roughly imagine what Ka was like when he fought. A python four or five feet long can knock a man down if he hits him fairly in the chest, and Ka was thirty feet long, as you know. His first stroke was delivered into the heart of the crowd round Baloo. It was sent home with shut mouth in silence, and there was no need of a second. The monkey scattered with cries of, Ka! It is Ka! Run! Run! Generations of monkeys have been scared into good behavior by the stories their elders told them of Ka, the night thief, who could slip along the branches as quietly as moss grows, and steal away the strongest monkey that ever lived, of old Ka, who could make himself look so like a dead branch or a rotten stump that the wisest were deceived, till the branch caught them. Ka was everything that the monkeys feared in the jungle, for none of them knew the limits of his power, none of them could look him in the face, and none had ever come alive out of his hug. And so they ran, stammering with terror to the walls and the roofs of the houses, and Baloo drew a deep breath of relief. His fur was much thicker than Bagheera's, but he had suffered sorely in the fight. Then Ka opened his mouth for the first time, and spoke one long hissing word, and the far-away monkeys, hurrying to the defense of the coal lairs, stayed where they were, cowering, till the loaded branches bent and crackled under them. The monkeys on the walls and the empty houses stopped their cries, and in the stillness that fell upon the city Mowgli heard Bagheera shaking his wet sides as he came from the tank. Then the clamor broke out again. The monkeys leaped higher up the walls. They clung around the necks of the big stone idols, and shrieked as they skipped along the battlements, while Mowgli, dancing in the summer-house, put his eye to the screen-work and hooted owl-fashion between his front teeth, to show his derision and contempt. "'Get the man-cup out of that trap. I can do no more,' Bagheera gasped. "'Let us take the man-cup and go. They may attack again.' "'They will not move till I order them. Stay you so!' Ka hissed, and the city was silent once more. "'I could not come before, brother, but I think I heard thee call.' This was to Bagheera. I, I may have cried out in the battle, Bagheera answered. Baloo, art thou hurt? I am not sure they did not pull me into a hundred little bearlings, said Baloo gravely, shaking one leg after the other. Oh, I am sore. Ka, we owe thee, I think, our lives, Bagheera and I. No matter. Where is the manling? Here, in a trap. I cannot climb out cried Mowgli. The curve of the broken dome was above his head. "'Take him away. He dances like Mao the peacock. He will crush our young,' said the cobras inside. "'Ha!' said Ka with a chuckle. "'He has friends everywhere, this manling. Stand back, manling, and hide you, O oh, poison people. I break down the wall.' Ka looked carefully till he found a discolored crack in the marble tracery showing a weak spot, made two or three light taps with his head to get the distance, and then, lifting up six feet of his body clear of the ground, 
sent home half a dozen full-power smashing blows, nose first. The screen work broke and fell away in a cloud of dust and rubbish, and Mowgli leaped through the opening and flung himself between Baloo and Bagheera, an arm around each big neck. "'Art thou hurt?' said Baloo, hugging him softly. "'I am sore, hungry, and not a little bruised. But, oh, they have handled ye grievously, my brothers. Ye bleed.' "'Others also,' said Bagheera, licking his lips, and looking at the monkey dead on the terrace and round the tank. "'It is nothing, it is nothing, if thou art safe. Oh, my pride of all little frogs!' whimpered Baloo. "'Of that we shall judge later.' said Bagheera in a dry voice that Mowgli did not at all like. But here is Ka to whom we owe the battle, and thou owest thy life. Thank him according to our customs, Mowgli. Mowgli turned and saw the great python's head swaying a foot above his own. So this is the manling, said Ka. Very soft is his skin, and he is not unlike the Bandar log. Have a care, manling, that I do not mistake thee for a monkey some twilight, when I have newly changed my coat. We be one blood, thou and I, Mowgli answered. I take my life from thee to-night. My kill shall be thy kill, if ever thou art hungry, O Ka. All thanks, little brother, said Ka, though his eyes twinkled. And what may so bold a hunter kill? I ask that I may follow when next he goes abroad. I kill nothing, I am too little, but I drive goats toward such as can use them. When thou art empty, come to me, and see if I speak the truth. I have some skill in these, he held out his hands, and if ever thou art in a trap, I may pay the debt which I owe to thee, to Bagheera, and to Baloo here. Good hunting to ye all, my masters. Well said, growled Baloo, for Mowgli had returned thanks very prettily. The python dropped his head lightly for a minute on Mowgli's shoulder. A brave heart and a courteous tongue, said he. They shall carry thee far through the jungle, manling. But now go hence quickly with thy friends. Go and sleep, for the moon sets, and what follows it is not well that thou shouldst see. The moon was sinking behind the hills and the lines of trembling monkeys huddled together on the walls and battlements looked like ragged, shaggy fringes of things. Baloo went down to the tank for a drink, and Bagheera began to put his fur in order. As Ka glided out into the center of the terrace, and brought his jaws together with a ringing snap that drew all the monkeys' eyes upon him. "'The moon sets,' he said. "'Is there yet light enough to see?' From the walls came a moan like the wind in the treetops. We see, O oh Ka. Good. Now begins the dance. The dance of the hunger of Ka. Sit still and watch. He turned twice or thrice in a big circle, weaving his head from right to left. Then he began making loops and figures of eight with his body and soft, oozy triangles that melted into squares and five-sided figures, and coiled mounds, never resting, never hurrying, and never stopping his low, humming song. It grew darker and darker, till at last the dragging, shifting coils disappeared, but they could hear the rustle of the scales. Baloo and Bagheera stood still a stone, growling in their throats, their neck hair bristling, and Mowgli watched and wondered. Bander log, said the voice of Ka at last, can ye stir foot or hand without my order? Speak. Without thy order we cannot stir hand or foot, O Ka. Good. Come all one pace nearer to me. The lines of the monkey swayed forward helplessly, and Baloo and Bagheera took one stiff step forward with them. Nearer, hissed Ka, and they all moved again. Mowgli laid his hands on Baloo and Bagheera to get them away, and the two great beasts started as though they had been waked from a dream. Keep thy hand on my shoulder, Bagheera whispered. Keep it there, or I must go back. 
Must go back to Ka. Ka. It is only old Ka making circles on the dust, said Mowgli. Let us go. And the three slipped off through a gap in the walls to the jungle. Ooh, said Baloo, when he stood under the still trees again. Never more will I make an ally of Ka, and he shook himself all over. He knows more than we, said Bagheera, trembling. In a little time had I stayed, I should have walked down his throat. Many will walk by that road before the moon rises again, said Baloo. He will have good hunting after his own fashion. But what was the meaning of it all? said Mowgli, who did not know anything of a python's power of fascination. I saw no more than a big snake making foolish circles till the dark came, and his nose was all sore. <laughs> Mowgli, said Bagheera angrily, his nose was sore on thy account, as my ears and sides and paws and Baloo's neck and shoulders are bitten on thy account. Neither Baloo nor Bagheera will be able to hunt with pleasure for many days. It is nothing, said Baloo. We have the man-cub again. True, but he has cost us heavily in time, which might have been spent in good hunting, in wounds, in hair. I am half plucked along my back, and last of all, in honor. For remember, Mowgli, I, who am the Black Panther, was forced to call upon Ka for protection, and Baloo and I were both made stupid as little birds by the hunger dance. All this, man-cub, came of thy playing with the Bandar log. True, it is true, said Mowgli sorrowfully. I am an evil man-cub, and my stomach is sad in me. <clears throat> what says the law of the jungle, Baloo? Baloo did not wish to bring Mowgli into any more trouble, but he could not tamper with the law, so he mumbled, Sorrow never stays punishment. But remember, Bagheera, he is very little. I will remember, but he has done mischief, and blows must be dealt now. Mowgli, hast thou anything to say? Nothing. I did wrong. Baloo and thou are wounded. It is just. Bagheera gave him half a dozen love taps from a panther's point of view. They would hardly have waked one of his own cubs. But for a seven-year-old boy they amounted to as severe a beating as you could wish to avoid. When it was all over Mowgli sneezed and picked himself up without a word. Now, said Bagheera, jump on my back, little brother, and we will go home. One of the beauties of jungle law is that punishment settles all scores. There is no nagging afterward. Mowgli laid his head down on Bagheera's back and slept so deeply that he never waked when he was put down in the home cave. End of Ka's Hunting by Rudyard Kipling Story number three of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling Tiger, Tiger! What of the hunting, Hunter Bold? Brother, the watch was long and cold. What of the quarry ye went to kill? Brother, he crops in the jungle still. Where is the power that made your pride? Brother, it ebbs from my flank and side. Where is the haste that ye hurry by? Brother, I go to my lair to die. Now we must go back to the first tale. When Mowgli left the wolves' cave after the fight with the pack at the Council Rock, he went down to the ploughed lands where the villagers lived, but he would not stop there because it was too near to the jungle, and he knew that he had made at least one bad enemy at the council. So he hurried on, keeping to the rough road that ran down the valley, and followed it at a steady jog-trot for nearly twenty miles, till he came to a country that he did not know. The valley opened out into a great plain, dotted over with rocks and cut up by ravines. At one end stood a little village, and at the other the thick jungle came down in a sweep to the grazing grounds, and stopped there as though it had been cut off with a hoe. All over the plain cattle and buffaloes were grazing, and when the little boys in charge of the herds saw Mowgli they shouted and ran away 
and the yellow pariah dogs that hang about every Indian village barked. Mowgli walked on, for he was feeling hungry, and when he came to the village gate he saw the big thorn-bush that was drawn up before the gate at twilight pushed to one side. Uh, he said, for he had come across more than one such barrier in his night rambles after things to eat. So men are afraid of the people of the jungle here also. He sat down by the gate, and when a man came out he stood up, opened his mouth, and pointed down it to show that he wanted food. The man stared and ran back up the one street of the village, shouting for the priest, who was a big fat man dressed in white, with a red and yellow mark on his forehead. The priest came to the gate, and with him at least a hundred people, who stared and talked and shouted and pointed at Mowgli. They have no manners, these men-folk, said Mowgli to himself. Only the gray ape would behave as they do. So he threw back his long hair and frowned at the crowd. What is there to be afraid of? said the priest. Look at the marks on his arms and legs. They are the bites of wolves. He is but a wolf-child run away from the jungle. Of course, in playing together, the cubs had often nipped Mowgli harder than they intended, and there were white scars all over his arms and legs. But he would have been the last person in the world to call these bites, for he knew what real biting meant. Ah, ah! said two or three women together. To be bitten by wolves, poor child! He is a handsome boy. He has eyes like red fire. By my honor, Masua, he is not unlike thy boy that was taken by the tiger. Let me look said a woman with heavy copper rings on her wrists and ankles, and she peered at Mowgli under the palm of her hand. Indeed he is not. He is thinner, but he has the very look of my boy. The priest was a clever man, and he knew that Masua was wife to the richest villager in the place. So he looked up at the sky for a minute and said solemnly, What the jungle has taken, the jungle has restored. Take the boy into thy house, my sister, and forget not to honor the priest who sees so far into the lives of men. By the bull that bought me, said Mowgli to himself, but all this talking is like another looking over by the pack. Well, if I am a man, a man I must become. The crowd parted as the woman beckoned Mowgli to her hut, where there was a red lacquered bedstead, a great earthen grain chest with funny raised patterns on it, half a dozen copper cooking pots, an image of a Hindu god in a little alcove, and on the wall a real looking glass, such as they sell at the county fairs. She gave him a long drink of milk and some bread, and then she laid her hand on his head and looked into his eyes, for she thought, perhaps, that he might be her real son come back from the jungle where the tiger had taken him. So she said, Nathu, O oh Nathu. Mowgli did not show that he knew the name. Doth thou not remember the day when I gave thee thy new shoes? She touched his foot, and it was almost as hard as horn. No, she said sorrowfully, those feet have never worn shoes. But thou art very like my Nathu and thou shalt be my son." Mowgli was uneasy, because he had never been under a roof before. But as he looked at the thatch he saw that he could tear it out any time if he wanted to get away, and that the window had no fastenings. "'What is the good of a man,' he said to himself at last, if he does not understand man's talk? Now I am as silly and dumb as a man would be with us in the jungle. I must speak their talk. It was not for fun that he had learned while he was with the wolves to imitate the challenge of bucks in the jungle and the grunt of the little wild pig. So as soon as Masua pronounced a word, Mowgli would imitate it almost perfectly, and before dark he had learned the names of many things in the hut. There was a difficulty at bedtime, because Mowgli would not sleep under anything that looked so like a panther trap as that hut, and when they shut the door he went through the window. "'Give him his will,' said Masua's husband. 
Remember, he can never till now have slept on a bed. If he is indeed sent in the place of our son, he will not run away. So Mowgli stretched himself in some long, clean grass at the edge of the field. But before he had closed his eyes, a soft gray nose poked him under the chin. Phew! said Gray Brother. He was the eldest of Mother Wolf's cubs. This is a poor reward for following thee twenty miles. Thou smellest of wood smoke and cattle, altogether like a man already. Wake, little brother, I bring news. Are all well in the jungle? said Mowgli, hugging him. All except the wolves that were burned with the red flower. Now listen. Shere Khan has gone away to hunt far off till his coat grows again, for he is badly singed. When he returns he swears that he will lay thy bones in the Wangonga. There are two words to that. I also have made a little promise. But news is always good. I am tired to-night, very tired with new things, Grey Brother. But bring me the news always. Thou wilt not forget that thou art a wolf? Men will not make thee forget, said Grey Brother anxiously. Never! I will always remember that I love thee and all in our cave, but also I will always remember that I have been cast out of the pack, and that thou mayest be cast out of another pack. Men are only men, little brother, and their talk is like the talk of frogs in a pond. When I come down here again, I will wait for thee in the bamboos at the edge of the grazing ground. For three months after that night Mowgli hardly ever left the village gate. He was so busy learning the ways and customs of men. First he had to wear a cloth round him which annoyed him horribly, and then he had to learn about money, which he did not in the least understand, and about ploughing, of which he did not see the use. Then the little children in the village made him very angry. Luckily the law of the jungle had taught him to keep his temper, for in the jungle life and food depend on keeping your temper, and when they made fun of him because he would not play games or fly kites, or because he mispronounced some word, only the knowledge that it was unsportsmanlike to kill little naked cubs kept him from picking them up and breaking them in two. He did not know his own strength in the least. In the jungle he knew he was weak, compared with the beasts. But in the village people said that he was as strong as a bull. And Mowgli had not the faintest idea of the difference that caste makes between man and man. When the potter's donkey slipped in the clay pit, Mowgli hauled it out by the tail, and helped to stack the pots for their journey to the market at Kanhawara. That was very shocking, too, for the potter is a low-caste man, and his donkey is worse. When the priest scolded him, Mowgli threatened to put him on the donkey, too, and the priest told Masua's husband that Mowgli had better be set to work as soon as possible, and the village headman told Mowgli that he would have to go out with the buffaloes next day and herd them while they grazed. No one was more pleased than Mowgli and that night, because he had been appointed a servant of the village, as it were, he went off to a circle that met every evening on a masonry platform under a great fig tree. It was the village club, and the headman, and the watchman, and the barber, who knew all the gossip of the village, and old Buldeo, the village hunter, who had a tower musket, met and smoked. The monkeys sat and talked in the upper branches, and there was a hole under the platform where a cobra lived, and he had his little platter of milk every night, because he was sacred. And the old men sat around the tree and talked and pulled at the big hookahs, the water-pipes, till far into the night. They told wonderful tales of gods and men and ghosts, and Buldeo told even more wonderful ones of the ways of the beasts in the jungle till the eyes of the children sitting outside the circle bulged out of their heads. Most of the tales were about animals, for the jungle was always at their door. The deer and the wild pig grubbed up their crops, and now and again the tiger carried off a man at twilight within sight of the village gates. Mowgli, who naturally knew something about what they were talking of, 
had to cover his face not to show that he was laughing, while Buldeo, the tower musket across his knees, climbed on from one wonderful story to another, and Mowgli's shoulders shook. Buldeo was explaining how the tiger that had carried away Masusa's son was a ghost tiger, and his body was inhabited by the ghost of a wicked old moneylender who had died some years ago. And I know that this is true, he said, because Purandas always limped from the blow that he got in a riot when his account books were burned, and the tiger that I speak of he limps too, for the tracks of his pads are unequal. "'True, true, that must be the truth,' said the greybeards, nodding together. "'Are all these tales such cobwebs and moon-talk?' said Mowgli. "'That tiger lamps because he was born lame, as every one knows. To talk of the soul of a money-lender in a beast that never had the courage of a jackal is child's talk.' Buldeo was speechless with surprise for a moment, and the headman stared. "'Ho, ho! It is the jungle brat, is it?' said Buldeo. "'If thou art so wise, better bring his hide to Kanhuara, for the government has set a hundred rupees on his life. Better still, talk not when thy elders speak.' Mowgli rose to go. "'All the evening I have laid here listening,' he called back over his shoulder, and except once or twice Buldeo has not said one word of truth concerning the jungle which is at his very doors. How then shall I believe the tales of ghosts and gods and goblins which he says he has seen? It is full time that boy went to herding, said the headman, while Buldeo puffed and snorted at Mowgli's impertinence. The custom of most Indian villages is for a few boys to take the cattle and buffaloes out to graze in the early morning and bring them back at night. The very cattle that would trample a white man to death allow themselves to be banged and bullied and shouted at by children that hardly come up to their noses. So long as the boys keep with the herds they are safe, for not even the tiger will charge a mob of cattle. But if they straggle to pick flowers or hunt lizards they are sometimes carried off. Mowgli went through the village street in the dawn, sitting on the back of Rama, the great herd-bull. The slaty-blue buffaloes, with their long, backward-sweeping horns and savage eyes, rose out of their byres one by one, and followed him, and Mowgli made it very clear to the children with him that he was the master. He beat the buffaloes with a long, polished bamboo, and told Kamya, one of the boys, to graze the cattle by themselves while he went on with the buffaloes, and to be very careful not to stray away from the herd. An Indian grazing ground is all rocks and scrub and tussocks and little ravines, among which the herds scatter and disappear. The buffaloes generally keep to the pools and muddy places, where they lie wallowing and basking in the warm mud for hours. Mowgli drove them on to the edge of the plain, where the Wangunga came out of the jungle. Then he dropped from Rama's neck, trotted off to a bamboo clump, and found Grey Brother. Ah, said Grey Brother, I have waited here very many days. What is the meaning of this cattle herding work? It is an order, said Mowgli. I am a village herd for a while. What news of Shere Khan? He has come back to this country, and has waited here a long time for thee. Now he has gone off again, for the game is scarce. But he means to kill thee. Very good, said Mowgli. So long as he is away, do thou or one of the four brothers sit on that rock, so that I can see thee as I come out of the village. When he comes back, wait for me in the ravine by the dahak tree in the center of the plain. We need not walk into Shere Khan's mouth. Then Mowgli picked out a shady place, and lay down and slept while the buffaloes grazed round him. Herding in India is one of the laziest things in the world. The cattle move and crunch and lie down and move on again, and they do not even low. They only grunt, and the buffaloes very seldom say anything, but get down into the muddy pools one after another and work their way into the mud till only their noses and staring china-blue eyes show above the surface. 
and then they lie like logs. The sun makes the rocks dance in the heat, and the herd children heard one kite, never any more, whistling almost out of sight overhead, and they know that if they died, or a cow died, that kite would sweep down, and the next kite miles away would see him drop and follow, and the next and the next, and almost before they were dead there would be a score of hungry kites come out of nowhere. Then they sleep and wake and sleep again, and weave little baskets of dried grass and put grasshoppers in them, or catch two praying mantises and make them fight, or string a necklace of red and black jungle nuts, or watch a lizard basking on a rock, or a snake hunting a frog near the wallows. Then they sing long, long songs with odd native quavers at the end of them, and the day seems longer than most people's whole lives, and perhaps they make a mud castle with mud figures of men and horses and buffaloes, and put reeds into the men's hands, and pretend that they are kings and the figures are their armies, or that they are gods to be worshipped. Then evening comes, and the children call, and the buffaloes lumber out of the sticky mud, with noises like gunshots going off, one after the other, and they all string across the gray plain back to the twinkling village lights. Day after day Mowgli would lead the buffaloes out to their wallows, and day after day he would see gray brothers back a mile and a half across the plain, so he knew that Shere Khan had not come back and day after day he would lie on the grass listening to the noises round him and dreaming of old days in the jungle. If Shere Khan had made a false step with his lame paw up in the jungles by the Wangunga, Mowgli would have heard him in those long, still mornings. At last a day came when he did not see Gray Brother at the signal place, and he laughed and headed the buffaloes for the ravine by the Dahak tree which was all covered with golden red flowers. There sat Gray Brother, every bristle on his back lifted. "'He has hidden for a month to throw thee off thy guard. He crossed the ranges last night with Tabaki, hot foot on thy trail,' said the wolf, panting. Mowgli frowned. "'I am not afraid of Shere Khan, but Tabaki is very cunning.' "'Have no fear,' said Gray Brother, licking his lips a little. I met Tabaki in the dawn. Now he is telling all his wisdom to the kites. But he told me everything before I broke his back. Shere Khan's plan is to wait for thee at the village gate this evening, for thee and for no one else. He is lying up now in the big dry ravine of the Wangonga. Has he eaten today, or does he hunt empty? said Mowgli, for the answer meant life and death to him. He killed at dawn a pig, and he has drunk, too. Remember, Shere Khan could never fast, even for the sake of revenge. Oh, fool, fool, what a cub's cub it is, eaten and drunk, too, and he thinks that I shall wait till he has slept. Now where does he lie up? If there were but ten of us, we might pull him down as he lies. These buffaloes will not charge unless they wind him and I cannot speak their language. Can we get behind his track so that they may smell it? He swam far down the Wangunga to cut that off, said Gray Brother. Tabaki told him that, I know. He would never have thought of it alone. Mowgli stood with his finger in his mouth, thinking. The big ravine of the Wangunga, that opens out on the plain, not half a mile from here. I can take the herd round through the jungle to the head of the ravine, and then sweep down. But he would slink out at the foot. We must block that end. Gray brother, canst thou cut the herd in two for me? Not I, perhaps, but I have brought a wise helper. Gray brother trotted off and dropped into a hole. Then there lifted up a huge gray head that Mowgli knew well and the hot air was filled with the most desolate cry of all the jungle, the hunting howl of a wolf at midday. "'Akela! Akela! said Mowgli, clapping his hands. "'I might have known that thou wouldst not forget me. We have a big work in hand. Cut the herd in two, Akela. Keep the cows and calves together, and the bulls and the plow-buffaloes by themselves.' 
The two wolves ran, ladies' chain fashion, in and out of the herd, which snorted and threw up its head, and separated into two clumps. In one the cow buffaloes stood with their calves in the center, and glared and pawed, ready, if a wolf would only stay still, to charge down and trample the life out of him. In the other the bulls and the young bulls snorted and stamped, but though they looked more imposing they were much less dangerous, for they had no calves to protect. No six men could have divided the herd so neatly. "'What orders?' panted Akela. "'They are trying to join again.' Mowgli slipped on to Rama's back. "'Drive the bulls away to the left, Akela. Grey brother, when we are gone, hold the cows together, and drive them to the foot of the ravine.' "'How far?' said Grey brother, panting and snapping. "'Till the sides are higher than Shere Khan can jump,' shouted Mowgli. "'Keep them there till we come down.' The bull swept off as Akela bayed, and Grey Brother stopped in front of the cows. They charged down on him, and he ran just before them to the foot of the ravine, as Akela drove the bulls far to the left. "'Well done. Another charge, and they are fairly started. Careful now. Careful, Akela. A snap too much, and the bulls will charge. Hoja! This is wilder work than driving Black Buck. Didst thou think these creatures could move so swiftly?' Mowgli called. "'I have. I have hunted these, too, in my time,' gasped Akela in the dust. "'Shall I turn them into the jungle?' "'I turn, swiftly turn them. Rama is mad with rage. Oh, if I could only tell him what I need of him to-day!' The bulls were turned to the right this time, and crashed into the standing thicket. The other herd children, watching with the cattle half a mile away, hurried to the village as fast as their legs could carry them, crying that the buffaloes had gone mad and run away. But Mowgli's plan was simple enough. All he wanted to do was to make a big circle uphill and get at the head of the ravine, and then take the bulls down it and catch Shere Khan between the bulls and the cows, for he knew that after a meal and a full drink Shere Khan would not be in any condition to fight or to clamber up the sides of the ravine. He was soothing the buffaloes now by voice, and Akela had dropped far to the rear, only whimpering once or twice to hurry the rear-guard. It was a long, long circle, for they did not wish to get too near the ravine and give Shere Khan warning. At last Mowgli rounded up the bewildered herd at the head of the ravine on a grassy patch that sloped steeply down to the ravine itself. From that height you could see across the tops of the trees down to the plain below, but what Mowgli looked at was the size of the ravine, and he saw with a great satisfaction that they ran nearly straight up and down, while the vines and creepers that hung over them would give no foothold to a tiger who wanted to get out. "'Let them breathe, Akela,' he said, holding up his hand. "'They have not winded him yet.' Let them breathe. I must tell Shere Khan who comes. We have him in the trap." He put his hands to his mouth and shouted down the ravine. It was almost like shouting down a tunnel, and the echoes jumped from rock to rock. After a long time there came back the drawling, sleepy snarl of a full-fed tiger just wakened. "'Who calls?' said Shere Khan and a splendid peacock fluttered up out of the ravine, screeching. "'Hi! Mowgli! Cattle thief, it is time to come to the council rock. Down! Hurry them down, Akela! Down, Rama, down!' The herd paused for an instant at the edge of the slope, but Akela gave tongue in the full hunting yell, and they pitched over one after the other, just as steamers shoot rapids. The sand and stones spurted up round them. Once started, there was no chance of stopping, and before they were fairly in the bed of the ravine, Rama winded Shere Khan and bellowed. "'Ha! ha!' said Mowgli on his back. "'Now thou knowest!' And the torrent of black horns, foaming muzzles, and staring eyes whirled down the ravine just as boulders go down in flood-time. The weaker buffaloes being shouldered out to the sides of the ravine, where they tore through the creepers. They knew what the business was before them. 
the terrible charge of the buffalo herd, against which no tiger can hope to stand. Shere Khan heard the thunder of their hoofs, picked himself up, and lumbered down the ravine, looking from side to side for some way of escape. But the walls of the ravine were straight up, and he had to hold on, heavy with his dinner and his drink, willing to do anything rather than fight. The herd splashed through the pool he had just left, bellowing till the narrow cut rang. Mowgli heard an answering bellow from the foot of the ravine, saw Shere Khan turn. The tiger knew, if the worst came to the worst, it was better to meet the bulls than the cows with their calves. And then Rama tripped, stumbled, and went on over something soft, and with the bulls at his heels crashed full into the other herd while the weaker buffaloes were lifted clean off their feet by the shock of the meeting. That charge carried both herds out into the plain, goring and stamping and snorting. Mowgli watched his time and slipped off Rama's neck, laying about him right and left with his stick. Quick, Akela, break them up, scatter them, or they will be fighting one another. Drive them away, Akela. Hi, Rama. Hi, 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 my children. Softly now, softly. It is all over. Akela and Gray Brother ran to and fro, nipping the buffalo's legs, and, though the herd wheeled once to charge up the ravine again, Mowgli managed to turn Rama, and the others followed him to the wallows. Shere Khan needed no more trampling. He was dead, and the kites were coming for him already. Brothers, that was a dog's death. Feeling for the knife he always carried in a sheath round his neck, now that he lived with men. But he would never have shown fight. His hide will look well on the council rock. We must get to work swiftly. A boy trained among men would never have dreamed of skinning a ten-foot tiger alone. But Mowgli knew better than anyone else how an animal's skin is fitted on, and how it can be taken off. But it was hard work and Mowgli slashed and tore and grunted for an hour, while the wolves lolled out their tongues, or came forward and tugged as he ordered them. Presently a hand fell on his shoulder, and looking up he saw Buldeo with the tower musket. The children had told the village about the buffalo stampede, and Buldeo went out angrily, only too anxious to correct Mowgli for not taking better care of the herd. The wolves dropped out of sight as soon as they saw the man coming. "'What is this folly?' said Buldeo angrily. "'To think that thou canst skin a tiger? Where did the buffaloes kill him? It is the lame tiger, too, and there is a hundred rupees on his head. Well, well, we will overlook thy letting the herd run off, and perhaps I will give thee one of the rupees of the reward when I have taken the skin to Kanhiwara.' He fumbled in his waistcloth for flint and steel, and stooped down to singe Shere Khan's whiskers. Most native hunters always singe a tiger's whiskers to prevent his ghost from haunting them. Huh! said Mowgli, half to himself as he ripped back the skin of a forepaw. So thou wilt take the hide to Kanhawara for the reward, and perhaps give me one rupee? Now it is in my mind that I need the skin for my own use. <laughs> Old man, take away that fire. What talk is this to the chief hunter of the village? Thy luck and the stupidity of thy buffaloes have helped thee to this kill. The tiger has just fed, or he would have gone twenty miles by this time. Thou canst not even skin him properly, little beggar brat, and forsooth I, Buldeo, must be told not to singe his whiskers? Mowgli, I will not give thee one anna of the reward but only a very big beating. Leave the carcass." "'By the bull that bought me,' said Mowgli, who was trying to get at the shoulder, "'must I stay babbling to an old ape all noon? Here, Akela, this man plagues me.' Buldeo, who was stooping over Shere Khan's head, found himself sprawling on the grass, with a gray wolf standing over him, while Mowgli went on skinning as though he were alone in all India. Yes, he said between his teeth, thou art altogether right, Buldeo. Thou wilt never give me one anna of the reward. There is an old war between this lame tiger and myself, 
a very old war, and I have won. To do Buldeo justice, if he had been ten years younger, he would have taken his chance with Akela, had he met the wolf in the woods. But a wolf who obeyed the orders of this boy, who had private wars with man-eating tigers, was not a common animal. It was sorcery, magic of the worst kind, thought Buldeo, and he wondered whether the amulet round his neck would protect him. He lay as still as still, expecting every minute to see Mowgli turn into a tiger too. Maharaja, great king, he said at last in a husky whisper. Yes, said Mowgli, without turning his head, chuckling a little. I am an old man. I did not know that thou wast anything more than a herd's boy. May I rise up and go away, or wilt thy servant tear me to pieces? Go, and peace go with thee. Only another time do not meddle with my game. Let him go, Akela. Buldeo hobbled away to the village as fast as he could, looking back over his shoulder in case Mowgli should change into something terrible. When he got to the village he told a tale of magic and enchantment and sorcery that made the priest look very grave. Mowgli went on with his work, but it was nearly twilight before he and the wolves had drawn the great gay skin clear of the body. Now we must hide this and take the buffaloes home. Help me herd them, Akela. The herd rounded up in the misty twilight, and when they got near the village Mowgli saw lights and heard the conches and bells in the temple blowing and banging. Half the village seemed to be waiting for him by the gate. That is because I have killed Shere Khan, he said to himself. But a shower of stones whistled about his ears, and the villagers shouted, Sorcerer! Wolf's brat! Jungle demon! Go away! Get hence quickly, or the priest will turn thee into a wolf again! Shoot, Buldeo, shoot! The old tower musket went off with a bang, and a young buffalo bellowed in pain. More sorcery! shouted the villagers. He can turn bullets! Buldeo, that was thy buffalo! Now what is this? said Mowgli, bewildered, as the stones flew thicker. They are not unlike the pack, these brothers of thine, said Akela, sitting down composedly. It is in my head that, if bullets mean anything, they would cast thee out. Wolf! Wolf's cub! Go away! shouted the priest, waving a sprig of the sacred tulsi plant. Again? Last time it was because I was a man. This time it is because I am a wolf. Let us go, Akela. A woman, it was Basua, ran across to the herd and cried, O oh, my son, my son, they say thou art a sorcerer who can turn himself into a beast at will. I do not believe, but go away or they will kill thee. Buldeo says thou art a wizard, but I know that thou hast avenged Nathu's death. Come back, Masua, shouted the crowd. Come back or we will stone thee. Mowgli laughed a little, short, ugly laugh, for a stone had hit him in the mouth. Run back, Masua. This is one of the foolish tales they tell under the big tree at dusk. I have at least paid for thy son's life. Farewell, and run quickly, for I shall send the herd in more swiftly than their brickbats. I am no wizard, Masua. Farewell. Now once more, Akela, he cried, bring the herd in. The buffaloes were anxious enough to get to the village. They hardly needed Akela's yell, but charged through the gate like a whirlwind, scattering the crowd right and left. "'Keep count!' shouted Mowgli scornfully. "'It may be that I have stolen one of them. Keep count, for I will do your hurting no more. Fare you well, children of men, and thank Masua that I do not come in with my wolves and hunt you up and down your street.' He turned on his heel and walked away with the lone wolf, and as he looked up at the stars he felt happy. No more sleeping in traps for me, Akela. Let us get Shere Khan's skin and go away. No, we will not hurt the village, for Masua was kind to me. When the moon rose over the plain, making it look all milky, the horrified villagers saw Mowgli 
with two wolves at his heels and a bundle on his head, trotting across at the steady wolf's trot that eats up the long miles like fire. Then they banged the temple bells and blew the conches louder than ever. And Masua cried, and Buldeo embroidered the story of his adventures in the jungle, till he ended by saying that Akela stood up on his hind legs and talked like a man. The moon was just going down when Mowgli and the two wolves came to the hill of the Council Rock, and they stopped at Mother Wolf's cave. "'They have cast me out from the man-pack, Mother,' shouted Mowgli, "'but I come with the hide of Shere Khan to keep my word.' Mother Wolf walked stiffly from the cave with the cubs behind her, and her eyes glowed as she saw the skin. I told him on that day, when he crammed his head and shoulders into this cave, hunting for thy life, little frog, I told him that the hunter would be the hunted. It is well done. Little brother, it is well done, said a deep voice in the thicket. We are lonely in the jungle without thee and Bagheera came running to Mowgli's bare feet. They clambered up the council rock together, and Mowgli spread the skin out on the flat stone where Akela used to sit, and pegged it down with four slivers of bamboo, and Akela lay down upon it and called the old call to the council. Look, look well, O oh wolves, exactly as he had called when Mowgli was first brought there. Ever since Akela had been deposed, the pack had been without a leader, hunting and fighting at their own pleasure, but they answered the call from habit, and some of them were lame from the traps they had fallen into, and some limped from shot wounds, and some were mangy from eating bad food, and many were missing. But they came to the council rock, all that were left of them, and saw Shere Khan's striped hide on the rock and the huge claws dangling at the end of the empty, dangling feet. It was then that Mowgli made up a song that came up into his throat all by itself, and he shouted it aloud, leaping up and down on the rattling skin, and beating time with his heels till he had no more breath left, while Gray Brother and Akela howled between the verses. "'Look well, O wolves, have I kept my word?' said Mowgli, and the wolves bayed, Yes! And one tattered wolf howled, Lead us again, O Akela, lead us again, O man-cub, for we be sick of this lawlessness, and we would be the free people once more. Nay, purred Bagheera, that may not be. When ye are full-fed, the madness may come upon you again. Not for nothing are ye called the free people. Ye fought for freedom, and it is yours. Eat it, O wolves. Man-pack and wolf-pack have cast me out, said Mowgli. Now I will hunt alone in the jungle. And we will hunt with thee, said the four cubs. So Mowgli went away and hunted with the four cubs in the jungle from that day on. But he was not always alone, because years afterward he became a man and married. But that is a story for grown-ups. Mowgli's song that he sang at the Council Rock when he danced on Shere Khan's hide. The song that Mowgli, I, Mowgli, am singing. Let the jungle listen to the things I have done. Shere Khan said he would kill, would kill. At the gates in the twilight he would kill Mowgli the frog. He ate and he drank. Drink deep, Shere Khan, for when wilt thou drink again? Sleep and dream of the kill. I am alone on the grazing grounds. Gray brother, come to me, come to me, lone wolf, for there is big game afoot. Bring up the great bull buffaloes, the blue-skinned herd bulls with the angry eyes. Drive them to and fro as I order. Sleepest thou still, Shere Khan? Wake, oh, wake! Here come I, and the bulls are behind. Rama, the king of the buffaloes, stamped with his foot. Waters of the Wanganga, whither went Shere Khan? He is not Iggy to dig holes, nor Mayo the peacock that he should fly. He is not Mang the bat to hang in the branches. Little bamboos that creak together, tell me where he ran. Oh, he is there. 
Ah, who he is there. Under the feet of Rama lies the lame one. Up, Shere Khan. Up and kill. Here is meat. Break the necks of the bulls. Hush, he is asleep. We will not wake him, for his strength is very great. The kites have come down to see it. The black ants have come up to know it. There is a great assembly in his honor. Ah, la, la, I have no cloth to wrap me. The kites will see that I am naked. I am ashamed to meet all these people. Lend me thy coat, Shere Khan. Lend me the gay striped coat, that I may go to the council rock. By the bull that bought me I made a promise, a little promise. Only thy coat is lacking before I keep my word. With a knife, with the knife that men use, with the knife of the hunter, I will stoop down for my gift. Waters of the Wanganga, Shere Khan gives me his coat, for the love that he bears me. Pull, Grey Brother, pull, Akela, heavy is the hide of Shere Khan. The man-pack are angry, they throw stones and talk child's talk. My mouth is bleeding, let me run away. Through the night, through the hot night, run swiftly with me, my brothers. We will leave the lights of the village and go to the low moon. Waters of the Wangunga, the man-pack have cast me out. I did them no harm, but they were afraid of me. Why? Wolf-pack, ye have cast me out, too. The jungle is shut to me, and the village gates are shut. Why? As Mang flies between the beasts and birds, so fly I between the village and the jungle. Why? I dance on the hide of Shere Khan, but my heart is very heavy. My mouth is cut and wounded with the stones from the village, but my heart is very light, because I have come back to the jungle. Why? These two things fight together in me as the snakes fight in the spring. The water comes out of my eyes. Yet I laugh while it falls. Why? I am two Mowgli's. But the hide of Shere Khan is under my feet. All the jungle knows that I have killed Shere Khan. Look, look well, O oh wolves. Ay, my heart is heavy with the things that I do not understand. End of Tiger, Tiger by Rudyard Kipling Mowgli's Song by Rudyard Kipling Mowgli's Song that he sang at the Council Rock when he danced on Shere Khan's hide. The Song of Mowgli, I, Mowgli, am singing. Let the jungle listen to the things I have done. Shere Khan said he would kill, would kill. At the gates in the twilight he would kill Mowgli the frog. He ate and he drank. Drink deep, Shere Khan, for when wilt thou drink again? Sleep and dream of the kill. I am alone on the grazing grounds. Grey brother, come to me. Come to me, lone wolf, for there is big game afoot. Bring up the great bull buffaloes, the blue-skinned herd bulls with the angry eyes. Drive them to and fro as I order. Sleepest thou still, Shere Khan? Wake, awake! Oh Here come I, and the bulls are behind. Rama, the king of the buffaloes, stamped with his foot. Waters of the Wangunga, whether with Shere Khan? He is not Icky to dig holes, nor Mao the peacock that he should fly. He is not Mang the bat to hang in the branches. Little bamboos that creak together. Tell me where he ran. Oh, here he is. Ahu, he is there under the feet of Rama, lies the lame one. Up, Shere Khan, up and kill. Here is meat. Break the necks of the bulls. Hush, he is asleep. We will not wake him, for his strength is very great. The kites have come down to see it. The black ants have come up to know it. There is a great assembly in his honor. Allah, la, I have no cloth to wrap me. The kites will see that I am naked. I am ashamed to meet all these people. Lend me thy coat, Shere Khan. Lend me thy gay-striped coat, that I may go to the council rock. By the bull that bought me, I made a promise, a little promise. Only thy coat is lacking before I keep my word. 
with a knife with a knife that men use with a knife of the hunter i will stoop down for my gift waters of the wangunga shere khan gives me his coat for the love that he bears me pull gray brother pull akela heavy is the hide of shere khan the man pack are angry they throw stones and talk child's talk my mouth is bleeding let me run away through the night through the hot night run swiftly with me my brothers we will leave the lights of the village and go to the low moon waters of the wangunga the man pack have cast me out i did them no harm but they were afraid of me why wolf pack ye have cast me out too the jungle is shut to me and the village gates are shut why as mang flies between the beasts and birds so fly i between the village and the jungle why i dance on the hide of shere khan but my heart is very heavy my mouth is cut and wounded with the stones from the village but my heart is very light because i have come back to the jungle why these two things fight together in me as the snakes fight in the spring the water comes out of my eyes yet i laugh while it falls why i am two mowgli's but the hide of shere khan is under my feet all the jungle knows that i have killed shere khan look look well o oh wolves ah hey my heart is heavy with the things that i do not understand End of Mowgli Song by Rudyard Kipling Story 5 of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling How Fear Came The stream is shrunk, the pool is dry, and we be comrades, thou and I, with fevered jowl and dusty flank, each jostling each along the bank, and by one drouthy fear made still for going thought of quest or kill now neath his dam the fawn may see the lean pack wolf as cowed as he and the tall buck unflinching note the fangs that tore his father's throat the pools are shrunk the streams are dry and we be playmates thou and i till yonder cloud good hunting loose the rain that breaks our water truce the law of the jungle which is by far the oldest law in the world has arranged for almost every kind of accident that may befall the jungle people till now its code is as perfect as time and custom can make it if you have read the other book about mowgli you will remember that mowgli spent a great part of his life in the sioni wolf pack learning the law from baloo the brown bear and it was baloo who told him when the boy grew impatient of the constant orders that the law was like the giant creeper because it dropped across everyone's back and no one could escape when thou hast lived as long as i have little brother thou wilt see how all the jungle obeys at least one law and that will be no pleasant sight said baloo this talk went in at one ear and out at the other for a boy who spends his life eating and sleeping does not worry about anything till it actually stares him in the face but one year baloo's words came true and mowgli saw all the jungle working under the law it began when the winter rains failed almost entirely, and Iki, the porcupine, meeting Mowgli in a bamboo thicket, told him that the wild yams were drying up. Now everybody knows that Iki is ridiculously fastidious in his choice of food, and will eat nothing but the very best and ripest. So Mowgli laughed and said, What is that to me? Not much now said Ikki, rattling his quills in a stiff, uncomfortable way. 
but later we shall see. Is there any more diving into the deep rock pool below the bee rocks, little brother? No, the foolish water is going all away, and I do not wish to break my head, said Mowgli, who in those days was quite sure that he knew as much as any five of the jungle people put together. That is thy loss. A small crack might let in some wisdom. Ikki ducked quickly to prevent Mowgli from pulling his nose bristles, and Mowgli told Baloo what Ikki had said. Baloo looked very grave and mumbled, half to himself, "'If I were alone, I would change my hunting grounds now, before the others began to think. And yet, hunting among strangers ends in fighting, and they might hurt the man-cub. We must wait and see how the moa blooms.' That year the moa tree, that Baloo was so fond of, never flowered. The greeny, cream-colored, waxy blossoms were heat-killed before they were born, and only a few bad-smelling petals came down when he stood on his hind legs and shook the tree. Then, inch by inch, the untempered heat crept into the heart of the jungle, turning it yellow, brown, and at last black. The green growths in the sides of the ravines burned up to broken wires and curled films of dead stuff. The hidden pools sank down and caked over, keeping the last, least footmark on their edges as if it had been cast in iron. The juicy-stemmed creepers fell away from the trees they clung to and died at their feet. The bamboos withered, clanking when the hot winds blew, and the moss peeled off the rocks deep in the jungle, till they were as bare and as hot as the quivering blue boulders in the bed of the stream. The birds and the monkey people went north early in the year, for they knew what was coming, and the deer and the wild pig broke far away to the perished fields of the villages, dying sometimes before the eyes of men too weak to kill them. Cheel the kite stayed and grew fat, for there was a great deal of carrion, and evening after evening he brought the news to the beasts, too weak to force their way to fresh hunting grounds, that the sun was killing the jungle for three days' flight in every direction. Mowgli, who had never known what real hunger meant, fell back on stale honey three years old, scraped out of deserted rock hives, honey black as a slow and dusty with dried sugar. He hunted, too, for deep boring grubs under the bark of the trees, and robbed the wasps of their new broods. All the game in the jungle was no more than skin and bone, and Bagheera could kill thrice in a night and hardly get a full meal. But the want of water was the worst. For though the jungle people drink seldom, they must drink deep. And the heat went on and on, and sucked up all the moisture, till at last the main channel of the Waingunga was the only stream that carried a trickle of water between its dead banks. And when Hathi, the wild elephant, who lives for a hundred years and more, saw a long, lean, blue ridge of rock show dry in the very center of the stream, he knew that he was looking at the peace rock, and then and there he lifted up his trunk and proclaimed the water truce, as his father before him had proclaimed it fifty years ago. The deer, wild pig, and buffalo took up the cry hoarsely, and Cheel the kite flew in great circles far and wide, whistling and shrieking the warning. By the law of the jungle, it is death to kill at the drinking places when once the water truce has been declared. The reason of this is that drinking comes before eating. Everyone in the jungle can scramble along somehow when only game is scarce. But water is water, and when there is but one source of supply, all hunting stops while the jungle people go there for their needs. In good seasons, when water was plentiful, those who came down to drink at the Waingunga, or anywhere else for that matter, did so at the risk of their lives, 
and that risk made no small part of the fascination of the night's doings. To move down so cunningly that never a leaf stirred, to wade knee-deep in the roaring shallows that drown all noise from behind, to drink, looking backward over one shoulder, every muscle ready for the first desperate bound of keen terror, to roll on the sandy margin and return wet-muzzled and well-plumped out to the admiring herd, was a thing that all tall, antlered young bucks took a delight in, precisely because they knew that at any moment Bagheera or Shere Khan might leap upon them and bear them down. But now all that life-and-death fun was ended, and the jungle people came up, starved and weary, to the shrunken river. Tiger, bear, deer, buffalo, and pig all together drank the fouled waters and hung above them, too exhausted to move off. The deer and the pig had tramped all day in search of something better than dried bark and withered leaves. The buffaloes had found no wallows to be cool in, and no green crops to steal. The snakes had left the jungle and come down to the river in the hope of finding a stray frog. They curled round wet stones and never offered to strike when the nose of a rooting pig dislodged them. The river turtles had long ago been killed by Bagheera, cleverest of hunters, and the fish had buried themselves deep in the dry mud. Only the peace rock lay across the shallows like a long stake, and the little tired ripples hissed as they dried on its hot side. It was here that Mowgli came nightly for the cool and the companionship. The most hungry of his enemies would hardly have cared for the boy then. His naked hide made him seem more lean and wretched than any of his fellows. His hair was bleached to toe color by the sun. His ribs stood out like the ribs of a basket, and the lumps of his knees and elbows, where he was used to track on all fours, gave his shrunken limbs the look of knotted grass stems. But his eye, under his matted forelock, was cool and quiet, for Bagheera was his adviser in this time of trouble, and told him to go quietly, hunt slowly, and never, on any account, to lose his temper. "'It is an evil time,' said the Black Panther one furnace-hot evening. "'But it will go if we can live till the end. "'Is thy stomach full, man-cub?' "'There's stuff in my stomach, but I get no good of it. "'Thank you, Bagheera. "'The rains have forgotten us and will never come again.' "'Not I. "'We shall see the moha in blossom yet, "'and the little fawns all fat with new grass. "'Come down to the peace rock and hear the news. "'On my back, little brother. "'This is no time to carry weight. "'I can still stand alone, but—' Indeed, we be no fatted bullocks, we too. Bagheera looked along his ragged, dusty flank and whispered, Last night I killed a bullock under the yoke. So low was I brought that I think I should not have dared to spring if he had been loose. Woe! Mowgli laughed. Yes, we be great hunters now, said he. I am very bold to eat grubs. And the two came down together through the crackling undergrowth to the river bank and the lace work of shoals that ran out from it in every direction. The water cannot live long, said Baloo, joining them. Look across. Yonder are trails like the roads of man. On the level plain of the farther bank, the stiff jungle grass had died standing, and dying had mummified. The beaten tracks of the deer and the pig, all heading toward the river, had striped that colorless plain with dusty gullies driven through the ten-foot grass, and, early as it was, each long avenue was full of first-comers hastening to the water. You could hear the does and fawns coughing in the snuff-like dust. Upstream, at the bend of the sluggish pool round the peace rock, and warden of the water truce, stood Hathi the wild elephant, 
with his sons, gaunt and gray in the moonlight, rocking to and fro, always rocking. Below him, a little, were the vanguard of the deer, below these again the pig and the wild buffalo, and on the opposite bank, where the tall trees came down to the water's edge, was the place set apart for the eaters of flesh, the tiger, the wolves, the panther, the bear, and the others. "'We are under one law indeed,' said Bagheera, wading into the water and looking across at the lines of clicking horns and starting eyes, where the deer and the pig pushed each other to and fro. "'Good hunting, all of you of my blood,' he added, lying down at full length, one flank thrust out of the shallows, and then between his teeth, but for that which is the law it would be very good hunting. The quick-spread ears of the deer caught the last sentence, and a frightened whisper ran among the ranks. The truce! Remember the truce! Peace there, peace, gurgled Hathi, the wild elephant. The truce holds, Bagheera. This is no time to talk of hunting. Who should know better than I? Bagheera answered, rolling his yellow eyes upstream. I am an eater of turtles, a fisher of frogs. Ah, would I could get good from chewing branches. We wish so very greatly, bleated a young fawn, who had only been born that spring and did not at all like it. Wretched as the jungle people were, even Hathi could not help chuckling, while Mowgli, lying on his elbows in the warm water, laughed aloud and beat up the scum with his feet. "'Well spoken, little Budhorn,' Bagheera purred. "'When the truce ends, that shall be remembered in thy favor." And he looked keenly through the darkness to make sure of recognizing the fawn again. Gradually the talking spread up and down the drinking places. One could hear the shuffling, snorting pig asking for more room, the buffaloes grunting among themselves as they lurched out across the sandbars, and the deer telling pitiful stories of their long footsore wanderings in quest of food. Now and again they asked some question of the eaters of flesh across the river, but all the news was bad, and the roaring hot wind of the jungle came and went between the rocks and the rattling branches and scattered twigs and dust on the water. "'The men, too, they die beside their ploughs,' said a young Sambor. "'I passed three between sunset and night. They lay still and their bullocks with them.' We also shall lie still in a little. The river has fallen since last night, said Baloo. O oh, Hathi, hast thou ever seen the like of this drought? It will pass, it will pass, said Hathi, squirting water along his back and sides. We have one here that cannot endure long, said Baloo and he looked toward the boy he loved. "'I?' said Mowgli indignantly, sitting up in the water. "'I have no long fur to cover my bones, but—but but if thy hide were taken off, Baloo—' Hathi shook all over at the idea, and Baloo said severely, "'Man-cub, that is not seemly to tell a teacher of the law. Never have I been seen without my hide.' Nay, I meant no harm, Baloo, but only that thou art as it were like a coconut in the husk, and I am the same coconut, all naked. Now that brown husk of thine, Mowgli was sitting cross-legged and explaining things with his forefinger in his usual way, when Bagheera put out a patty paw and pulled him over backwards into the water. "'Worse and worse,' said the Black Panther, as the boy rose spluttering. First Baloo is to be skinned, and now he is a coconut. Be careful that he does not do what the ripe coconuts do.' "'And what is that?' asked Mowgli, off his guard for the minute, though that is one of the oldest catches in the jungle. "'Break thy head,' said Bagheera quietly, pulling him under again. 
"'It is not good to make a jest of thy teacher,' said the bear, when Mowgli had been ducked for the third time. "'Not good? What would ye have? That naked thing running to and fro makes a monkey jest of those who have once been good hunters, and pulls the best of us by the whiskers for sport.' This was Shere Khan, the lame tiger, limping down to the water. He waited a little to enjoy the sensation he made among the deer on the opposite, to lap, growling, "'The jungle has become a whelping ground for naked cubs now. Look at me, man-cub!' Mowgli looked, stared, rather, as insolently as he knew how, and in a minute— Shere Khan turned away uneasily. "'Man-cub this and man-cub that,' he rumbled, going on with his drink. "'The cub is neither man nor cub, or he would have been afraid. Next season I shall have to beg his leave for a drink. Ah!' "'That may come, too,' said Bagheera, looking him steadily between the eyes. "'That?' They come too. Faugh! Shere Khan! What new shame hast thou brought here? The lame tiger had dipped his chin and jowl in the water, and dark oily streaks were floating from it downstream. Man, said Shere Khan coolly, I killed an hour since. He went on purring and growling to himself. The line of beasts shook and wavered to and fro, and a whisper went up that grew to a cry. Man, man, he has killed man! Then all looked toward Hathi, the wild elephant, but he seemed not to hear. Hathi never does anything till the time comes, and that is one of the reasons why he lives so long. At such season as this to kill man... "'Was no other game afoot?' said Bagheera scornfully, "'drawing himself out of the tainted water "'and shaking each paw, cat-fashion, as he did so. "'I killed for choice, not for food.' "'The horrified whisper began again, "'and Hathi's watchful little white eye "'cocked itself in Shere Khan's direction. "'For choice,' Shere Khan drawled, now I come to drink and make me clean again. Is there any to forbid? Bagheera's back began to curve like a bamboo in a high wind, but Hathi lifted up his trunk and spoke quietly. The kill was from choice? he asked. And when Hathi asks a question, it is best to answer. Even so. It was my right and my night. Thou knowest, O Hathi. Shere Khan spoke almost courteously. Yes, I know, Hathi answered. And after a little silence, Hast thou drunk thy fill? For tonight, yes. Go, then. The river is to drink and not to defile. None but the lame tiger would have so boasted of his right at this season when, when we suffer together, man and jungle people alike, clean or unclean, get to thy lair, Shere Khan. The last words rang out like silver trumpets, and Hathi's three sons rolled forward half a pace, though there was no need. Shere Khan slunk away, not daring to growl, for he knew, what every one else knows, that when the last comes to the last, Hathi is the master of the jungle. "'What is this right Shere Khan speaks of?' Mowgli whispered in Bakhira's ear. "'To kill man is always shameful. The law says so, and yet Hathi says, "'Ask him. I do not know, little brother.' Right or no right, if Hathi had not spoken, I would have taught that lame butcher his lesson. To come to the peace rock fresh from a kill of man, and to boast of it, is a jackal's trick. Besides, he tainted the good water. 
Mowgli waited for a minute to pick up his courage, because no one cared to address Hathi directly, and then he cried, "'What is Shere Khan's right, O Hathi?' Both banks echoed his words, for all the people of the jungle are intensely curious, and they had just seen something that none except Baloo, who looked very thoughtful, seemed to understand. "'It is an old tale,' said Hathi, "'a tale older than the jungle. "'Keep silence along the banks, and I will tell that tale.' There was a minute or two of pushing and shouldering among the pigs and the buffalo, and then the leaders of the herds grunted one after another. We wait. And Hathi strode forward, till he was nearly knee-deep in the pool by the peace rock. Lean and wrinkled and yellow tusked though he was, he looked what the jungle knew him to be, their master. Ye know, children, he began, that of all things ye most fear, man. And there was a mutter of agreement. This tale touches thee, little brother, said Bagheera to Mowgli. I? I am of the pack, a hunter of the free people, Mowgli answered. What have I to do with man? And ye do not know why ye fear man, Hathi went on. This is the reason. In the beginning of the jungle, and none knew when that was, we of the jungle walked together, having no fear of one another. In those days there was no drought, and leaves and flowers and fruit grew on the same tree, and we ate nothing at all except leaves and flowers and grass and fruit and bark. "'I am glad I was not born in those days,' said Bagheera. Bark is only good to sharpen claws. And the lord of the jungle was Fa, the first of the elephants. He drew the jungle out of deep waters with his trunk, and where he made furrows in the ground with his tusks, there the rivers ran, and where he struck with his foot, there rose ponds of good water, and when he blew through his trunk, thus the trees fell. That was the manner in which the jungle was made by Tha, and so the tale was told to me. It has not lost fat in the telling, Bagheera whispered, and Mowgli laughed behind his hand. In those days there was no corn or melons or pepper or sugar cane, nor were there any little huts such as ye have all seen, and the jungle people knew nothing of man but lived in the jungle together, making one people. But presently they began to dispute over their food, though there was grazing enough for all. They were lazy. Each wished to eat where he lay, as sometimes we can do now when the spring rains are good. Tha, the first of the elephants, was busy making new jungles and leading the rivers in their beds. He could not walk in all places, therefore he made the first of the tigers the master and the judge of the jungle, to whom the jungle people should bring their disputes. In those days the first of the tigers ate fruit and grass with the others. He was as large as I am, and he was very beautiful, in color all over like the blossom of the yellow creeper. There was never stripe nor bar upon his hide in those good days when this the jungle was new. All the jungle people came before him without fear, and his word was the law of all the jungle. We were then, remember ye, one people. Yet upon a night there was a dispute between two bucks, a grazing quarrel such as ye now settle with the horns and the forefeet. And it is said that as the two spoke together before the first of the tigers lying among the flowers, a buck pushed him with his horns, and the first of the tigers forgot that he was the master and judge of the jungle, and leaping upon that buck, broke his neck. Till that night never one of us had died, and the first of the tigers, seeing what he had done, 
and being made foolish by the scent of the blood, ran away into the marshes of the north, and we of the jungle, left without a judge, fell to fighting among ourselves. And Tha heard the noise of it, and came back. Then some of us said this, and some of us said that. But he saw the dead buck among the flowers, and asked who had killed. And we of the jungle would not tell, because the smell of the blood made us foolish. We ran to and fro in circles, capering and crying out and shaking our heads. Then Tha gave an order to the trees that hang low, and said to the trailing creepers of the jungle that they should mark the killer of the buck, so that he should know him again. And he said, Who will now be master of the jungle people? Then up leaped the gray ape who lives in the branches, and said, I will now be master of the jungle. At this Tha laughed, and said, So be it, and went away very angry. Children, ye know the gray ape. He was then as he is now. At first he made a wise face for himself, but in a little while he began to scratch and to leap up and down, and when Tha came back he found the gray ape hanging head down from a bough, mocking those who stood below, and they mocked him again. And so there was no law in the jungle, only foolish talk and senseless words. Then Tha called us all together and said, The first of your masters has brought death into the jungle, and the second shame. Now it is time that there was a law, and a law that ye must not break. Now ye shall know fear, and when ye have found him ye shall know that he is your master, and the rest shall follow. Then we of the jungle said, What is fear? And Tha said, Seek till ye find. So we went up and down the jungle, seeking for fear, and presently the buffaloes, Ugh, said Misa, the leader of the buffaloes, from their sand bank. Yes, Misa, it was the buffaloes. They came back with the news that in a cave in the jungle sat fear, and that he had no hair, and went upon his hind legs. Then we of the jungle followed the herd till we came to that cave, and fear stood at the mouth of it. And he was, as the buffaloes had said, hairless, and he walked upon his hinder legs. When he saw us he cried out, and his voice filled us with the fear that we have now of that voice when we hear it. And we ran away, tramping upon and tearing each other, because we were afraid. That night, so it was told to me, we of the jungle did not lie down together as used to be our custom, but each tribe drew off by itself. The pig with the pig, the deer with the deer, horn to horn, hoof to hoof, like keeping to like, and so lay shaking in the jungle. Only the first of the tigers was not with us, for he was still hidden in the marshes of the north, and when word was brought to him of the thing we had seen in the cave, he said, I will go to this thing and break his neck. So he ran all the night till he came to the cave, but the trees and the creepers on his path, remembering the order that Tha had given, let down their branches and marked him as he ran, drawing their fingers across his back, his flank, his forehead, and his jowl. Wherever they touched him, there was a mark and a stripe upon his yellow hide. And those stripes do his children wear to this day. When he came to the cave, Fear, the hairless one, put out his hand and called him the striped one that comes by night. And the first of the tigers was afraid of the hairless one, and ran back to the swamps, howling. Mowgli chuckled quietly here, his chin in the water. So loud did he howl that Tha heard him and said, What is the sorrow? 
and the first of the tigers, lifting up his muzzle to the new-made sky, which is now so old, said, Give me back my power, O Tha. I am made ashamed before all the jungle, and I have run away from a hairless one, and he has called me a shameful name. And why? said Tha. Because I am smeared with the mud of the marshes, said the first of the tigers. Swim, then, and roll on the wet grass, and if it be mud it will wash away, said Tha. And the first of the tigers swam and rolled and rolled upon the grass, till the jungle ran round and round before his eyes, but not one little bar upon all his hide was changed, and Tha, watching him, laughed. Then the first of the tigers said, What have I done that this comes to me? Tha said, Thou hast killed the buck, and thou hast let death loose in the jungle, and with death hast come fear, so that the people of the jungle are afraid of one another, as thou art afraid of the hairless one. The first of the tigers said, They will never fear me, for I knew them since the beginning. Tha said, Go and see. And the first of the tigers ran to and fro, calling aloud to the deer and the pig and the samhur and the porcupine and all the jungle peoples. And they all ran away from him, who had been their judge, because they were afraid. Then the first of the tigers came back, and his pride was broken in him, and beating his head upon the ground, he tore up the earth with all his feet and said, Remember that I was once the master of the jungle. Do not forget me, O Tha. Let my children remember that I was once without shame or fear. And Tha said, This much I will do, because thou and I together saw the jungle made. For one night in each year it shall be as it was before the buck was killed, for thee and for thy children. In that one night, if ye meet the hairless one, and his name is man, ye shall not be afraid of him, but he shall be afraid of you, as though ye were judges of the jungle and masters of all things. Show him mercy in that night of his fear, for thou hast known what fear is. Then the first of the tigers answered, I am content. But when next he drank, he saw the black stripes upon his flank and his side, and he remembered the name that the hairless one had given him, and he was angry. For a year he lived in the marshes, waiting till Tha should keep his promise. And upon a night when the jackal of the moon, the evening star, stood clear of the jungle, he felt that his night was upon him and he went to that cave to meet the hairless one. Then it happened as Tha promised, for the hairless one fell down before him and lay along the ground, and the first of the tigers struck him and broke his back, for he thought that there was but one such thing in the jungle, and that he had killed fear. Then, nosing above the kill, he heard Tha coming down from the woods of the north, and presently the voice of the first of the elephants, which is the voice that we hear now. The thunder was rolling up and down the dry, scarred hills, but it brought no rain, only heat lightning that flickered along the ridges. And Hathi went on. That was the voice he heard, and it said, Is this thy mercy? The first of the tigers licked his lips and said, what matter? I have killed fear. And Tha said, O oh, blind and foolish, thou hast untied the feet of death, and he will follow thy trail till thou diest. Thou hast taught man to kill. The first of the tigers, standing stiffly to his kill, said, He is as the buck was. There is no fear. Now I will judge the jungle peoples once more. And Tha said, Never again shall the jungle peoples come to thee. 
they shall never cross thy trail nor sleep near thee nor follow after thee nor browse by thy lair only fear shall follow thee and with a blow that thou canst not see he shall bid thee wait his pleasure he shall make the ground to open under thy feet and the creeper to twist about thy neck and the tree trunks to grow together about thee higher than thou canst leap and at the last he shall take thy hide to wrap his cubs when they are cold thou hast shown him no mercy and none will he show thee the first of the tigers was very bold for his knight was still with him and he said the promise of tha is the promise of tha he will not take away my knight and tha said the one knight is thine as i have said but there is a price to pay thou hast taught man to kill and he is no slow learner the first of the tigers said he is here under my foot and his back is broken let the jungle know i have killed fear then tha laughed and said <laughs> thou hast killed one of many but thou thyself shall tell the jungle for thy night is ended so the day came and from the mouth of the cave went out another hairless one and he saw the kill in the path and the first of the tigers above it and he took a pointed stick they throw a thing that cuts now said ikki rustling down the bank for ikki was considered uncommonly good eating by the gons they called him hu igu and he knew something of the wicked little gandhi axe that whirls across a clearing like a dragonfly it was a pointed stick such as they put in the foot of a pit trap said hathi and throwing it he struck the first of the tigers deep in the flank thus it happened as tha said for the first of the tigers ran howling up and down the jungle till he tore out the stick and all the jungle knew that the hairless one could strike from far off and they feared more than before so it came about that the first of the tigers taught the hairless one to kill and ye know what harm that has since done to all our peoples through the noose and the pitfall and the hidden trap and the flying stick and the stinging fly that comes out of white smoke Hathi meant the rifle, and the red flower that drives us into the open. Yet, for one night in the year, the hairless one fears the tiger as Tha promised, and never has the tiger given him cause to be less afraid. Where he finds him, there he kills him, remembering how the first of the tigers was made ashamed. For the rest, Fear walks up and down the jungle by day and by night. Ahi, ahu, said the deer, thinking of what it all meant to them. And only when there is one great fear over all, as there is now, can we of the jungle lay aside our little fears and meet together in one place as we do now. For one night only does man fear the tiger, said Mowgli. For one night only, said Hathi. But I, but we, but all the jungle knows that Shere Khan kills man twice and thrice in a moon. Even so. Then he springs from behind and turns his head aside as he strikes, for he is full of fear. If man looked at him, he would run. But on his one night he goes openly down to the village. He walks between the houses and thrusts his head into the doorway and the men fall on their faces. And there he does his kill. One kill in that night. Oh, said Mowgli to himself, rolling over in the water. Now I see why it was Shere Khan bade me look at him. He got no good of it for he could not hold his eyes steady and and i certainly did not fall down at his feet but then i am not a man being of the free people uh, said bagheera deep in his furry throat does the tiger know his night 
Never till the jackal of the moon stands clear of the evening mist. Sometimes it falls in the dry summer and sometimes in the wet rains. This one night of the tiger. But for the first of the tigers this would never have been, nor would any of us have known fear. The deer grunted sorrowfully, and Bagheera's lips curled in a wicked smile. "'Do men know this tale?' said he. "'None know it except the tigers, and we, the elephants, the children of Tha. "'Now ye by the pools have heard it, and I have spoken.' Hathi dipped his trunk into the water as a sign that he did not wish to talk. "'But, but, but,' said Mowgli, turning to Baloo, "'why did not the first of the tigers continue to eat grass and leaves and trees?' He did but break the buck's neck. He did not eat. What led him to the hot meat? The trees and the creepers marked him, little brother, and made him the striped thing that we see. Never again would he eat their fruit. But from that day he revenged himself upon the deer and the others, the eaters of grass, said Baloo. Then thou knowest the tale, eh? Why have I never heard? "'Because the jungle is full of such tales. "'If I made a beginning, there would never be an end to them. "'Let go my ear, little brother.'" End of How Fear Came By Rudyard Kipling Story number six of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling Letting in the Jungle Veil them, cover them, wall them round, Blossom and creeper and weed. Let us forget the sight and the sound, The smell and the touch of the breed. Fat black ash by the altar stone, Here is the white foot rain. And the does bring forth in the fields unsown, And none shall affright them again. And the blind walls crumble, unknown or thrown, And none shall inhabit again you will remember if you have read the tales in the first jungle book that after mowgli had pinned shere khan's hide to the council rock he told as many as were left of the sioni pack that henceforth he would hunt in the jungle alone and the four children of mother and father wolf said that they would hunt with him but it is not easy to change one's life all in a minute, particularly in the jungle. The first thing Mowgli did, when the disorderly pack had slunk off, was to go to the home cave and sleep for a day and a night. Then he told Mother Wolf and Father Wolf, as much as they could understand, of his adventures among men, and when he made the morning sun flicker up and down the blade of his skinny knife, the same he had skinned Shere Khan with, they said he had learned something. Then Akela and Grey Brother had to explain their share of the great buffalo drive in the ravine, and Baloo toiled up the hill to hear all about it, and Bagheera scratched himself all over with pure delight at the way in which Mowgli had managed his war. It was long after sunrise, but no one dreamed of going to sleep. And from time to time, during the talk, Mother Wolf would throw up her head and sniff a deep snuff of satisfaction as the wind brought her the smell of the tiger skin on the council rock. But for Akela and Grey Brother here, Mowgli said at the end, I could have done nothing. Oh, Mother, Mother, if thou hast seen the black herd bulls pour down the ravine, or hurry through the gates when the man-pack flung stones at me. "'I am glad I did not see that last,' said Mother Wolf stiffly. "'It is not my custom to suffer my cubs to be driven to and fro like jackals. I would have taken a price from the man-pack, but I would have spared the woman who gave thee the milk. Yes, I would have spared her alone.' "'Peace, peace, Raksha,' said Father Wolf lazily. Our frog has come back again, so wise that his own father must lick his feet. And what is a cut, more or less of the head? Leave men alone. 
Baloo and Bagheera both echoed, Leave men alone. Mowgli, his head on Mother Wolf's side, smiled contentedly and said that, for his own part, he never wished to see or hear or smell man again. But what? said Akela, cocking one ear. But what if men do not leave thee alone, little brother? We be five, said Grey Brother, looking round at the company and snapping his jaws on the last word. We also might attend to that hunting, said Bagheera with a little switch-switch of his tail, looking at Baloo. But why think of men now, Akela? For this reason, the lone wolf answered, when that yellow thief's hide was hung up on the rock, I went back along our trail to the village, stepping in my tracks, turning aside and laying down to make a mixed trail in case one should follow us. But when I had fouled the trail so that I myself hardly knew it again, Mang the Bat came hawking between the trees and hung up above me. Said Mang, the village of the man-pack where they cast out the man-cub hums like a hornet's nest. <laughs> it was a big stone that I threw, chuckled Mowgli, who had often amused himself by throwing ripe pawpaws into a hornet's nest and racing off to the nearest pool before the hornets caught him. I asked of Mang what he had seen. He said the red flower blossomed at the gate of the village, and men sat about it carrying guns. Now I know, for I have good cause. Akela looked down at the old dry scars on his flank and sighed. That men do not carry guns for pleasure. Presently, little brother, a man with a gun follows our trail, if indeed he be not already on it. But why should he? Men have cast me out. What more do they need? said Mowgli angrily. Thou art a man, little brother, Akela returned. It is not for us, the free hunters, to tell thee what thy brethren do, or why. He had just time to snatch up his paw, as the skinning knife cut deep into the ground below. Mowgli struck quicker than an average human eye could follow. But Akela was a wolf, and even a dog who is very far removed from the wild wolf, his ancestor, can be waked out of deep sleep by a cartwheel touching his flank, and can spring away unharmed before that wheel comes on. Another time, Mowgli said quietly, returning the knife to its sheath, speak of the man-pack and of Mowgli in two breaths, not one. Phew, that is a sharp tooth, said Akela, snuffling at the blades cut in the earth. But living with the man-pack has spoiled thine eye, little brother. I could have killed a buck while thou wast striking. Bagheera sprang to his feet, thrust up his head as far as he could, sniffed and stiffened through every curve in his body. Grey Brother followed his example quickly, keeping a little to his left to get the wind that was blowing from the right while Akela bounded fifty yards upwind, and, half-crouching, stiffened too. Mowgli looked on enviously. He could smell things as very few human beings could, but he had never reached the hair-trigger-like sensitiveness of a jungle nose, and his three months in the smoky village had set him back sadly. However, he dampened his finger, rubbed it on his nose, and stood erect to catch the upper scent, which, though it is the faintest, is the truest. Man! Akela growled, dropping on his haunches. Buldeo! said Mowgli, sitting down. He follows our trail, and yonder is the sunlight on his gun. Look! It was no more than a splash of sunlight for a fraction of a second on the brass clamps of the old tower musket, but nothing in the jungle winks with just that flash except when the clouds race over the sky. Then a piece of mica or a little pool or even a highly polished leaf will flash like a heliograph, but that day was cloudless and still. 
I knew men would follow, said Akela triumphantly. Not for nothing have I led the pack. The four cubs said nothing, but ran downhill on their bellies, melting into the thorn and underbrush as a mole melts into a lawn. Where go ye, and without word? Mowgli called. Hush! We roll his skull here before midday, Grey Brother answered. Back! Back and wait! Man does not eat man, Mowgli shrieked. Who was a wolf but now? Who drove the knife at me for thinking he might be man? said Akela, as the four wolves turned back sullenly and dropped to heel. Am I to give a reason for all I choose to do? said Mowgli, furiously. That is man. There speaks man, Bagheera muttered under his whiskers. Even so did men talk round the king's cages at Odapur. We of the jungle know that man is wisest of all. If we trusted our ears, we should know that of all things he is most foolish. Raising his voice, he added, The man-cub is right in this. Men hunt in packs. To kill one, unless we know what the others will do, is bad hunting. Come, let us see what this man means toward us. We will not come, Grey Brother growled. Hunt alone, little brother. We know our own minds. That skull would have been ready to bring by now. Mowgli had been looking from one to the other of his friends, his chest heaving and his eyes full of tears. He strode forward to the wolves and, dropping on one knee, said, do I not know my mind? Look at me. They looked uneasily, and when their eyes wandered, he called them back again and again, till their hair stood up all over their bodies, and they trembled in every limb, while Mowgli stared and stared. Now, said he, of us five, which is the leader? Thou art leader, little brother said Grey Brother, and he licked Mowgli's foot. "'Follow, then,' said Mowgli, and the four followed at his heels with their tails between their legs. "'This comes of living with the man-pack,' said Bagheera, slipping down after them. "'There is more in the jungle now than jungle law, Baloo.' The old bear said nothing, but he thought many things. Mowgli cut across noiselessly through the jungle at right angles to Buldeo's path, till, parting the undergrowth, he saw the old man, his musket on his shoulder, running up the trail of overnight at a dog-trot. You will remember that Mowgli had left the village with the heavy weight of Shere Khan's raw hide on his shoulders, while Akela and Grey Brother trotted behind, so that the triple trail was very clearly marked. Presently Buldeo came to where Akela, as you know, had gone back and mixed it all up. Then he sat down and coughed and grunted, and made little casts round and about into the jungle to pick it up again, and all the time he could have thrown a stone over those who were watching him. No one can be so silent as a wolf when he does not care to be heard, and Mowgli though the wolves thought he moved very clumsily, could come and go like a shadow. They ringed the old man as a school of porpoises ring a steamer at full speed, and as they ringed him they talked unconcernedly, for their speech began below the lowest end of the scale that untrained human beings can hear. The other end is bounded by the high squeak of Mang the Bat, which very many people cannot catch at all. From that note all the bird and bat and insect talk takes on. "'This is better than any kill,' said Grey Brother, as Buldeo stooped and peered and puffed. "'He looks like a lost pig in the jungles by the river. What does he say?' Buldeo was muttering savagely. Mowgli translated, "'He says that packs of wolves must have danced round me. He says that he never saw such a trail in his life. He says he is tired. 
He will be rested before he picks it up again, said Bagheera coolly, as he slipped round a tree trunk in the game of blind man's buff that they were playing. Now what does the lean thing do? Eat or blow smoke out of his mouth. Men always play with their mouths, said Mowgli, and the silent trailers saw the old man fill and light and puff at a water pipe, and they took good note of the smell of the tobacco, so as to be sure of Buldeo in the darkest night, if necessary. Then a little knot of charcoal burners came down the path and naturally halted to speak to Buldeo, whose fame as a hunter reached for at least twenty miles round. They all sat down and smoked, and Bagheera and the others came up and watched, while Buldeo began to tell the story of Mowgli the Devil Child from one end to another, with additions and inventions. How he himself had really killed Shere Khan, and how Mowgli had turned himself into a wolf and fought with him all the afternoon, and changed into a boy again and bewitched Buldeo's rifle, so that the bullet turned the corner when he pointed it at Mowgli and killed one of Buldeo's own buffaloes, and how the village, knowing him to be the bravest hunter in Sioni, had sent him out to kill this devil child. But meanwhile the village had got hold of Messua and her husband, who were undoubtedly the father and mother of this devil child, and had barricaded them in their own hut, and presently would torture them to make them confess they were witch and wizard, and then they would be burned to death. When, said the charcoal burners, because they would very much like to be present at the ceremony. Buldeo said that nothing would be done till he returned, because the village wished him to kill the jungle boy first. After that they would dispose of Messua and her husband, and divide their lands and buffaloes among the village. Messua's husband had some remarkably fine buffaloes, too. It was an excellent thing to destroy a wizard, Buldeo thought, and people who entertained wolf children out of the jungle were clearly the worst kind of witches. But, said the charcoal burners, what would happen if the English heard of it? The English, they had heard, were a perfectly mad people, who would not let honest farmers kill witches in peace. Why, said Buldeo, the head man of the village would report that Messua and her husband had died of snake-bite. That was all arranged, and the only thing now was to kill the wolf-child. They did not happen to have seen anything of such a creature. The charcoal burners looked round cautiously, and thanked their stars they had not. But they had no doubt that so brave a man as Buldeo would find him if anyone could. The sun was getting rather low, and they had an idea that they would push on to Buldeo's village and see that wicked witch. Buldeo said that, though it was his duty to kill the devil-child, he could not think of letting a party of unarmed men go through the jungle, which might produce the wolf-demon at any minute, without his escort. He, therefore, would accompany them, and if the sorcerer's child appeared— well, he would show them how the best hunter in Sioni dealt with such things. The Brahmin, he said, had given him a charm against the creature that made everything perfectly safe. What says he? What says he? What says he? The wolves repeated every few minutes. And Mowgli translated until he came to the witch part of the story, which was a little beyond him. And then he said that the man and woman who had been so kind to him were trapped. "'Does man trap man?' said Bagheera. "'So he says. I cannot understand the talk. They are all mad together. What have Messua and her man to do with me that they should be put in a trap? And what is all this talk about the red flower? I must look to this.' Whatever they would do to Basua, they will not do till Buldeo returns. And so... Mowgli thought hard, with his fingers playing round the haft of the skinny knife, while Buldeo and the charcoal burners went off very valiantly in single file. I am going hot foot back to the man-pack, Mowgli said at last. And those? 
said Grey Brother, looking hungrily after the brown backs of the charcoal burners. Sing them home, said Mowgli with a grin. I do not wish them to be at the village gates till it is dark. Can ye hold them? Grey Brother bared his teeth in contempt. We can head them round and round in circles like tethered goats, if I know man. That I do not need. Sing to them a little, lest they be lonely on the road. And, Grey Brother, the song need not be of the sweetest. Go with them, Bagheera, and help make that song. When the night is shut down, meet me by the village. Grey Brother knows the place. It is no light hunting to work for a man-cub. When shall I sleep? said Bagheera, yawning, though his eyes showed that he was delighted with the amusement. Me, to sing to naked men. But let us try. He lowered his head so that the sound would travel and cried a long, long good hunting, a midnight call in the afternoon which was quite awful enough to begin with. Mowgli heard it rumble and rise and fall and die off in a creepy sort of whine behind him and laughed to himself as he ran through the jungle. He could see the charcoal burners huddled in a knot, old Buldeo's gun barrel waving like a banana leaf to every point of the compass at once. Then Grey Brother gave the Yalahai, Yalaha call for the buck driving when the pack drives the Nilgahai, the big blue cow, before them, and it seemed to come from the very ends of the earth, nearer and nearer and nearer, till it ended in a shriek snapped off short. The other three answered, till even Mowgli could have vowed that the full pack was in full cry, and then they all broke into the magnificent morning song of the jungle, with every turn and flourish and grace note that a deep-mouthed wolf of the pack knows. This is a rough rendering of the song, but you must imagine what it sounds like when it breaks the afternoon hush of the jungle. One moment past, our bodies cast no shadow on the plain. Now clear and black they stride our track, and we run home again. In morning hush, each rock and bush stands hard and high and raw, then give the call, good rest to all that keep the jungle law. Now horn and pelt our peoples melt in covert to abide. Now crouched and still to cave and hill our jungle barons glide. Now stark and plain man's oxen strain that draw the new yoked plough. Now striped and dread the dawn is red above the lit Talao. Ho, get to lair, the sun's aflare, behind the breathing grass, and creaking through the young bamboo the warning whispers pass. By day made strange, the woods we range, with blinking eyes we scan, while down the skies the wild duck cries, The day, the day to man. The dew is dried that drenched our hide, awashed about our way, and where we drank the puddled bank is crisping into clay. The traitor dark gives up each mark of stretched and hooded claw. Then hear the call, good rest to all that keep the jungle law. But no translation can give the effect of it, or the yelping scorn the four threw into every word of it, as they heard the trees crash when the men hastily climbed up into the branches, and Buldeo began repeating incantations and charms. Then they lay down and slept, for, like all who live by their own exertions, they were of a methodical cast of mind, and no one can work well without sleep. Meanwhile Mowgli was putting the miles behind him, nine to the hour, swinging on, delighted to find himself so fit after all his cramped months among men. The one idea in his head was to get Messua and her husband out of the trap, whatever it was, for he had a natural mistrust of traps. Later on he promised himself he would pay his debts to the village at large. 
It was twilight when he saw the well-remembered grazing grounds and the hawk tree where Grey Brother had waited for him on the morning that he killed Shere Khan. Angry as he was at the whole breed and community of man, something jumped up in his throat and made him catch his breath when he looked at the village roofs. He noticed that every one had come in from the fields unusually early, and that instead of getting to their evening cooking, they gathered in a crowd under the village tree and chattered and shouted. Men must always be making traps for men, or they are not content, said Mowgli. Last night it was Mowgli, but that night seems many rains ago. Tonight it is Messua and her man. Tomorrow, and for many nights after, it will be Mowgli's turn again. He crept along outside the wall till he came to Messua's hut and looked through the window into the room. There lay Messua, gagged and bound hand and foot, breathing hard and groaning. Her husband was tied to the gaily painted bedstead. The door of the hut that opened into the street was shut fast, and three or four people were sitting with their backs to it. Mowgli knew the manners and customs of the village very fairly. He argued that so long as they could eat and talk and smoke, they would not do anything else. But as soon as they had fed, they would begin to be dangerous. Buldeo would be coming in before long, and if his escort had done its duty, Buldeo would have a very interesting tale to tell. So he went in through the window, and, stooping over the man and the woman, cut their thongs, pulling out the gags, and looked round the hut for some milk. Messua was half wild with pain and fear. She had been beaten and stoned all the morning, and Mowgli put his hand over her mouth just in time to stop a scream. Her husband was only bewildered and angry, and sat picking dust and things out of his torn beard. I knew, I knew he would come, Messua sobbed at last. Now do I know that he is my son? And she hugged Mowgli to her heart. Up to that time Mowgli had been perfectly steady, but now he began to tremble all over, and that surprised him immensely. Why are these thongs? Why have they tied thee? he asked after a pause. "'To be put to the death for making a son of thee? What else?' said the man sullenly. "'Look, I bleed.' Messua said nothing, but it was at her wounds that Mowgli looked, and they heard him grit his teeth when he saw the blood. "'Whose work is this?' said he. "'There is a price to pay.' "'The work of all the village. I was too rich. I had too many cattle.' Therefore she and I are witches, because we gave thee shelter. I do not understand. Let Messua tell the tale. I gave thee milk, Nathu, dost thou remember? Messua said timidly, because thou wast my son, whom the tiger took, and because I loved thee very dearly. They said that I was thy mother, the mother of a devil, and therefore worthy of death. And... "'What is a devil?' said Mowgli. "'Death I have seen.' The man looked up gloomily, but Messua laughed. <laughs> "'See,' she said to her husband, "'I knew I said that he was no sorcerer. "'He is my son, my son!' "'Son or sorcerer, what good will that do us?' the man answered. "'We be as dead already.' "'Yonder is the road to the jungle,' Mowgli pointed through the window. Your hands and feet are free. Go now. We do not know the jungle, my son, as as thou knowest, Messua began. I do not think that I could walk far. And the men and women would be upon our backs and drag us here again, said the husband. Hmm, said Mowgli, and he tickled the palm of his hand with the tip of his skinny knife. I have no wish to do harm to any one of this village, yet. But I do not think they will stay thee. In a little while they will have much else to think upon. Ah, 
he lifted his head and listened to shouting and tramping outside. So they have let Buldeo come home at last. He was sent out this morning to kill thee, Basua cried. Didst thou meet him? Yes, we, I met him. He has a tale to tell, and while he is telling it, there is time to do much. But first I will learn what they mean. Think where ye could go and tell me when I come back. He bounded through the window and ran along again outside the wall of the village till he came within earshot of the crowd round the peepul tree. Buldeo was lying on the ground, coughing and groaning, and every one was asking him questions. His hair had fallen about his shoulders, his hands and legs were skinned from climbing up trees, and he could hardly speak, but he felt the importance of his position keenly. From time to time he said something about devils and singing devils and magic enchantment, just to give the crowd a taste of what was coming. Then he called for water. Bah! said Mowgli. Chatter, chatter, talk, talk. Men are blood brothers of the Bondar log. Now he must wash his mouth with water. Now he must blow smoke. And when all that is done, he has still his story to tell. They are very wise people, men. They leave no one to guard Masua till their ears are stuffed with Buldeo's tails. And I grow as lazy as they. He shook himself and glided back to the hut. Just as he was at the window, he felt a touch on his foot. Mother, said he, for he knew that tongue well, what dost thou hear? I heard my children singing through the woods, and I followed the one I loved best. Little frog, I have a desire to see that woman who gave thee milk, said Mother Wolf, all wet with the dew. They have bound and mean to kill her. I have cut those ties, and she goes with her man through the jungle. I also will follow. I am old, but not yet toothless. Mother Wolf reared herself up on end and looked through the window into the dark of the hut. In a minute she dropped noiselessly, and all she said was, I gave thee thy first milk. But Bagheera speaks the truth. Man goes to man at the last. Maybe, said Mowgli with a very unpleasant look on his face. But tonight I am very far from that trail. Wait here, but do not let her see. Thou wast never afraid of me, little frog, said Mother Wolf, backing into the high grass and blotting herself out as she knew how. And now, said Mowgli cheerfully as he swung into the hut again, they are all sitting around Buldeo, who is saying that which did not happen. When his talk is finished, they say they will assuredly come here with the red, with fire, and burn you both. And then? I have spoken to my man, said Messua. Kanhiwara is thirty miles from here, but at Kanhiwara we may find the English. And what pack are they? said Mowgli. I do not know. They be white, and it is said that they govern all the land, and do not suffer people to burn or beat each other without witnesses. If we can get thither tonight, we live. Otherwise, we die. Live, then. No man passes the gates tonight. But what does he do? Masua's husband was on his hands and knees, digging up the earth in one corner of the hut. It is his little money, said Masua. We can take nothing else. Ah, yes. The stuff that passes from hand to hand and never grows warmer. Do they need it outside this place also? said Mowgli. The man stared angrily. He is a fool and no devil, he muttered. With the money I can buy a horse. We are too bruised to walk far, and the village will follow us in an hour. I say they will not follow till I choose. But the horse is well thought of, for Masua is tired. Her husband stood up and knotted the last of the rupees into his waistcloth. Mowgli helped Masua through the window, and the cool night air revived her. But the jungle in the starlight looked very dark and terrible. 
Ye know the trail to Kanhiwara? Mowgli whispered. They nodded. Good. Remember now not to be afraid. And there is no need to go quickly. Only, only there may be some small singing in the jungle behind you and before. Think you we would have risked a night in the jungle through anything less than fear of burning? It is better to be killed by beasts than by men, said Masua's husband. But Masua looked at Mowgli and smiled. I say, Mowgli went on, just as though he were Baloo repeating an old jungle law for the hundredth time to a foolish cub. I say that not a tooth in the jungle is bared against you, not a foot in the jungle is lifted against you, neither man nor beast shall stay you till ye come within eyeshot of Kanhiwara. There will be a watch about you. He turned quickly to Masua, saying, He does not believe, but thou wilt believe? Ay, surely, my son, man, ghost, or wolf of the jungle, I believe. He will be afraid when he hears my people singing. Thou wilt know and understand. Go now, and slowly, for there is no need of any haste. The gates are shut. Masua flung herself sobbing at Mowgli's feet, but he lifted her very quickly with a shiver. Then she hung about his neck and called him every name of blessing she could think of, but her husband looked enviously across his fields and said, If we reach Kanhiwara, and I get the ear of the English, I will bring such a lawsuit against the Brahmin and old Buldeo, and the others as shall eat the village to the bone. They shall pay me twice over for my crops untilled and my buffaloes unfed. I will have a great justice. Mowgli laughed. <laughs> I do not know what justice is, but come next rains and see what is left. They went off toward the jungle, and Mother Wolf leaped from her place of hiding. Follow, said Mowgli and look to it that all the jungle knows these two are safe. Give tongue a little. I would call Bagheera. The long, low howl rose and fell, and Mowgli saw Masua's husband flinch and turn, half-minded to run back to the hut. Go on, Mowgli called cheerfully. I said there might be singing. The call will follow up to Kanhiwara. It is favor of the jungle. Masua urged her husband forward, and the darkness of the jungle shut down on them and Mother Wolf as Bagheera rose up almost under Mowgli's feet, trembling with the light of the night that drives the jungle people wild. "'I am ashamed of thy brethren,' he said, purring. "'What? Did they not sing sweetly to Buldeo?' said Mowgli. "'Too well, too well!' They made even me forget my pride, and by the broken lock that freed me, I went singing through the jungle as though I were out wooing in the spring. Didst thou not hear us? I had other game afoot. Ask Buldeo if he liked the song. But where are the four? I do not wish one of the man-pack to leave the gates to-night. What need of the four, then? said Bagheera, shifting from foot to foot, his eyes ablaze and purring louder than ever. I can hold them, little brother. Is it killing at last? The singing and the sight of the men climbing up the trees have made me very ready. What is man that we should care for him? The naked brown digger, the hairless and toothless, the eater of earth— I have followed him all day, at noon in the white sunlight. I herded him as the wolves herd buck. I am Bagheera, Bagheera, Bagheera. As I dance with my shadow, so danced I with those men. Look! The great panther leaped as a kitten leaps at a dead leaf whirling overhead, struck left and right into the empty air that sung under the strokes, landed noiselessly and leaped again and again, while the half-purr, 
half-growl gathered head as steam rumbles in a boiler. I am Bagheera, in the jungle, in the night, and all my strength is in me. Who shall stay my stroke? Man-cub, with one blow of my paw I could beat thy head flat as a dead frog in the summer. Strike, then, said Mowgli, in the dialect of the village, not the talk of the jungle. And the human words brought Bagheera to a full stop, flung back on haunches that quivered under him, his head just at the level of Mowgli's. Once more Mowgli stared, as he had stared at the rebellious cubs, full into the barrel green eyes, till the red glare behind their green went out like the light of a lighthouse, shut off twenty miles across the sea, till the eyes dropped, and the big head with them dropped lower and lower, and the red rasp of a tongue grated on Mowgli's instep. "'Brother, brother, brother!' the boy whispered, stroking steadily and lightly from the neck along the heaving back. "'Be still, be still! It is the fault of the night and no fault of thine.' "'It was the smells of the night,' said Bagheera penitently. "'This air cries aloud to me. But how dost thou know?' "'Of course the air round an Indian village is full of all kinds of smells. And to any creature who does nearly all his thinking through his nose, smells are as maddening as music and drugs are to human beings. Mowgli gentled the panther for a few minutes longer, and he lay down like a cat before a fire his paws tucked under his breast, and his eyes half shut. "'Thou art of the jungle and not of the jungle,' he said at last. "'And I am only a black panther. But I love thee, little brother.' "'They are very long at their talk under the tree,' Mowgli said, without noticing the last sentence. "'Buldeo must have told many tales. They should come soon to drag the woman and her man out of the trap, and put them into the red flower. They will find that trap sprung. Ho, ho! Nay, listen, said Bagheera. The fever is out of my blood now. Let them find me there. Few would leave their houses after meeting me. It is not the first time I have been in a cage and I do not think they will tie me with cords. <laughs> Be wise, then, said Mowgli, laughing, for he was beginning to feel as reckless as the panther who had glided into the hut. Pah! Bagheera grunted. This place is rank with man, but here is just such a bed as they gave me to lie upon in the king's cages at Odipur. Now I lie down. Mowgli heard the strings of the cot crack under the great brute's weight. By the broken lock that freed me, they will think they have caught big game. Come and sit beside me, little brother. We will give them good hunting together. No, I have another thought in my stomach. The man-pack shall not know what share I have in the sport. Make thine own hunt. I do not wish to see them. "'Be it so,' said Bagheera. "'Ah, now they come.' The conference under the peepole tree had been growing noisier and noisier at the far end of the village. It broke in wild yells, and a rush up the street of men and women waving clubs and bamboos and sickles and knives. Buldeo and the Brahmin were at the head of it, but the mob was close at their heels, and they cried, The witch and the wizard! Let us see if hot coins will make them confess. Burn the hut over their heads. We will teach them to shelter wolf devils. Nay, beat them first. Torches, more torches. Boldeo, heat the gun barrels. Here was some little difficulty with the catch of the door. It had been very firmly fastened, but the crowd tore it away bodily, and the light of the torches streamed into the room, where, stretched at full length on the bed, his paws crossed and lightly hung down over one end, 
black as the pit and terrible as a demon, was Bagheera. There was one half minute of desperate silence as the front ranks of the crowd clawed and tore their way back from the threshold, and in that minute Bagheera raised his head and yawned elaborately, carefully, and ostentatiously, as he would yawn when he wished to insult an equal. The fringed lips drew back and up, the red tongue curled, the lower jaw dropped and dropped till you could see halfway down the hot gullet, and the gigantic dog teeth stood clear to the pit of the gums till they rang together, upper and under, with the snick of steel-faced wards shooting home round the edges of a safe. Next instant, the street was empty. Bagheera had leaped back through the window and stood at Mowgli's side, while a yelling, screaming torrent scrambled and tumbled one over another in their panic haste to get to their own huts. "'They will not stir till day comes,' said Bagheera quietly. "'And now?' The silence of the afternoon sleep seemed to have overtaken the village. But, as they listened, they could hear the sound of heavy grain boxes being dragged over earthen floors and set down against doors. Bagheera was quite right. The village would not stir till daylight. Mowgli sat still and thought, and his face grew darker and darker. "'What have I done?' said Bagheera at last, coming to his feet, fawning. "'Nothing but great good.' Watch them now till the day. I sleep. Mowgli ran off into the jungle and dropped like a dead man across a rock, and slept and slept the day round and the night back again. When he waked, Bagheera was at his side, and there was a newly killed buck at his feet. Bagheera watched curiously while Mowgli went to work with his skinny knife, ate and drank, and turned over with his chin in his hands. The man and the woman are come safe within eyeshot of Kanhiwara, Bagheera said. Thy lair mother sent the word back by Chil the kite. They found a horse before midnight of the night they were freed, and went very quickly. Is not that well? That is well, said Mowgli. And thy man-pack in the village did not stir till the sun was high this morning. Then they ate their food and ran back quickly to their houses. Did they by chance see thee? It may have been. I was rolling in the dust before the gate at dawn, and I may have made some small song to myself. Now, little brother, there is nothing more to do. Come hunting with me and Baloo. He has new hives that he wishes to show, and we all desire thee back again as of old. Take off that look which makes even me afraid. The man and woman will not be put into the red flower, and all goes well in the jungle. Is it not true? Let us forget the man-pack. They shall be forgotten in a little while. Where does Hathi feed to-night? Where he chooses. Who can answer for the silent one? But why? What is there Hathi can do which we cannot? Bid him and his three sons come here to me. But indeed and truly, little brother, it is not, it is not seemly to say come and go to Hathi. Remember, he is the master of the jungle, and before the man-pack changed the look on thy face, he taught thee the master words of the jungle. That is all one. I have a master word for him now. Bid him come to Mowgli the frog, and if he does not hear it first, bid him come because of the sack of the fields of Bahurtpur. The sack of the fields of Bahurtpur, Bagheera repeated two or three times to make sure. I go. Hathi can but be angry at the worst, and I would give a moon's hunting to hear a master word that compels the silent one. He went away, leaving Mowgli stabbing furiously with his skinny knife into the earth. 
Mowgli had never seen human blood in his life before till he had seen, and, what meant much more to him, smelled Masua's blood on the thongs that bound her. And Masua had been kind to him, and, so far as he knew anything about love, he loved Masua as completely as he hated the rest of mankind. But, deeply as he loathed them, their talk, their cruelty, and their cowardice, not for anything the jungle had to offer could he bring himself to take a human life and have that terrible scent of blood back again in his nostrils. His plan was simpler, but much more thorough, and he laughed to himself when he thought that it was one of old Buldeo's tales told under the peepul tree in the evening that had put the idea into his head. It was a master word, Bagheera whispered in his ear. They were feeding by the river, and they obeyed as though they were bullocks. Look where they come now. Hathi and his three sons had arrived in their usual way without a sound. The mud of the river was still fresh on their flanks, and Hathi was thoughtfully chewing the green stem of a young plantain tree that he had gouged up with his tusks. But every line in his vast body showed to Bagheera, who could see things when he came across them, that it was not the master of the jungle speaking to a man-cub, but one who was afraid, coming before one who was not. His three sons rolled side by side behind their father. Mowgli hardly lifted his head as Hathi gave him good hunting. He kept him swinging and rocking and shifting from one foot to another for a long time before he spoke, and when he opened his mouth it was to Bagheera, not to the elephants. I will tell a tale that was told to me by the hunter ye hunted today, said Mowgli. It concerns an elephant, old and wise, who fell into a trap and the sharpened stake in the pit scarred him from a little above his heel to the crest of his shoulder, leaving a white mark. Mowgli threw out his hand, and as Hathi wheeled, the moonlight showed a long white scar on his slaty side, as though he had been struck with a red-hot whip. Men came to take him from the trap, Mowgli continued, but he broke his ropes, for he was strong, and went away till his wound was healed. Then came he, angry by night, to the fields of those hunters. And I remember now that he had three sons. These things happened many, many rains ago, and very far away, among the fields of Bahurtpur. What came to those fields at the next reaping, Hathi? They were reaped by me and by my three sons, said Hathi. And to the ploughing that follows the reaping, said Mowgli. There was no ploughing, said Hathi. And to the men that live by the green crops on the ground, said Mowgli. They went away. And to the huts in which the men slept, said Mowgli. We tore the roofs to pieces and the jungle swallowed up the walls, said Hathi. And what more, said Mowgli. As much good ground as I can walk over in two nights from the east to the west and from the north to the south, as much as I can walk over in three nights, the jungle took. We let in the jungle upon five villages, and in those villages and in their lands, the grazing ground and the soft crop grounds, there is not one man today who takes his food from the ground. That was the sack of the fields of Bahurtpur, which I and my three sons did. And now I ask, man-cub, how the news of it came to thee, said Hathi. A man told me, and now I see even Buldeo can speak truth. It was well done, Hathi, with the white mark. But the second time it shall be done better, for the reason that there is a man to direct. Thou knowest the village of the man-pack that cast me out? They are idle, senseless, and cruel. They play with their mouths, and they do not kill the weaker for food but for sport. When they are full-fed, 
they would throw their own breed into the red flower. This I have seen. It is not well that they should live here any more. I hate them. Kill, then, said the youngest of Hathi's three sons, picking up a tuft of grass, dusting it against his forelegs and throwing it away, while his little red eyes glance furtively from side to side. "'What good are white bones to me?' Mowgli answered angrily. "'Am I the cub of a wolf to play in the sun with a raw head? "'I have killed Sher Khan, and his hide rots on the council rock. "'But but I do not know whither Sher Khan is gone, and my stomach is still empty. "'Now I will take that which I can see and touch.' Let in the jungle upon that village, Hathi. Bagheera shivered and cowered down. He could understand, if the worst came to the worst, a quick rush down the village street, and a right and left blow into a crowd, or a crafty killing of men as they ploughed in the twilight. But this scheme for deliberately blotting out an entire village from the eyes of man and beast frightened him. Now he saw why Mowgli had called for Hathi. No one but the long-lived elephant could plan and carry through such a war. Let them run as the men ran from the fields of Bahurtpur, till we have the rain-water for the only plough, and the noise of the rain on the thick leaves for the pattering of their spindles, till Bagheera and I lair in the house of the Brahmin and the buck drink at the tank behind the temple. Let in the jungle, Hathi. But I... But we have no quarrel with them, and it needs a red rage of great pain ere we tear down the places where men sleep, said Hathi doubtfully. Are ye the only eaters of grass in the jungle? Drive in your peoples. Let the deer and the pig and the nilgahi look to it. Ye need never show a hand's breadth of hide till the fields are naked. Let in the jungle, Hathi. There will be no killing? My tusks were red at the sack of the fields of Bahurtpur, and I would not wake that smell again. Nor I. I do not wish even their bones to lie on the clean earth. Let them go and find a fresh lair. They cannot stay here. I have seen and smelled the blood of the woman that gave me food, the woman whom they would have killed but for me. Only the smell of the new grass on their doorsteps can take away that smell. It burns in my mouth. Let in the jungle, Hathi. Ah, said Hathi. So did the scar of the stake burn on my hide till we watched the villages die under in the spring growth. Now I see. Thy war shall be our war. We will let in the jungle. Mowgli had hardly time to catch his breath. He was shaking all over with rage and hate before the place where the elephants had stood was empty and Bagheera was looking at him with terror. "'By the broken lock that freed me,' said the Black Panther at last, "'art thou the naked thing I spoke for in the pack when all was young? Master of the jungle, when my strength goes, speak for me, speak for Baloo, speak for us all. We are cubs before thee, snapped twigs underfoot, fawns that have lost their doe.' The idea of Bagheera being a stray fawn upset Mowgli altogether, and he laughed and caught his breath, and sobbed and laughed again, till he had to jump into a pool to make himself stop. Then he swam round and round, ducking in and out of the bars of the moonlight like the frog his namesake. By this time Hathi and his three sons had turned, each to one point of the compass, and were striding silently down the valleys a mile away. They went on and on for two days' march, that is to say a long sixty miles, through the jungle. And every step they took, 
and every wave of their trunks was known and noted and talked over by Mang and Chill and the monkey people and all the birds. Then they began to feed, and fed quietly for a week or so. Hathi and his sons are like Ka the rock python. They never hurry till they have to. At the end of that time, and none knew who had started it, a rumor went through the jungle that there was better food and water to be found in such and such a valley. The pig, who of course will go to the ends of the earth for a full meal, moved first by companies, scuffling over the rocks, and the deer followed with the small wild foxes that live on the dead and dying of the herds. And the heavy-shouldered Nilgahi moved parallel with the deer, and the wild buffaloes of the swamp came after the Nilgahi. The least little thing would have turned the scattered, straggling droves that grazed and sauntered and drank and grazed again. But whenever there was an alarm, someone would rise up and soothe them. At one time it would be Sahi, the porcupine, full of news of good feed just a little further on. At another, Mong would cry cheerily and flap down a glade to show it was all empty. Or Baloo, his mouth full of roots, would shamble alongside a wavering line and half frighten, half romp it clumsily back to the proper road. Very many creatures broke back or ran away or lost interest, but very many were left to go forward. At the end of another ten days or so, the situation was this. The deer and the pig and the Nilgahi were milling around and round in a circle of eight or ten mile radius, while the eaters of flesh skirmished round its edge. And the center of that circle was the village, and round the village the crops were ripening, and in the crops sat men on what they call monchos, platforms like pigeon perches made of sticks at the top of four poles, to scare away birds and other stealers. Then the deer were coaxed no more. The eaters of flesh were close behind them and forced them forward and inward. It was a dark night when Hathi and his three sons slipped down from the jungle and broke off the poles of the manchaks with their trunks. They fell as a snapped stalk of hemlock in bloom falls, and the men that tumbled from them heard the deep gurgling of the elephants in their ears. Then the vanguard of the bewildered armies of the deer broke down and flooded into the village grazing grounds and the ploughed fields, and the sharp-hoofed, rooting wild pigs came with them. And what the deer left, the pigs spoiled. And from time to time an alarm of wolves would shake the herds, and they would rush to and fro desperately, treading down the young barley and cutting flat the banks of the irrigating channels. Before the dawn broke, the pressure on the outside of the circle gave way at one point. The eaters of flesh had fallen back and left an open path to the south, and drove upon drove of buck fled along it. Others, who were bolder, lay up in the thickets to finish their meal next night. But the work was practically done. When the villagers looked in the morning, they saw their crops were lost, and that meant death if they did not get away, for they lived year in and year out as near to starvation as the jungle was near to them. When the buffaloes were sent to graze, the hungry brutes found that the deer had cleared the grazing grounds, and so wandered into the jungle and drifted off with their wild mates, and when twilight fell, the three or four ponies that belonged to the village lay in their stables with their heads beaten in. Only Bagheera could have given those strokes and only Bagheera would have thought of insolently dragging the last carcass to the open street. The villagers had no heart to make fires in the fields that night, so Hathi and his three sons went gleaning among what was left, and where Hathi gleans there was no need to follow. The men decided to live on their stored seed corn until the rains had fallen, and then to take work as servants till they could catch up with the lost year. But as the grain dealer was thinking of his well-filled crates of corn and the prices he would levy at the sale of it, 
Hathi's sharp tusks were picking out the corner of his mud house and smashing open the big wicker chest leaped with cow dung where the precious stuff lay. When that last loss was discovered, it was the Brahmin's turn to speak. He had prayed to his own gods without answer. It might be, he said, that unconsciously the village had offended some one of the gods of the jungle, for beyond doubt the jungle was against them. So they sent for the head man of the nearest tribe of wandering Gons, little wise and very black hunters, living in the deep jungle, whose fathers came of the oldest race in India, the aboriginal owners of the land. They made the Gond welcome with what they had, and he stood on one leg, his bow in his hand, and two or three poisoned arrows stuck through his topknot, looking half afraid and half contemptuously at the anxious villagers and their ruined fields. They wished to know whether his gods, the old gods, were angry with them, and what sacrifices should be offered. The Gond said nothing, but picked up a trail of the Karilla, the vine that bears the bitter wild gourd, and laced it to and fro across the temple door in the face of the staring red Hindu image. Then he pushed with his hand in the open air along the road to Kanhiwara, and went back to his jungle, and watched the jungle people drifting through it. He knew that when the jungle moves, only white men can hope to turn it aside. There was no need to ask his meaning. The wild gourd would grow where they had worshipped their god, and the sooner they saved themselves, the better. But it is hard to tear a village from its moorings. They stayed on as long as any summer food was left to them, and they tried to gather nuts in the jungle, but shadows with glaring eyes watched them and rolled before them even at midday, and when they ran back, afraid to their walls, on the tree trunks they had passed not five minutes before, the bark would be stripped and chiseled with the stroke of some great taloned paw. The more they kept to their village, the bolder grew the wild things that gambled and bellowed on the grazing grounds by the Wengunga. They had no time to patch and plaster the rear walls of the empty byres that backed onto the jungle. The wild pig trampled them down, and the knotty rooted vines hurried after them and threw their elbows over the new one ground, and the coarse grass bristled behind the vines like the lances of a goblin army following a retreat. The unmarried men ran away first, and carried the news far and near that the village was doomed. Who could fight, they said, against the jungle, or the gods of the jungle? when the very village cobra had left his hole in the platform under the peephole tree. So their little commerce with the outside world shrunk as the trodden paths across the open grew fewer and fainter. At last the nightly trumpetings of Hathi and his three sons ceased to trouble them, for they had no more to be robbed of. The crop on the ground and the seed in the ground had been taken. The outlying fields were already losing their shape, and it was time to throw themselves on the charity of the English at Kanhiwara. Native fashion, they delayed their departure from one day to another, till the first rains caught them, and the unmended roofs let in a flood, and the grazing ground stood ankle-deep, and all life came on with a rush after the heat of the summer. Then they waded out, men, women, and children, through the blinding hot rain of the morning, but turned, naturally, for one farewell look at their homes. They heard, as the last burdened family filed through the gate, a crash of falling beams and thatch behind the walls. They saw a shiny, snaky, black trunk lifted for an instant, shattering sodden thatch. It disappeared, and there was another crash, followed by a squeal. Hathi had been plucking off the roofs of the huts as you pluck water lilies, and a rebounding beam had pricked him. He needed only this to unchain his full strength, for of all things in the jungle the wild elephant enraged is the most wantonly destructive. 
He kicked backward at a mud wall that crumbled at the stroke, and, crumbling, melted to yellow mud under the torrent of rain. Then he wheeled and squealed and tore through the narrow streets, leaning against the huts right and left, shivering the crazy doors and crumpling up the eaves, while his three sons raged behind as they raged at the sack of the fields of Bahurtpur. The jungle will swallow the shells, said a quiet voice in the wreckage. It is the outer wall that must lie down, and Mowgli, with the rain sluicing over his bare shoulders and arms, leaped back from a wall that was settling like a tired buffalo. All in good time, panted Hathi. Oh, but my tusks were red at Bahurtpur. To the outer wall, children, with the head together now the four pushed side by side the outer wall bulged split and fell and the villagers dumb with horror saw the savage clay street heads of the wreckers in the ragged gap then they fled houseless and foodless down the valley as their village shredded and tossed and trampled melted behind them a month later, the place was a dimpled mound, covered with soft green young stuff, and by the end of the rains there was the roaring jungle in full blast on the spot that had been on the plough not six months before. End of Letting in the Jungle Story number seven of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling Red Dog Red Dog, Red Dog For our white and our excellent knights, For the knights of swift running, Fair ranging, far seeing, Good hunting, sure cunning, For the smells of the dawning, Untainted, ere dew has departed, For the rush through the mist, And the quarry blind started, For the cry of our mates, When the sambor has wheeled And is standing at bay, for the risk and the riot of night, for the sleep at the lair mouth by day, it is met, and we go to the fight. Bay, oh, bay. It was after the letting in of the jungle that the pleasantest part of Mowgli's life began. He had the good conscience that comes from paying debts. All the jungle was his friend, and just a little afraid of him. The things that he did and saw and heard when he was wandering from one people to another, with or without his four companions, would make many, many stories, each as long as this one. So you will never be told how he met the mad elephant of Mandla, who killed two and twenty bullocks drawing eleven carts of coin silver to the government treasury, and scattered the shiny rupees in the dust. How he fought Jakala, the crocodile, all one long night in the marshes of the north, and broke his skinny knife on the brute's back plates. How he found a new and longer knife round the neck of a man who had been killed by a wild boar, and how he tracked that boar and killed him as fair price for the knife. How he was caught up once in the great famine by the moving of the deer, and nearly crushed to death in the swaying hot herds. How he saved Hathi the Silent from being once more trapped in a pit with a stake at the bottom, and how, next day, he himself fell into a very cunning leopard trap, and how Hathi broke the thick wooden bars to pieces above him. How he milked the wild buffaloes in the swamp, and how— But we must tell one tale at a time. Father and Mother Wolf died, and Mowgli rolled a big boulder against the mouth of their cave— and cried the death song over them. Baloo grew very old and stiff, and even Bagheera, whose nerves were steel and whose muscles were iron, was a shade slower on the kill than he had been. Akela turned from gray to milky white with pure age. His ribs stuck out, and he walked as though he had been made of wood, and Mowgli killed for him. But the young wolves, the children of the disbanded Sioni pack, throve and increased, 
and when there were about forty of them, masterless, full-voiced, clean-footed five-year-olds, Akela told them that they ought to gather themselves together and follow the law, and run under one head as befitted the free people. This was not a question in which Mowgli concerned himself, for, as he said, he had eaten sour fruit and he knew the tree it hung from. But when Fao, son of Fauna, his father was the great tracker in the days of Akela's headship, fought his way to the leadership of the pack according to the jungle law, and the old calls and songs began to ring under the stars once more. Mowgli came to the council rock for memory's sake. When he chose to speak, the pack waited till he had finished, and he sat at Akela's side on the rock above Fao. Those were days of good hunting and good sleeping. No stranger cared to break into the jungles that belonged to Mowgli's people, as they called the pack, and the young wolves grew fat and strong, and there were many cubs to bring to the looking-over. Mowgli always attended a looking-over, remembering the night when a black panther bought a naked brown baby into the pack, and the long call, Look, look well, O wolves, made his heart flutter. Otherwise he would be far away in the jungle with his four brothers, tasting, touching, seeing, and feeling new things. One twilight, when he was trotting leisurely across the ranges to give Akela the half of a buck that he had killed, while the four jogged behind him, sparring a little and tumbling one another over for joy of being alive, he heard a cry that had never been heard since the bad days of Shere Khan. It was what they called in the jungle the feel, a hideous kind of shriek that the jackal gives when he is hunting behind a tiger, or when there is a big killing afoot. If you can imagine a mixture of hate, triumph, fear, and despair, with a kind of leer running through it, you will get some notion of the feel that rose and sank and wavered and quavered far away across the Wangonga. The four stopped at once, bristling and growling. Mowgli's hand went to his knife, and he checked. The blood in his face, his eyebrows knotted. "'There is no striped one dare kill here,' he said. "'That is not the cry of the forerunner,' answered Grey Brother. It is some great killing. Listen. It broke out again, half sobbing and half chuckling, just as though the jackal had soft human lips. Then Mowgli drew deep breath and ran to the council rock, overtaking on his way hurrying wolves of the pack. Fao and Akela were on the rock together, and below them, every nerve strained, sat the others. The mothers and the cubs were cantering off to their lairs, for when the field cries, it is no time for weak things to be abroad. They could hear nothing except the Wangunga rushing and gurgling in the dark, and the light evening winds among the treetops, till suddenly across the river a wolf called. It was no wolf of the pack, for they were all at the rock. The note changed to a long, despairing bay, and Dole, it said. Dole, Dole, Dole. They heard tired feet on the rocks, and a gaunt wolf streaked with red on his flanks, his right forepaw useless and his jaws white with foam, flung himself into the circle and lay gasping at Mowgli's feet. "'Good hunting. Under whose headship?' said Fao gravely. "'Good hunting. One Tola am I,' was the answer. He meant that he was a solitary wolf, fending for himself, his mate, and his cubs in some lonely lair, as do many wolves in the south. "'One Tola means an outlier, one who lies out from any pack.' Then he panted, and they could see his heartbeats shake him backward and forward. 
"'What moves?' said Feo, "'for that is the question all the jungle asks after the field cries. "'The dole, the dole of the Deccan, red dog, the killer. "'They came north from the south, saying the Deccan was empty and killing out by the way. "'When this moon was new there were four to me, my mate and three cubs.' She would teach them to kill on the grass plains, hiding to drive the buck, as we do who are of the open. At midnight I heard them together, full tongue on the trail. At the dawn wind I found them stiff in the grass. Four free people, four when this moon was new. <sighs> then I sought my blood right and found the dole. How many? said Mowgli quickly. The pack growled deep in their throats. I do not know. Three of them will kill no more. But at the last they drove me like the buck. On my three legs they drove me. Look, free people. He thrust out his mangled forefoot, all dark with dried blood. There were cruel bites low down on his side, and his throat was torn and worried. Eat, said Akela, rising up from the meat Mowgli had brought him, and the outlier flung himself on it. This shall be no loss, he said humbly when he had taken off the first edge of his hunger. Give me a little strength, free people, and I also will kill. My lair is empty that was full when this moon was new, and the blood debt is not all paid. Feo, heard his teeth crack on a haunch-bone, and grunted approvingly. "'We shall need those jaws,' said he. "'Were there cubs with the dole?' "'Nay, nay, red hunters all, grown dogs of their pack, heavy and strong for all that they eat lizards in the Deccan. What Juan Tola had said meant that the dole, the red hunting-dog of the Deccan, was moving to kill.' and the pack knew well that even the tiger will surrender a new kill to the dole. They drive straight through the jungle, and what they meet they pull down and tear to pieces. Though they are not as big nor half as cunning as the wolf, they are very strong and very numerous. The dole, for instance, do not begin to call themselves a pack till they are a hundred strong whereas forty wolves make a very fair pack indeed. Mowgli's wanderings had taken him to the edge of the high grassy downs of the Deccan, and he had seen the fearless doles sleeping and playing and scratching themselves in the little hollows and tussocks that they use for lairs. He despised and hated them because they did not smell like the free people, because they did not live in caves, and, above all, because they had hair between their toes, while he and his friends were clean-footed. But he knew, for Hathi had told him, what a terrible thing a dole hunting pack was. Even Hathi moves aside from their line, and until they are killed or till game is scarce, they will go forward. Akela knew something of the doles, too for he said to Mowgli quietly, "'It is better to die in a full pack than leaderless and alone. This is good hunting, and my last. But as men live, thou hast very many more nights and days, little brother. Go north and lie down, and if any live after the dole has gone by, he shall bring thee word of the fight.' "'Ah,' said Mowgli quite gravely, must I go to the marshes and catch little fish and sleep in a tree? Or must I ask help of the bandarlog and crack nuts while the pack fight below? It is to the death, said Akela. Thou hast never met the dole, the red killer. Even the striped one, Awa, Awa, said Mowgli pettingly, I have killed one striped ape, 
and sure am I in my stomach that Shere Khan would have left his own mate for meat to the dole if he had winded a pack across three ranges. Listen now. There was a wolf, my father, and there was a wolf, my mother, and there was an old gray wolf, not too wise, he is white now, was my father and my mother. Therefore I, he raised his voice, I say that when the dole come, and if the dole come, Mowgli and the free people are of one skin for that hunting. And I say, by the bull that bought me, by the bull Bagheera paid for me in the old days, which ye of the pack do not remember, I say that the trees and the river may hear and hold fast if I forget. I say that this my knife shall be as a tooth to the pack, and I do not think it is so blunt. This is my word which has gone from me. "'Thou dost not know the dole, man with a wolf's tongue,' said Juan Tola. "'I look only to clear the blood debt against them, ere they have me in many pieces. "'They move slowly, killing out as they go, but in two days a little strength will come back to me, "'and I will turn again for the blood debt. "'But for ye, free people,' My word is that ye go north and eat but little for a while, till the dole are gone. There is no meat in this hunting. Ha! Hear the outlier, said Mowgli with a laugh. Free people, we must go north and dig lizards and rats from the bank, lest by any chance we meet the dole. He must kill out our hunting grounds, while we lie hid in the north, till it please him to give us our own again. He is a dog, and the pup of a dog, red, yellow-bellied, lairless, and haired between every toe. He counts his cubs six and eight at the litter, as though he were Chikai, the little leaping rat. Surely we must run away, free people, and beg leave of the peoples of the north for the offal of dead cattle. Ye know the saying, North are the vermin, South are the lice. We are the jungle. Choose ye, O oh, choose. It is good hunting, for the pack, for the full pack, for the lair and the litter, for the in-kill and the out-kill, for the mate that drives the doe and the little, little cub within the cave. It is met. It is met. It is met. The pack answered with one deep crashing bark that sounded in the night like a big tree falling. It is met, they cried. Stay with these, said Mowgli to the four. We shall need every tooth. Phao and Akela must make ready the battle. I go to count the dogs. It is death, Juan Tola cried, half rising. What can such a hairless one do against the red dog? Even the striped one, remember. Thou art indeed an outlier, Mowgli called back. But we will speak when the dolies are dead. Good hunting, all. He hurried off into the darkness, wild with excitement, hardly looking where he set foot. And the natural consequence was that he tripped full length over Ka's great coils where the python lay watching a deer path near the river. Ksha! said Ka angrily. Is this jungle work to stamp and tramp and undo a night's hunting when the game are moving so well, too? The fault was mine, said Mowgli, picking himself up. Indeed, I was seeking thee, Flathead. But each time we meet, thou art longer and broader by the length of my arm. There is none like thee in the jungle, wise, old, strong, and most beautiful Ka. Now, whither does this trail lead? Ka's voice was gentler. Not a moon since there was a manling with a knife threw stones at my head and called me bad little tree-cat names because I lay asleep in the open. I and turned every driven deer to all the winds, 
and Mowgli was hunting, and this same flathead was too deaf to hear his whistle and leave the dear roads free. Mowgli answered composedly, sitting down among the painted coils. Now this same manling comes with soft, tickling words to this same flathead, telling him that he is wise and strong and beautiful. And this same old flathead believes and makes a place thus for this same stone-throwing manling, and art thou at ease now? Could Bagheera give thee so good a resting place? Ka had, as usual, made a sort of soft half-hammock of himself under Mowgli's weight. The boy reached out in the darkness and gathered in the supple, cable-like neck till Ka's head rested on his shoulder, and then he told him all that had happened in the jungle that night. "'Wise I may be,' said Ka at the end, "'but deaf I surely am, else I should have heard the feel. "'Small wonder the eaters of grass are uneasy. "'How many be the dole? "'I have not yet seen. "'I came hot-foot to thee. "'Thou art older than Hathi. "'But, O oh, Ka!' Here Mowgli wriggled with sheer joy. It will be good hunting. Few of us will see another moon. Dost thou strike in this? Remember thou art a man, and remember what pack cast thee out. Let the wolf look to the dog. Thou art a man. Last year's nuts are this year's black earth, said Mowgli. It is true that I am a man, but it is in my stomach that this night I have said that I am a wolf. I call the river and the trees to remember. I am of the free people, Ka, till the dole has gone by. Free people, <laughs> Ka grunted. Free thieves, and thou hast tied thyself into the death knot for the sake of the memory of the dead wolves? This is no good hunting. It is my word which I have spoken. The trees know, the river knows. Till the dole have gone by, my word comes not back to me. Shh! This changes all trails. I had thought to take thee away with me to the northern marshes, but the word, even the word of a little naked hairless manling, is the word. Now I, Ka, say... Think well, Flathead, lest thou tie thyself into the death knot also. I need no word from thee, for well I know— Be it so, then, said Ka, I will give no word. But what is in thy stomach to do when the dole come? They must swim the Wangunga. I thought to meet them with my knife in the shallows, the pack behind me, and so, stabbing and thrusting— we a little might turn them downstream or cool their throats. The dole do not turn, and their throats are hot, said Ka. There will be neither manling nor wolf cub when that hunting is done, but only dry bones. Ah, la, la, if we die, we die. It will be most good hunting. But my stomach is young, and I have not seen many rains. I am not wise nor strong. Hast thou a better plan, Ka? I have seen a hundred and a hundred rains. Ere Hathi cast his milk tushes, my trail was big in the dust. By the first egg, I am older than many trees, and I have seen all that the jungle has done. But this is new hunting, said Mowgli. Never before have the dole crossed our trail. What is has been. What will be is no more than a forgotten year striking backward. Be still while I count those my years. For a long hour Mowgli lay back among the coils, while Ka, his head motionless on the ground, thought of all that he had seen and known since the day he came from the egg. The light seemed to go out of his eyes and leave them like stale opals. And now and again he made little stiff passes with his head, right and left, 
as though he were hunting in his sleep. Mowgli dozed quietly, for he knew that there is nothing like sleep before hunting, and he was trained to take it at any hour of the day or night. Then he felt Kaa's back grow bigger and broader below him as the huge python puffed himself out, hissing with the noise of a sword drawn from a steel scabbard. "'I have seen all the dead seasons,' Ka said at last, "'and the great trees, and the old elephants, "'and the rocks that were bare and sharp-pointed ere the moss grew. "'Art thou still alive, manling?' "'It is only a little after moonset,' said Mowgli. "'I do not understand. "'Hush! I am again Ka. "'I knew it was but a little time.' Now we will go to the river, and I will show thee what is to be done against the dole. He turned, straight as an arrow, for the main stream of the Wingunga, plunged in a little above the pool that hid the peace rock, Mowgli at his side. Nay, do not swim. I go swiftly, my back, little brother. Mowgli tucked his left arm round Ka's neck, dropped his right close to his body, and straightened his feet. Then Ka breasted the current as he alone could, and the ripple of the checked water stood up in a frill round Mowgli's neck, and his feet were waved to and fro in the eddy under the python's lashing sides. A mile or two above the peace rock, the Wangunga narrows between a gorge of marble rocks from eighty to a hundred feet high, and the current runs like a mill-race between them and over all manner of ugly stones. But Mowgli did not trouble his head about the water. Little water in the world could have given him a moment's fear. He was looking at the gorge on either side and sniffing uneasily, for there was a sweetish, sour smell in the air, very like the smell of a big ant hill on a hot day. Instinctively he lowered himself in the water, only raising his head to breathe from time to time, and Ka came to anchor with a double twist of his tail round a sunken rock, holding Mowgli in the hollow of a coil while the water raced on. "'This is the place of death,' said the boy. "'Why do we come here?' "'They sleep.' said Ka. Hathi will not turn aside for the Striped One, yet Hathi and the Striped One together turn aside for the Dole, and the Dole, they say, turn aside for nothing. And yet, for whom do the little people of the rocks turn aside? Tell me, Master of the Jungle, who is the Master of the Jungle? These, Mowgli whispered, it is the place of death. Let us go. Nay, look well, for they are asleep. It is as it was when I was not the length of thy arm. The split and weather-worn rocks of the gorge of the Wangunga had been used since the beginning of the jungle by the little people of the rocks, the busy, furious, black, wild bees of India, and, as Mowgli knew well, all trails turned off half a mile before they reached the gorge. For centuries the little people had hived and swarmed from cleft to cleft, and swarmed again, staining the white marble with stale honey, and made their combs tall and deep in the dark of the inner caves, where neither man nor beast nor fire nor water had ever touched them. The length of the gorge on both sides was hung, as it were, with black shimmery velvet curtains, and Mowgli sank as he looked, for those were the clotted millions of the sleeping bees. There were other lumps and festoons and things like decayed tree trunks studded on the face of the rock, the old combs of past years, or new cities built in the shadow of the windless gorge, and huge masses of spongy, rotted trash had rolled down and stuck among the trees and creepers that clung to the rock face. 
As he listened, he heard more than once the rustle and slide of a honey-coated comb turning over or failing away somewhere in the dark galleries, then a booming of angry wings and the sullen drip, drip, drip of the wasted honey, guttering along till it lipped over some ledge in the open air and sluggishly trickled down on the twigs. There was a tiny little beach, not five feet broad on one side of the river, and that was piled high with the rubbish of uncounted years. There were dead bees, drones, sweepings and stale combs, and wings of marauding moths that had strayed in after honey, all tumbled in smooth piles of the finest black dust. The mere sharp smell of it was enough to frighten anything that had no wings and knew what the little people were. Ka moved upstream again till he came to a sandy bar at the head of the gorge. Here is the season's kill, said he. Look. On the bank lay the skeletons of a couple of young deer and a buffalo. Mowgli could see that neither wolf nor jackal had touched the bones, which were laid out naturally. "'They came beyond the line. They did not know the law,' murmured Mowgli. "'And the little people kill them. Let us go ere they wake.' "'They do not wake till the dawn,' said Ka. "'Now I will tell thee. "'A hunted buck from the south many, many rains ago,' came hither from the south, not knowing the jungle, a pack on his trail. Being made blind by fear, he leaped from above, the pack running by sight, for they were hot and blind on the trail. The sun was high, and the little people were many and very angry. Many, too, were those of the pack who leaped into the Wangunga, but they were dead ere they took water. Those who did not leap died also in the rocks above. But the buck lived. How? Because he came first, running for his life, leaping ere the little people were aware, and was in the river when they gathered to kill. The pack following was altogether lost under the weight of the little people. The buck lived? Mowgli repeated slowly. At least he did not die then, though none waited his coming down with a strong body to hold him safe against the water, as a certain old, fat, deaf, yellow flathead would wait for a manling, yea, though there were all the doles of the Deccan on his trail. What is in thy stomach? Ka's head was close to Mowgli's ear, and it was a little time before the boy answered. It is to pull the very whiskers of death, but, Ka, thou art indeed the wisest of all the jungle. So many have said, Look now, if the dole follow thee, Assuredly they will follow. Ho, ho! I have many little thorns under my tongue to prick their hides. If they follow thee hot and blind, looking only at thy shoulders, those who do not die up above will take water either here or lower down, for the little people will rise up and cover them. Now the Wangunga is hungry water, and they will have no ka to hold them, but will go down, such as live, to the shallows by the Sioni lairs, and there thy pack may meet them by the throat. Ahai! Iawawa! Better could not be till the rains fall in the dry season. There is now only the little matter of the run and the leap. I will make me known to the doles, so that they shall follow me very closely. Hast thou seen the rocks above thee, from the landward side? Indeed, no, that I had forgotten. Go look. It is all rotten ground, cut and full of holes. 
one of thy clumsy feet set down without seeing would end the hunt see i leave thee here and for thy sake only i will carry word to the pack that they may know where to look for the dole for myself i am not of one skin with any wolf when ka disliked an acquaintance he could be more unpleasant than any of the jungle people except perhaps bagheera he swam downstream and opposite the rock he came on feo and akela listening to the night noises Hiss, dogs he said cheerfully the doles will come downstream if ye be not afraid ye can kill them in the shallows when come they said feo and where is my man cub said akela they come when they come said ka wait and see as for thy man cub from whom thou hast taken a word and so laid him open to death thy man cub is with me and if he be not already dead the fault is none of thine bleached dog wait here for the dole and be glad that the man cub and i strike on thy side ka flashed upstream again and moored himself in the middle of the gorge looking upward at the line of the cliff presently he saw mowgli's head move against the stars and then there was a whiz in the air the keen clear shloop of a body falling feet first and the next minute the boy was at rest again in the loop of ka's body it is no leap by night said mowgli quietly i have jumped twice as far for sport but that is an evil place above low bushes and gullies that go down very deep all full of the little people i have put big stones one above another by the side of three gullies these i shall throw down with my feet in running and the little people will rise up behind me very angry that is man's talk and man's cunning said ka thou art wise but the little people are always angry nay at twilight all wings near and far rest for a while i will play with the dole at twilight for the dole hunts best by day he follows now one tola's blood trail chil does not leave a dead ox nor the dole the blood trail said ka then i will make him a new blood trail of his own blood if i can and give him dirt to eat thou wilt stay here ka till i come again with my doles ay but what if they kill thee in the jungle or the little people kill thee before thou canst leap down to the river when tomorrow comes we will kill for tomorrow said mowgli quoting a jungle saying and again when i am dead it is time to sing the death song good hunting ka he loosed his arm from the python's neck and went down the gorge like a log in a freshet paddling toward the far bank where he found slack water and laughing aloud from sheer happiness there was nothing mowgli liked better than as he himself said to pull the whiskers of death and make the jungle know that he was their overlord he had often with baloo's help robbed bees nests and single trees and he knew that the little people hated the smell of wild garlic so he gathered a small bundle of it tied it up with a bark string and then followed wantola's blood trail as it ran southerly from the lairs for some five miles looking at the trees with his head on one side and chuckling as he looked <laughs> mowgli the frog have i been said he to himself mowgli the wolf have i said that i am now mowgli the ape must i be before i am mowgli the buck at the end i shall be mowgli the man ho and he slid his thumb along the eighteen-inch blade of his knife 
Juan Tola's trail, all rank with dark blood spots, ran under a forest of thick trees that grew close together and stretched away northeastward, gradually growing thinner and thinner to within two miles of the bee rocks. From the last tree to the low scrub of the bee rocks was open country, where there was hardly cover enough to hide a wolf. Mowgli trotted along under the trees, judging distances between branch and branch, occasionally climbing up a tree and taking a trial leap from one tree to another, till he came to the open ground, which he studied very carefully for an hour. Then he turned picked up Juan Tola's trail where he had left it, settled himself in a tree with an outrunning branch some eight feet from the ground, and sat still, sharpening his knife on the sole of his foot and singing to himself. A little before midday, when the sun was very warm, he heard the patter of feet and smelt the abominable smell of the dole pack as they trotted pitilessly along Juan Tola's trail. Seen from above, the red dole does not look half the size of a wolf, but Mowgli knew how strong his feet and jaws were. He watched the sharp bay head of the leader snuffling along the trail and gave him good hunting. The brute looked up, and his companions halted behind him, scores and scores of red dogs with low-hung tails, heavy shoulders, weak quarters, and bloody mouths. The doles are a very silent people as a rule, and they have no manners even in their own jungle. Fully two hundred must have gathered below him, but he could see that the leaders sniffed hungrily on one Tola's trail and tried to drag the pack forward. That would never do, or they would be at the lairs in broad daylight, and Mowgli meant to hold them under his tree till dusk. "'By whose leave do ye come here?' said Mowgli. "'All jungles are our jungle,' was the reply, and the dole that gave it bared his white teeth. Mowgli looked down with a smile and imitated perfectly the sharp chitter-chatter of Chikai, the leaping rat of the Deccan, meaning the Dole's to understand that he considered them no better than Chikai. The pack closed up round the tree trunk, and the leader bayed savagely, calling Mowgli a tree ape. For an answer, Mowgli stretched down one naked leg and wriggled his bare toes just above the leader's head. That was enough, and more than enough to wake the pack to stupid rage. Those who have hair between their toes do not care to be reminded of it. Mowgli caught his foot away as the leader leaped up and said sweetly, Dog, red dog, go back to the Deccan and eat lizards. Go to Chikai, thy brother. Dog, dog, red, red dog. There is hair between every toe. He twiddled his toes a second time. Come down ere we starve thee out, hairless ape, yelled the pack. And this was exactly what Mowgli wanted. He laid himself down along the branch, his cheek to the bark, his right arm free, and there he told the pack what he thought and knew about them, their manners, their customs, their mates, and their puppies. There is no speech in the world so rancorous and so stinging as the language the jungle people use to show scorn and contempt. When you come to think of it, you will see how this must be so. As Mowgli told Ka, he had many little thorns under his tongue, and slowly and deliberately he drove the doles from silence to growls, from growls to yells, and from yells to hoarse slavery ravings. They tried to answer his taunts, but a cub might as well have tried to answer Ka in a rage. And all the while Mowgli's right hand lay crooked at his side, ready for action, his feet locked round the branch. 
The big bay leader had leaped many times in the air, but Mowgli dared not risk a false blow. At last, made furious beyond his natural strength, he bounded up seven or eight feet clear of the ground. Then Mowgli's hand shot out like the head of a tree snake and gripped him by the scruff of his neck, and the branch shook with the jar as his weight fell back, almost wrenching Mowgli to the ground. But he never loosed his grip, and inch by inch he hauled the beast, hanging like a drowned jackal, up on the branch. With his left hand he reached for his knife and cut off the red bushy tail, flinging the dole back to earth again. That was all he needed. The pack would not go forward on Juan Tola's trail now, till they had killed Mowgli or Mowgli had killed them. He saw them settle down in circles with a quiver of the haunches that meant they were going to stay. And so he climbed to a higher crotch, settled his back comfortably, and went to sleep. After three or four hours he waked and counted the pack. They were all there, silent, husky, and dry, with eyes of steel. The sun was beginning to sink. In half an hour the little people of the rocks would be ending their labors, and, as you know, the dole does not fight best in the twilight. "'I did not need such faithful watchers,' he said politely, standing up on a branch. "'But I will remember this.' Ye be true doles, but to my thinking over much of one kind. For that reason I do not give the big lizard-eater his tail again. Art thou not pleased, Red Dog? I myself will tear out thy stomach, yelled the leader, scratching at the foot of the tree. Nay, but consider, wise rat of the Deccan, there will now be many litters of little tailless red dogs, yea, with raw red stumps that sting when the sand is hot. Go home, red dog, and cry that an ape has done this. Ye will not go? Come then with me, and I will make you very wise. He moved, banderlog fashion, into the next tree, and so on into the next and the next the pack following with lifted hungry heads. Now and then he would pretend to fall, and the pack would tumble one over the other in their haste to be at the death. It was a curious sight, the boy with the knife that shone in the low sunlight as it sifted through the upper branches, and the silent pack with their red coats all aflame, huddling and following below. When he came to the last tree, he took the garlic and rubbed himself all over carefully, and the doles yelled with scorn. "'Ape with wolf's tongue, dost thou think to cover thy scent?' they said. "'We follow to the death.' He had slipped down the tree trunk and headed like the wind in bare feet for the bee rocks before the doles saw what he would do. They gave one deep howl and settled down to the long, lobbing canter that can, at the last, run down anything that runs. Mowgli knew their pack pace to be much slower than that of the wolves, or he would never have risked a two-mile run in full sight. They were sure that the boy was theirs at last and he was sure that he held them to play with as he pleased. All his trouble was to keep them sufficiently hot behind him to prevent their turning off too soon. He ran cleanly, evenly, and springingly, the tailless leader not five yards behind him, and the pack trailing out over perhaps a quarter of a mile of ground, crazy and blind with the rage of slaughter. So he kept his distance by ear, reserving his last effort for the rush across the bee rocks. The little people had gone to sleep in the early twilight, for it was not the season of late blossoming flowers. But as Mowgli's first footfalls rang hollow on the hollow ground, 
he heard a sound as though all the earth were humming. Then he ran as he had never run in his life before, spurred aside one, two, three of the piles of stones into the dark, sweet-smelling gullies, heard a roar like the roar of the sea in a cave, saw with the tail of his eye the air grow dark behind him, saw the current of the Wangunga far below, and a flat diamond-shaped head in the water, leaped outward with all his strength, the tailless Dole snapping at his shoulder in mid-air, and dropped feet first to the safety of the river, breathless and triumphant. There was not a sting upon him, for the smell of the garlic had checked the little people for just the few seconds that he was among them. When he rose, Ka's coils were steadying him and things were bounding over the edge of the cliff. Great lumps, it seems, of clustered bees falling like plummets. But before any lump touched the water, the bees flew upward and the body of a dole whirled downstream. Overhead they could hear the furious short yells that were drowned in a roar like breakers, the roar of the wings of the little people of the rocks. Some of the doles, too, had fallen into the gullies that communicated with the underground caves, and there choked and fought and snapped among the tumbled honeycombs, and at last, borne up even when they were dead, on the heaving waves of bees beneath them, shot out of some hole in the river face to roll over on the black rubbish heaps. There were doles who had leaped short into the trees on the cliffs, and the bees blotted out their shapes, but the greater number of them, maddened by the stings, had flung themselves into the river, and, as Ka said, the Wangunga was hungry water. Ka held Mowgli fast till the boy had recovered his breath. "'We may not stay here,' he said. "'The little people are roused indeed. Come.' Swimming low and diving as often as he could, Mowgli went down the river, knife in hand. "'Slowly, slowly,' said Ka. "'One tooth does not kill a hundred unless it be a cobra's, and many of the doles took water swiftly when they saw the little people rise. "'The more work for my knife, then. Fie! How the little people follow!' Mowgli sank again. The face of the water was blanketed with wild bees buzzing sullenly and stinging all they found. "'Nothing was ever lost by silence,' said Ka. No sting could penetrate his scales. "'And thou hast all the long night for the hunting. Hear them howl!' Nearly half the pack had seen the trap their fellows rushed into, and, turning sharp aside, had flung themselves into the water where the gorge broke down in steep banks. Their cries of rage and their threats against the tree-ape who had brought them to their shame mixed with the yells and growls of those who had been punished by the little people. To remain ashore was death, and every dole knew it. Their pack was swept along the current down to the deep eddies of the peace pool. But even there the angry little people followed and forced them to the water again. Mowgli could hear the voice of the tailless leader bidding his people hold on and kill out every wolf in Sioni. But he did not waste his time in listening. "'One kills in the dark behind us,' snapped Dedole. "'Here is tainted water.' Mowgli had dived forward like an otter, twitched a struggling dole under water before he could open his mouth, and dark rings rose as the body plopped up, turning on its side. The doles tried to turn, but the current prevented them, and the little people darted at the heads and ears, and they could hear the challenge of the Sioni pack growing louder and deeper in the gathering darkness. Again Mowgli dived, and again a dole went under, and rose dead, and again the clamor broke out at the rear of the pack, 
some howling that it was best to go ashore, others calling on their leader to lead them back to the Deccan, and others bidding Mowgli show himself and be killed. "'They come to the fight with two stomachs and several voices,' said Ka. "'The rest is with thy brethren below yonder. The little people go back to sleep. They have chased us far. Now I too turn back, for I am not of one skin with any wolf. Good hunting, little brother, and remember, the dole bites low.' A wolf came running along the bank on three legs, leaping up and down, laying his head sideways close to the ground, hunching his back, and breaking high into the air as though he were playing with his cubs. It was Juan Tola, the outlier, and he said never a word, but continued his horrible sport beside the doles. They had been long in the water now and were swimming wearily, their coats drenched and heavy, their bushy tails dragging like sponges, so tired and shaking that they too were silent, watching the pair of blazing eyes that moved abreast. "'This is no good hunting,' said one, panting. "'Good hunting,' said Mowgli, as he rose boldly at the brute's side, and sent the long knife home behind the shoulder, pushing hard to avoid his dying snap. "'Art thou there, man-cub?' said Wantola across the water. "'Ask of the dead, outlier,' Mowgli replied. "'Have none come downstream? I have filled these dogs' mouths with dirt. I have tricked them in the broad daylight, and their leader lacks his tail.' But here be some few for thee still. Whither shall I drive them? I will wait, said Wantola. The night is before me. Nearer and nearer came the bay of the Sioni wolves. For the pack, for the full pack it is met. And a bend in the river drove the doles forward among the sands and shoals opposite the lairs. Then they saw their mistake. They should have landed half a mile higher up and rushed the wolves on dry ground. Now it was too late. The bank was lined with burning eyes, and except for the horrible fial that had never stopped since sundown, there was no sound in the jungle. It seemed as though Juan Tola were fawning on them to come ashore. And turn and take hold, said the leader of the doles. The entire pack flung themselves at the shore, threshing and squattering through the shoal water, till the face of the Wangunga was all white and torn, and the great ripples went from side to side, like bow waves from a boat. Mowgli followed the rush, stabbing and slicing, as the doles, huddled together, rushed up the river beach in one wave. Then the long fight began, heaving and straining and splitting and scattering and narrowing and broadening along the red, wet sands, and over and between the tangled tree roots, and through and among the bushes, and in and out of the grass clumps, for even now the doles were two to one. But they met wolves fighting for all that made the pack and not only the short, high, deep-chested, white-tusked hunters of the pack, but the anxious-eyed Lahinis, the she-wolves of the lair, as the saying is, fighting for their litters, with here and there a yearling wolf, his first coat still half-woolly, tugging and grappling by their sides. A wolf, you must know, flies at the throat or snaps at the flank, while a dole, by preference, bites at the belly. So when the doles were struggling out of the water and had to raise their heads, the odds were with the wolves. On dry land the wolves suffered, but in the water or ashore Mowgli's knife came and went without ceasing. The four had worried their way to his side. Grey Brother, crouched between the boy's knees, was protecting his stomach while the others guarded his back and either side or stood over him when the shock of a leaping, yelling dole who had thrown himself full on the steady blade bore him down. 
For the rest, it was one tangled confusion, a locked and swaying mob that moved from right to left and from left to right along the bank, and also ground round and round slowly on its own center. Here would be a heaving mound like a water blister in a whirlpool, which would break like a water blister and throw up four or five mangled dogs, each striving to get back to the center. Here would be a single wolf, borne down by two or three doles, laboriously dragging them forward and sinking the while. Here a yearling cub would be held up by the pressure round him, though he had been killed early while his mother, crazed with dumb rage, rolled over and over, snapping and passing on. And in the middle of the thickest press, perhaps one wolf and one dole, forgetting everything else, would be maneuvering for first hold till they were whirled away by a rush of furious fighters. Once Mowgli passed Akela, a dole on either flank, and his all but toothless jaws closed over the loins of a third, and once he saw Feo, his teeth set in the throat of a dole, tugging the unwilling beast forward till the yearlings could finish him. But the bulk of the fight was blind flurry and smother in the dark. Hit, trip, and tumble, yelp, groan, and worry, 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 round him and behind him and above him. As the night wore on, the quick giddy-go-round motion increased. The doles were cowed and afraid to attack the stronger wolves, but did not yet dare to run away. Mowgli felt that the end was coming soon, and contented himself with striking merely to cripple. The yearlings were growing bolder. There was time now and again to breathe and pass a word to a friend, and the mere flicker of the knife would sometimes turn a dog aside. "'The meat is very near the bone!' Gray Brother yelled. He was bleeding from a score of flesh wounds. "'But the bone is yet to be cracked!' said Mowgli. Yawa! Thus we do in the jungle. The red blade ran like a flame along the side of a dole, whose hind quarters were hidden by the weight of a clinging wolf. My kill! snorted the wolf through his wrinkled nostrils. Leave him to me. Is thy stomach still empty, Outlier? said Mowgli. Juan Tola was fearfully punished, but his grip had paralyzed the dole who could not turn round and reach him. "'By the bull that bought me,' said Mowgli, with a bitter laugh, "'it is the tailless one.' And indeed it was the big bay-coloured leader. "'It is not wise to kill cubs and lahinis,' Mowgli went on philosophically, wiping the blood out of his eyes, "'unless one has also killed the outlier. And it is in my stomach that this Juan Tola kills thee.' A dole leaped to his leader's aid, but before his teeth had found Juan Tola's flank, Mowgli's knife was in his throat, and Gray Brother took what was left. "'And thus we do in the jungle,' said Mowgli. Juan Tola said not a word, only his jaws were closing and closing on the backbone as his life ebbed. The dole shuddered, his head dropped, and he lay still and Juan Tola dropped above him. "'Huh! The blood debt is paid,' said Mowgli. "'Sing the song, Juan Tola.' "'He hunts no more,' said Grey Brother. "'And Akela too, is silent this long time.' "'The bone is cracked,' thundered Feo, son of Feona. "'They go. Kill, kill out, O hunters of the free people.' Dole after Dole was slinking away from those dark and bloody sands to the river, to the thick jungle, upstream or downstream, as he saw the road clear. "'The debt! The debt!' shouted Mowgli. "'Pay the debt! They have slain the lone wolf. Let not a dog go!' He was flying to the river, knife in hand, to check any dole who dared to take water, when, from under a mound of nine dead, rose Akela's head and forequarters, 
and Mowgli dropped on his knees beside the lone wolf. "'Said I not it would be my last fight?' Akela gasped. "'It is good hunting. And thou, little brother? I live, having killed many. Even so, I die, and I would, I would die by thee, little brother.' Mowgli took the terrible, scarred head on his knees, and put his arms round the torn neck. "'It is long since the old days of Shere Khan, and a man-cub that rolled naked in the dust.' "'Nay, nay, I am a wolf. I am of one skin with the free people,' Mowgli cried. "'It is no will of mine that I am a man.' "'Thou art a man, little brother.' Wolfling of my watching, thou art a man, or else the pack had fled before the dole. My life I owe to thee, and today thou hast saved the pack, even as once I saved thee. Has thou forgotten? All debts are paid now. Go to thine own people. I tell thee again, I of my... I, this hunting is ended. Go to thine own people. I will never go. I hunt alone in the jungle. I have said it. After the summer comes the rains. And after the rains comes the spring. Go back before thou art driven. Who will drive me? Mowgli will drive Mowgli. Go back to thy people. Go to man. When Mowgli drives Mowgli, I will go, Mowgli answered. There is no more to say, said Akela. Little brother, canst thou raise me to my feet? I also was a leader of the free people. Very carefully and gently, Mowgli lifted the bodies aside and raised Akela to his feet, both arms round him, and the lone wolf drew a long breath and began the death song that a leader of the pack should sing when he dies. It gathered strength as he went on, lifting and lifting and ringing far across the river till it came to the last good hunting and Akela shook himself clear of Mowgli for an instant, and, leaping into the air, fell backward dead upon his last and most terrible kill. Mowgli sat with his head on his knees, careless of anything else, while the remnant of the flying doles were being overtaken and run down by the merciless Lahinis. Little by little the cries died away, and the wolves returned, limping as their wounds stiffened, to take stock of the losses. Fifteen of the pack, as well as half a dozen Lahinis, lay dead by the river, and of the others not one was unmarked. And Mowgli sat through it all till the cold daybreak, when Phao's wet red muzzle was dropped in his hand, and Mowgli drew back to show the gaunt body of Akela. "'Good hunting,' said Phao, as though Akela were still alive. And then, over his bitten shoulder to the others, "'Howl, dogs, a wolf has died tonight.' But of all the pack of two hundred fighting doles, whose boast was that all jungles were their jungle, and that no living thing could stand before them, not one returned to the Deccan to carry that word. End of Red Dog by Rudyard Kipling Story number eight of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling The King's Uncas These are the four that are never content, that have never been filled since the dews began. Jakala's mouth and the glut of the kite and the hands of the ape, and the eyes of man. Jungle Saying 
Ka, the big rock python, had changed his skin for perhaps the two hundredth time since his birth, and Mowgli, who never forgot that he owed his life to Ka for a night's work at Cold Lairs, which you may perhaps remember, went to congratulate him. Skin changing always makes a snake moody and depressed till the new skin begins to shine and look beautiful. Ka never made fun of Mowgli any more, but accepted him, as the other jungle people did, for the master of the jungle, and brought him all the news that a python of his size would naturally hear. What Ka did not know about the middle jungle, as they call it, the life that runs close to the earth and under it, the boulder, the burrow, and the tree-bowl life, might have been written upon the smallest of his scales. That afternoon Mowgli was sitting in the circle of Ka's great coils, fingering the flaked and broken old skin that lay all looped and twisted among the rocks, just as Ka had left it. Ka had very courteously packed himself under Mowgli's broad, bare shoulders, so that the boy was really resting in a living armchair. "'Even to the scales of the eyes it is perfect,' said Mowgli under his breath, playing with the old skin. "'Strange to see the covering of one's own head at one's own feet.' "'Ah, but I lack feet,' said Ka. "'And since this is the custom of all my people, I do not find it strange. "'Does thy skin never feel old and harsh? "'Then go I and wash, Flathead. "'But it is true, in the great heats, "'I have wished I could slough off my skin without pain and run skinless. "'I wash, and also I take off my skin. "'How looks the new coat?' Mowgli ran his hand down the diagonal checkerings of the immense back. "'The turtle is harder-backed, but not so gay,' he said judgmatically. "'The frog, my name-bearer, is more gay, but not so hard. It is very beautiful to see, like the mottling in the mouth of a lily.' "'It needs water. A new skin never comes to full color before the first bath. Let us go bathe.' "'I will carry thee,' said Mowgli, and he stooped down, laughing, to lift the middle section of Ka's great body, just where the barrel was thickest. A man might just as well have tried to heave up a two-foot water main, and Ka lay still, puffing with quiet amusement. Then the regular evening game began. The boy, in the flush of his great strength, and the python in his sumptuous new skin, standing up one against the other for a wrestling match, a trial of eye and strength. Of course Ka could have crushed a dozen Mowgli's if he had let himself go, but he played carefully and never loosed one-tenth of his power. Ever since Mowgli was strong enough to endure a little rough handling, Ka had taught him this game, and it suppled his limbs as nothing else could. Sometimes Mowgli would stand lapped almost to his throat in Ka's shifting coils, striving to get one arm free and catch him by the throat. Then Ka would give way limply, and Mowgli, with both quick moving feet, would try to cramp the purchase of that huge tail as it flung backward, feeling for a rock or a stump. They would rock to and fro, head to head, each waiting for his chance till the beautiful statue-like group melted in a whirl of black and yellow coils and struggling legs and arms to rise up again and again. "'Now, now, now!' said Ka, making feints with his head that even Mowgli's quick hand could not turn aside. "'Look, I touch thee here, little brother, here and here. Are thy hands numb? Here again!' The game always ended in one way, with a straight driving blow of the head that knocked the boy over and over. Mowgli could never learn the guard for that lightning lunge, and, as Ka said, there was not the least use in trying. "'Good hunting,' Ka grunted at last, and Mowgli, as usual, was shot away half a dozen yards, gasping and laughing. 
He rose with his fingers full of grass and followed Ka to the wise snake's pet bathing place, a deep, pitchy black pool surrounded with rocks and made interesting by sunken tree stumps. The boy slipped in, jungle fashion, without a sound, and dived across, rose too without a sound, and turned on his back, his arms behind his head, watching the moon rising above the rocks and breaking up her reflection in the water with his toes. Ka's diamond-shaped head cut the pool like a razor and came out to rest on Mowgli's shoulder. They lay still, soaking luxuriously in the cool water. "'It is very good,' said Mowgli at last, sleepily. "'Now, in the man-pack,' At this hour, as I remember, they laid them down upon hard pieces of wood in the inside of a mud trap, and, having carefully shut out all the clean winds, drew foul cloth over their heavy heads, and made evil songs through their noses. It is better in the jungle. A hurrying cobra slipped down over a rock and drank, gave them good hunting, and went away. Zzzz, said Ka, as though he had suddenly remembered something. So the jungle gives thee all that thou hast ever desired, little brother? <laughs> Not all, said Mowgli, laughing. Else there would be a new and strong Shere Khan to kill once a moon. Now I could kill with my own hands, asking no help of buffaloes. And also... I have wished the sun to shine in the middle of the rains, and the rains to cover the sun in the deep of summer. And also I have never gone empty, but I wished that I had killed a goat. And also I have never killed a goat, but I wished it had been Buck. Nor Buck, but I wished it had been Nilgahi. But thus do we feel, all of us. Thou hast no other desire? the big snake demanded. What more can I wish? I have the jungle, and the favor of the jungle. Is there more anywhere between sunrise and sunset? Now, the cobra said, Ka began. What cobra? He that went away just now said nothing. He was hunting. It was another. Hast thou many dealings with the poison people? I give them their own path. They carry death in the foretooth, and that is not good, for they are so small. But what hood is this thou hast spoken with? Ka rolled slowly in the water, like a steamer in a beam sea. Three or four moons since, said he, I hunted in cold lairs, which place thou hast not forgotten, and the thing I hunted fled shrieking past the tanks into that house whose side I once broke for thy sake, and ran into the ground. But the people of cold lairs do not live in burrows. Mowgli knew that Ka was telling of the monkey people. This thing was not living, but seeking to live, Ka replied with a quiver of his tongue. He ran into a burrow that led very far. I followed, and, having killed, I slept. When I waked, I went forward. Under the earth? Even so, coming at last upon a white hood, a white cobra, who spoke of things beyond my knowledge, and showed me many things I had never before seen. New game? Was it good hunting? Mowgli turned quickly on his side. It was no game, and would have broken all my teeth, but the White Hood said that a man, he spoke as one that knew the breed, that a man would give the breath under his ribs for only a sight of those things. We will look, said Mowgli. I now remember that I was once a man. Slowly, slowly, it was haste killed the yellow snake that ate the sun. We two spoke together under the earth, and I spoke of thee, naming thee as a man, said the White Hood, and he is indeed as old as the jungle. It is long since I have seen a man. Let him come, and he shall see all these things, for the least of which 
very many men would die. That must be a new game. And yet the poison people do not tell us when game is afoot. They are an unfriendly folk. It is not game. It is... it is... I cannot say what it is. We will go there. I have never seen a white hood, and I wish to see the other things. Did he kill them? They are all dead things. He says he is the keeper of them all. Ah, as a wolf stands above meat he has taken to his own lair. Let us go. Mowgli swam to bank, rolled on the grass to dry himself, and the two set off for cold lairs, the deserted city of which you may have heard. Mowgli was not the least afraid of the monkey people in those days, but the monkey people had the liveliest horror of Mowgli. Their tribes, however, were raiding in the jungle, and so cold lairs stood empty and silent in the moonlight. Ka led up to the ruins of the queen's pavilion that stood on the terrace, slipped over the rubbish, and dived down the half-choked staircase that went underground from the center of the pavilion. Mowgli gave the snake call, We be of one blood, ye and I, and followed on his hands and knees. They crawled a long distance down a sloping passage that turned and twisted several times, and at last came to where the root of some great tree, growing thirty feet overhead, had forced out a solid stone in the wall. They crept through the gap, and found themselves in a large vault, whose domed roof had been also broken away by tree roots, so that a few streaks of light dropped down into the darkness. "'A safe lair,' said Mowgli, rising to his firm feet, but over far to visit daily. "'And now what do we see?' "'Am I nothing?' said a voice in the middle of the vault. And Mowgli saw something white move till, little by little, there stood up the hugest cobra he had ever set eyes on, a creature nearly eight feet long, and bleached by being in darkness to an old ivory white. Even the spectacle marks of his spread hood had faded to a faint yellow. His eyes were as red as rubies, and altogether he was most wonderful. "'Good hunting,' said Mowgli, who carried his manners with his knife, and that never left him. "'What of the city?' said the white cobra, without answering the greeting. "'What of the great, the walled city, uh, the city of a hundred elephants and twenty thousand horses and cattle past counting, the city of the king of twenty kings? I grow deaf here.' and it is long since I heard their war-gongs. "'The jungle is above our heads,' said Mowgli. "'I know only Hathi and his sons among elephants. Bagheera has slain all the horses in one village, and what is a king?' "'I told thee,' said Ka softly to the cobra, "'I told thee four moons ago that thy city was not.' THE CITY, THE GREAT CITY OF THE FOREST, WHOSE GATES ARE GUARDED BY THE KING'S TOWERS, CAN NEVER PASS. THEY BUILDED IT BEFORE MY FATHER'S FATHER CAME FROM THE EGG, AND IT SHALL ENDURE WHEN MY SON'S SONS ARE AS WHITE AS I. SALOM TO HE, SON OF Chandrabija, SON OF VIJIJA, SON OF YIGASURI, made it in the days of Papa Rawal, whose cattle are ye. It is a lost trail, said Mowgli, turning to Ka. I know not his talk. Nor I. He is very old. Father of Cobras, there is only the jungle here, as it has been since the beginning. Then who is he? said the white cobra, sitting down before me, unafraid, "'knowing not the name of the king, "'talking our talk through a man's lips. "'Who is he with the knife and the snake's tongue?' 
Mowgli, they call me, was the answer. I am of the jungle. The wolves are my people, and Ka here is my brother, father of cobras. Who art thou? I am the warden of the king's treasure. Kurun Raja builded the stone above me in the days when my skin was dark, that I might teach death to those who came to steal. Then they let down the treasure through the stone, and I heard the song of the Brahmins, my masters. Hmm, said Mowgli to himself. I have dealt with one Brahmin already in the man-pack, and I know what I know. Evil comes here in a little. Five times since I came here has the stone been lifted, but always to let down more and never to take away. There are no riches like these riches, the treasures of a hundred kings. But it is long and long since the stone was last moved, and I think that my city has forgotten. There is no city. Look up. Yonder are roots of the great trees tearing the stones apart. Trees and men do not grow together, Ka insisted. Twice and thrice have men found their way here, the white cobra answered savagely. But they never spoke till I came upon them groping in the dark. And then they cried only a little. But ye come with lies, man and snake both, and would have me believe the city is not, and that my wardship ends. Little do men change in the years, but I change never. Till the stone is lifted and the Brahmins come down, singing the songs that I know, and feed me with warm milk, and take me to the light again, I I, I, and no other, am the warden of the king's treasure. The city is dead, ye say, and here are the roots of the trees. Stoop down, then, and take what ye will. Earth has no treasure like to these. Man with the snake's tongue, if thou canst go alive by the way thou hast entered it, the lesser kings will be thy servants. Again, the trail is lost, said Mowgli coolly. Can any jackal have burrowed so deep and bitten this great white hood? He is surely mad. Father of cobras, I see nothing here to take away. By the gods of the sun and moon, it is the madness of death upon the boy, hissed the cobra. Before thine eyes close, I will allow thee this favor. Look thou and see what man has never seen before. They do not well in the jungle who speak to Mowgli of favors, said the boy between his teeth. But the dark changes all as I know. I will look if that please thee. He stared with puckered-up eyes round the vault, and then lifted up from the floor a handful of something that glittered. Oh, said he, this is like the stuff they play with in the man-pack, only this is yellow and the other was brown. He let the gold pieces fall and moved forward. The floor of the vault was buried some five or six feet deep in coined gold and silver that had burst from the sacks it had been originally stored in, and in the long years the metal had packed and settled as sand packs at low tide. On it and in it and rising through it as wrecks lift through the sand were jeweled elephant howdahs of embossed silver studded with plates of hammered gold and adorned with carbuncles and turquoises. There were palaquins and litters for carrying queens, framed and braced with silver and enamel, with jade-handled poles and amber curtain rings. There were golden candlesticks hung with pierced emeralds that quivered on the branches. There were studded images five feet high of forgotten gods, silver with jeweled eyes. 
there were the coats of mail, gold inlaid on steel and fringed with rotted and blackened seed pearls. There were helmets, crested and beaded with pigeon's blood rubies. There were shields of lacquer, of tortoise shell and rhinoceros hide, strapped and bossed with red gold and set with emeralds at the edge. There were sheaves of diamond-hilted swords, daggers and hunting knives. There were golden sacrificial bowls and ladles and portable altars of a shape that never sees the light of day. There were jade cups and bracelets, there were incense burners, combs and pots of perfume, henna and eye powder, all in embossed gold. There were nose rings, armlets, headbands, finger rings, and girdles past any counting. There were belts, seven fingers broad, of square-cut diamonds and rubies, with wooden boxes, trebly clamped with iron, from which the wood had fallen away in powder, showing the pile of uncut star sapphires, opals, cat's eyes, sapphires, rubies, diamonds, emeralds, and garnets within. The white cobra was right. No mere money would begin to pay the value of this treasure, the sifted pickings of centuries of war, plunder, trade, and taxation. The coins alone were priceless, leaving out of count all the precious stones, and the dead weight of the gold and silver alone might be two or three hundred tons. Every native ruler in India today, however poor, has a hoard to which he is always adding, and though once in a while some enlightened prince may send off forty or fifty bullock-cart loads of silver to be exchanged for government securities, the bulk of them keep their treasure and the knowledge of it very closely to themselves. But Mowgli naturally did not understand what these things meant. The knives interested him a little, but they did not balance so well as his own, and so he dropped them. At last he found something really fascinating laid on the front of a howdah half buried in the coins. It was a three-foot ankus, or elephant goad, something like a small boat hook. The top was one round shining ruby, and eight inches of the handle below it were studded with rough turquoises close together, giving a most satisfactory grip. Below them was a rim of jade with a flower pattern running round it. Only the leaves were emeralds, and the blossoms were rubies, sunk in the cool green stone. The rest of the handle was a shaft of pure ivory, while the point, the spike and hook, were gold-inlaid steel with pictures of elephant-catching, and the pictures attracted Mowgli, who saw that they had something to do with his friend Hathi the Silent. The white cobra had been following him closely. "'Is this not worth dying to behold?' he said. "'Have I not done thee a great favor? "'I do not understand,' said Mowgli. "'The things are hard and cold, and by no means good to eat. "'But this,' he lifted the ankus, "'I desire to take away, that I may see it in the sun.' Thou sayest they are all mine. Wilt thou give it to me, and I will bring thee frogs to eat? The white cobra fairly shook with evil delight. Assuredly I will give it, he said. All that is here I will give thee, till thou goest away. But I go now. This place is dark and cold, and I wish to take the thorn-pointed thing to the jungle. Look by thy foot. What is that there? Mowgli picked up something white and smooth. It is the bone of a man's head, he said quietly. And here are two more. They came to take the treasure away many years ago. I spoke to them in the dark, and they lay still. But what do I need of this that is called treasure? If thou wilt give me the ankus to take away, it is good hunting. If not, it is good hunting none the less. I do not fight with the poison people, and I was also taught the master word of thy tribe. 
There is but one master word here. It is mine. Pa flung himself forward with blazing eyes. Who bade me bring the man? He hissed. I surely, the old cobra lisped. It is long since I have seen man, and this man speaks our tongue. But there is no talk of killing. How can I go to the jungle and say that I have led him to his death? said Ka. I talk not of killing till the time. And as to thy going or not going, there is the hole in the wall. Peace now, thou fat monkey killer. I have but to touch thy neck, and the jungle will know thee no longer. Never man came here that went away with the breath under his ribs. I am the warden of the treasure of the king's city. But thou white worm of the dark, I tell thee, there is neither king nor city. The jungle is all about us, cried Ka. There is still the treasure, but this can be done. Wait a while, Ka of the rocks, and see the boy run. There is room for great sport here. Life is good. Run to and fro a while and make sport, boy. Mowgli put his hand on Ka's head quietly. The white thing has dealt with men of the man-pack until now. He does not know me, he whispered. He has asked for this hunting. Let him have it. Mowgli had been standing with the Ankus held point down. He flung it from him quickly, and it dropped crossways just behind the great snake's hood, pinning him to the floor. In a flash, Ka's weight was upon the writhing body, paralyzing it from hood to tail. The red eyes burned, and the six spare inches of the head struck furiously right and left. Kill! said Ka, as Mowgli's hand went to his knife. No, he said as he drew the blade. I will never kill again, save for food. But look you, Ka! He caught the snake behind the hood, forced the mouth open with the blade of the knife, and showed the terrible poison fangs of the upper jaw lying black and withered in the gum. The white cobra had outlived his poison as a snake will. So, it is dried up, literally a rotted-out tree stump, said Mowgli, and motioning Ka away, he picked up the Ankus, setting the white cobra free. The king's treasure needs a new warden, he said gravely. So, thou hast not done well. Run to and fro and make sport, Thu. I am ashamed. Kill me, hissed the white cobra. There has been too much talk of killing. We will go now. I take the thorn-pointed thing, Thu, because I have fought and worsted thee. See, then, that the thing does not kill thee at last. It is death. Remember, it is death. There is enough in that thing to kill the men of all my city. Not long wilt thou hold it, jungle man nor he who takes it from thee. They will kill and kill and kill for its sake. My strength is dried up, but the Ankus will do my work. It is death. It is death. It is death. Mowgli crawled out through the hole into the passage again, and the last that he saw was the white cobra striking furiously with his harmless fangs at the stolid golden faces of the gods that lay on the floor and hissing, It is death! They were glad to get to the light of day once more, and when they were back in their own jungle and Mowgli made the Ankus glitter in the morning light, he was almost as pleased as though he had found a bunch of new flowers to stick in his hair. Is brighter than Bagriga's eyes, he said delightedly as he twirled the ruby. I will show it to him. But what did the Thu mean when he talked of death? 
I cannot say. I am sorrowful to my tale's tale that he felt not thy knife. There is always evil at cold lairs, above ground or below. But now I am hungry. Dost thou hunt with me this dawn? said Ka. No, Bagheera must see this thing. Good hunting. Mowgli danced off, flourishing the great Ankus, and stopping from time to time to admire it, till he came to that part of the jungle Bagheera chiefly used, and found him drinking after a heavy kill. Mowgli told him all his adventures from beginning to end, and Bagheera sniffed at the Ankus between whiles. When Mowgli came to the White Cobra's last words, the panther purred approvingly. Then the White Hood spoke the thing which is? Mowgli asked quickly. I was born in the king's cages at Odipur, and it is in my stomach that I know some little of man. Very many men would kill thrice in a night for the sake of that one big red stone alone. But the stone makes it heavy to the hand. My little bright knife is better, and see, the red stone is not good to eat. Then why would they kill? Mowgli, go thou and sleep. Thou hast lived among men, and I remember. Men kill because they are not hunting, for idleness and pleasure. Wake again, Bagheera. For what use was this thorn-pointed thing made? Bagheera half opened his eyes. He was very sleepy, with a malicious twinkle. It was made by men to thrust into the head of the sons of Hathi, so that the blood should pour out. I have seen the like in the streets of Odipur, before our cages. That thing has tasted the blood of many such as Hathi. But why do they thrust into the heads of elephants? To teach them man's law. Having neither claws nor teeth, men make these things, and worse. Always more blood when I come near, even to the things the man-pack have made, said Mowgli disgustedly. He was getting a little tired of the weight of the Ankus. If I had known this, I would not have taken it. First it was Masua's blood on the thongs, and now it is Hathi's. I will use it no more. Look. The Ankus flew, sparkling, and buried itself point down thirty yards away between the trees. So my hands are clean of death, said Mowgli, rubbing his palms on the fresh, moist earth. The Thu said death would follow me. He is old and white and mad. White or black or death or life, I am going to sleep, little brother. I cannot hunt all night and howl all day, as do some folk. Bakira went off to a hunting lair that he knew, about two miles off. Mowgli made an easy way for himself up a convenient tree, knotted three or four creepers together, and in less time than it takes to tell, was swinging in a hammock fifty feet above ground. Though he had no positive objection to strong daylight, Mowgli followed the customs of his friends and used it as little as he could. When he waked among the very loud-voiced peoples that live in the trees, it was twilight once more, and he had been dreaming of the beautiful pebbles he had thrown away. "'At least I will look at the thing again,' he said, and slid down a creeper to the earth. But Bagheera was before him. Mowgli could hear him snuffling in the half-light. "'Where is the thorn-pointed thing?' cried Mowgli. "'A man has taken it. Here is the trail. "'Now we shall see whether the Thu spoke truth. "'If the pointed thing is death, that man will die. "'Let us follow.' "'Kill first, said Bagheera. "'An empty stomach makes a careless eye. "'Men go very slowly, and the jungle is wet enough to hold the lightest mark.' They killed as soon as they could, but it was nearly three hours before they finished their meat and drink, and buckled down to the trail. 
the jungle people know that nothing makes up for being hurried over your meals. Think you the pointed thing will turn in the man's hand and kill him? Mowgli asked. The Thu said it was death. We shall see when we find, said Bagheera, trotting with his head low. It is single foot. He meant that there was only one man. And the weight of the thing has pressed his heel far into the ground. Hi, this is as clear as summer lightning, Mowgli answered, and they fell into the quick, choppy trail trot in and out through the checkers of the moonlight, following the marks of those two bare feet. Now he runs swiftly, said Mowgli. The toes are spread apart. They went on over some wet ground. Now why does he turn aside here? Wait, said Bagheera, and flung himself forward with one superb bound as far as ever he could. The first thing to do when a trail ceases to explain itself is to cast forward without leaving your own confusing footmarks on the ground. Bagheera turned as he landed and faced Mowgli, crying, here comes another trail to meet him. It is a smaller foot, this second trail, and the toes turn inward. Then Mowgli ran up and looked. It is the foot of a gond hunter, he said. Look, here he dragged his bow on the grass. That is why the first trail turned aside so quickly. Big foot hid from little foot. That is true, said Bagheera. Now, lest by crossing each other's tracks we foul the signs, let each take one trail. I am Bigfoot, little brother, and thou art Littlefoot, the Gond. Bagheera leaped back to the original trail, leaving Mowgli stooping above the curious narrow track of the wild little man of the woods. Now, said Bagheera, moving step by step along the chain of footprints, I, Bigfoot, turn aside here. Now I hide me behind a rock and stand still, not daring to shift my feet. Cry thy trail, little brother. Now I, Littlefoot, come to the rock, said Mowgli, running up his trail. Now I sit down under the rock, leaning upon my right hand and resting my bow between my toes. I wait long, for the mark of my feet is deep here. I also, said Bagheera, hidden behind the rock, I wait, resting the end of the thorn-pointed thing upon a stone. It slips, for here is a scratch upon the stone. Cry thy trail, little brother. One, two twigs and a big branch are broken here, said Mowgli in an undertone. Now, how shall I cry that? Ah, it is plain now. I, Littlefoot, go away making noises and tramplings so that Bigfoot may hear me. He moved away from the rock, pace by pace among the trees, his voice rising in the distance as he approached a little cascade. I go far away to where the noise of falling water covers my noise, and here I wait. Cry thy trail, Bagheera, Bigfoot. The panther had been casting in every direction to see how Bigfoot's trail led away from behind the rock. Then he gave tongue. I come from behind the rock upon my knees, dragging the thorn-pointed thing. Seeing no one, I run. I, Bigfoot, run swiftly. The trail is clear. Let each follow his own. I run. Bagheera swept on along the clearly marked trail, and Mowgli followed the steps of the Gond. For some time there was silence in the jungle. "'Where art thou, little foot?' cried Bagheera. Mowgli's voice answered him not fifty yards to the right. "'Huh!' said the panther with a deep cough. The two run side by side, drawing nearer. They raced on another half-mile, always keeping about the same distance, till Mowgli, whose head was not so close to the ground as Bagheera's, cried, They have met! 
Good hunting, look. Here stood Littlefoot, with his knee on a rock, and yonder is Bigfoot indeed. Not ten yards in front of them, stretched across a pile of broken rocks, lay the body of a villager of the district, a long, small, feathered, gond arrow through his back and breast. "'Was the Thu so old and so mad, little brother?' said Bagheera gently. "'Here is one death at least.' "'Follow on, but where is the drinker of elephant's blood, the red-eyed thorn?' "'Littlefoot has it, perhaps. It is Singlefoot again now.' The single trail of a light man, who had been running quickly and bearing a burden on his left shoulder, held on round a long, low spur of dried grass, where each footfall seemed, to the sharp eyes of the trackers, marked in hot iron. Neither spoke till the trail ran up to the ashes of a campfire hidden in a ravine. "'Again!' said Bagheera, checking as though he had been turned into stone." The body of a little wizened gond lay with its feet in the ashes, and Bagheera looked inquiringly at Mowgli. "'That was done with a bamboo,' said the boy, after one glance. "'I have used such a thing among the buffaloes when I served in the man-pack. The father of cobras, I am sorrowful that I made a jest of him, knew the breed well, as I might have known.' Said I not that men kill for idleness? Indeed, they killed for the sake of the red and blue stones, Bakira answered. Remember, I was in the king's cages at Odipur. One, two, three, four tracks, said Mowgli, stooping over the ashes. Four tracks of men with shod feet. They do not go so quickly as Gons. Now, what? Evil had the little woodman done to them. See, they talked together, all five standing up, before they killed him. Bagheera, let us go back. My stomach is heavy in me, and yet it heaves up and down like an oriole's nest at the end of a branch. It is not good hunting to leave game afoot. Follow, said the panther. Those eight-shod feet have not gone far. No more was said for fully an hour, as they worked up the broad trail of the four men with shot feet. It was clear, hot daylight now, and Bagheera said, "'I smell smoke.' "'Men are always more ready to eat than to run,' Mowgli answered, trotting in and out between the low scrub bushes of the new jungle they were exploring. Bagheera, a little to his left, made an indescribable noise in his throat. Mm, "'Here is one that has done with feeding,' said he. A tumbled bundle of gay-colored clothes lay under a bush, and round it was some spilt flour. "'That was done by the bamboo again,' said Mowgli. "'See, that white dust is what men eat. They have taken the kill from this one. He carried their food.' and given him for a kill to chill the kite. It is the third, said Bagheera. I will go with new big frogs to the father of cobras and feed him fat, said Mowgli to himself. The drinker of elephant's blood is death himself. But still I do not understand. Follow, said Bagheera. They had not gone half a mile farther when they heard Ko, the crow, singing the death song in the top of a tamarisk under whose shade three men were lying. A half-dead fire smoked in the center of the circle, under an iron plate which held a blackened and burned cake of unleavened bread. Close to the fire and blazing in the sunshine lay the ruby and turquoise Uncas. The thing works quickly. "'All ends here,' said Bakira. "'How did these die, Mowgli? There is no mark on any.' "'A jungle-dweller gets to learn by experience "'as much as many doctors know of poisonous plants and berries. 
Mowgli sniffed the smoke that came up from the fire, broke off a morsel of the blackened bread, tasted it, and spat it out again. Apple of death, he coughed. The first must have made it ready in the food for these who killed him, having first killed the gond. Good hunting indeed. The kill follows close, said Bagheera. Apple of death is what the jungle call thorn apple or dehatura, the readiest poison in all India. What now? said the panther. Must thou and I kill each other for yonder red-eyed slayer? Can it speak? said Mowgli in a whisper. Did I do it a wrong when I threw it away? Between us two it can do no wrong, for we do not desire what men desire. If it be left here, it will assuredly continue to kill men one after another as fast as nuts fall in a high wind. I have no love to men, but even I would not have them die six in a night. What matter? They are only men. They killed one another and were well pleased, said Bagheera. That first little woodman hunted well. They are cubs none the less, and a cub will drown itself to bite the moon's light on the water. The fault was mine, said Mowgli, who spoke as though he knew all about everything. I will never again bring into the jungle strange things, not though they be as beautiful as flowers. This, he handled the Ancus gingerly, goes back to the father of cobras, but first we must sleep, and we cannot sleep near these sleepers. Also we must bury him, lest he run away and kill another six. Dig me a hole under that tree. But, little brother, said Bagheera, moving off to the spot, I tell thee it is no fault of the blood-drinker. The trouble is with the men. All one, said Mowgli. Dig the hole deep. When we wake I will take him up and carry him back. Two nights later, as the white cobra sat mourning in the darkness of the vault, ashamed and robbed and alone, the turquoise Ancus whirled through the hole in the wall and clashed on the floor of golden coins. "'Father of cobras,' said Mowgli. He was careful to keep the other side of the wall. "'Get thee a young and ripe one of thine own people to help thee guard the king's treasure.' so that no man may come away alive any more. Aha! It returns, then. I said the thing was death. How comes it that thou art still alive? The old cobra mumbled, twining lovingly round the Ancus haft. By the bull that brought me, I do not know. That thing has killed six times in a night. Let him go out no more. End of The King's Ancus Story number nine of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling The Spring Running Man goes to man, cried the challenge through the jungle. He that was our brother goes away. Hear now, and judge, O ye people of the jungle. Answer, who shall turn him, who shall stay? Man goes to man. He is weeping in the jungle. He that was our brother sorrows sore. Man goes to man. Oh, we loved him in the jungle. To the man-trail where we may not follow more. The second year, after the great fight with Red Dog and the death of Akela, Mowgli must have been nearly seventeen years old. He looked older, for hard exercise, the best of good eating and baths whenever he felt in the least hot or dusty, had given him strength and growth far beyond his age. He could swing by one hand from a top branch for half an hour at a time when he had occasion to look along the tree roads. He could stop a young buck in mid-gallop and throw him sideways by the head. He could even jerk over the big blue wild boars that lived in the marshes of the north. The jungle people, who used to fear him for his wits, feared him now for his strength, and when he moved quietly on his own affairs, 
the mere whisper of his coming cleared the wood-paths. And yet the look in his eyes was always gentle. Even when he fought, his eyes never blazed as Bagheera's did. They only grew more and more interested and excited, and that was one of the things that Bagheera himself did not understand. He asked Mowgli about it, and the boy laughed and said, When I miss the kill, I am angry. When I must go empty for two days, I am very angry. Do not my eyes talk then? The mouth is angry, said Bagheera, but the eyes say nothing. Hunting, eating, or swimming, it is all one, like a stone in wet or dry weather. Mowgli looked at him lazily from under his long eyelashes, and as usual the panther's head dropped. Bagheera knew his master. They were laying out far up the side of a hill overlooking the Wangunga, and the morning mists hung below them in bands of white and green. As the sun rose it changed into bubbling seas of red gold, churned off, and let the low rays stripe the dried grass on which Mowgli and Bagheera were resting. It was the end of the cold weather. The leaves and the trees looked worn and faded, and there was a dry, ticking rustle everywhere when the wind blew. A little leaf tap-tap-tapped furiously against a twig, as a single leaf caught in a current will. It roused Bagheera, for he snuffed the morning air with a deep hollow cough, threw himself on his back, and struck with his forepaws at the nodding leaf above. "'The year turns,' he said. "'The jungle goes forward. "'The time of new talk is near. "'That leaf knows. "'It is very good.' "'The grass is dry,' Mowgli answered, pulling up a tuft. "'Even Eye of the Spring, that is a little trumpet-shaped waxy red flower that runs in and out among the grasses, even Eye of the Spring is shut, and Bagheera, is it well for the black panther so to lie on his back and beat with his paws in the air, as though he were the tree-cat?' "'Ah,' oh, said Bagheera. He seemed to be thinking of other things. "'I say, is it well for the black panther so to mouth and cough and howl and roll? Remember, we be the masters of the jungle, thou and I.' "'Indeed, yes, I hear, man-cub.' Bagheera rolled over hurriedly and sat up, the dust on his ragged black flanks. He was just casting his winter coat. We be surely the masters of the jungle. Who is so strong as Mowgli? Who so wise? There was a curious drawl in his voice that made Mowgli turn to see whether by any chance the Black Panther were making fun of him, for the jungle is full of words that sound like one thing but mean another. I said we be beyond question the masters of the jungle, Bagheera repeated. Have I done wrong? I did not know that the man-cub no longer lay upon the ground. Does he fly, then? Mowgli sat with his elbows on his knees, looking out across the valley at the daylight. Somewhere down in the woods below a bird was trying over in a husky, reedy voice the first few notes of his spring song. It was no more than a shadow of the liquid, tumbling call he would be pouring later, but Bagheera heard it. "'I said the time of new talk is near,' growled the panther, switching his tail. "'I hear,' Mowgli answered. "'Bagheera, why dost thou shake all over? The sun is warm.' "'That is Ferrao, the scarlet woodpecker,' said Bagheera. "'He has not forgotten. Now I, too, must remember my song.' and he began purring and crooning to himself, harking back dissatisfied again and again. "'There is no game afoot,' said Mowgli. "'Little brother, are both thine ears stopped? That is no killing word, but my song that I make ready against the need. 
I had forgotten. I shall know when the time of new talk is here, because then thou and the others all run away and leave me alone. Mowgli spoke rather savagely. But indeed, little brother, Bagheera began, we do not always— I say ye do, said Mowgli, shooting out his forefinger angrily. Ye do run away, and I, who am the master of the jungle, must needs walk alone. How was it last season, when I would gather sugar-cane from the fields of a man-pack? I sent a runner, I sent thee, to Hathi, bidding him to come upon such a night and pluck the sweet grass for me with his trunk. He came only two nights later, said Bagheera, cowering a little, and of that long sweet grass that pleased thee so, he gathered more than any man-cub could eat in all the nights of the rains. That was no fault of mine. He did not come upon the night when I sent him word. No. He was trumpeting and running and roaring through the valleys in the moonlight. His trail was like the trail of three elephants, for he would not hide among the trees. He danced in the moonlight before the houses of the man-pack. I saw him, and yet he would not come to me, and I am the master of the jungle. It was the time of new talk said the panther, always very humble. Perhaps, little brother, thou didst not that time call him by a master word. Listen to Ferrao, and be glad. Mowgli's bad temper seemed to have boiled itself away. He lay back with his head on his arms, his eyes shut. I do not know, nor do I care, he said sleepily. Let us sleep, Bagheera. My stomach is heavy in me. Make me a rest for my head. The panther lay down again with a sigh, because he could hear Ferrao practicing and re-practicing his song against the springtime of new talk, as they say. In an Indian jungle, the seasons slide one into the other almost without division. There seem to be only two, the wet and the dry, but if you look closely below the torrents of rain and the clouds of char and dust, you will find all four going round in their regular ring. Spring is the most wonderful, because she has not to cover a clean bare field with new leaves and flowers, but to drive before her and to put away the hanging-on, over-surviving raffle of half-green things which the gentle winter has suffered to live, and to make the partly-dressed stale earth feel new and young once more. And this she does so well that there is no spring in the world like the jungle spring. There is one day when all things are tired, and the very smells, as they drift on the heavy air, are old and used. One cannot explain this, but it feels so. Then there is another day, to the eye nothing whatever has changed, when all the smells are new and delightful, and the whiskers of the jungle people quiver to their roots, and the winter hair comes away from their sides in long draggled locks. Then perhaps a little rain falls, and all the trees and the bushes and the bamboos and the mosses and the juicy leafed plants wake with a noise of growing that you can almost hear, and under this noise runs, day and night, a deep hum. That is the noise of the spring, a vibrating boom, which is neither bees nor falling water, nor the wind in treetops, but the purring of the warm, happy world. Up to this year, Mowgli had always delighted in the turn of seasons, it was he who generally saw the first eye of the spring deep down among the grasses, and the first bank of spring clouds, which are like nothing else in the jungle. His voice could be heard in all sorts of wet, star-lighted, blossoming places, helping the big frogs through their choruses, or mocking the little upside-down owls that hoot through the white nights. Like all his people— Spring was the season he chose for his flittings, moving for the mere joy of rushing through the warm air thirty or forty or fifty miles between twilight and the morning star, 
and coming back panting and laughing and wreathed with strange flowers. The four did not follow him on these wild ringings of the jungle, but went off to sing songs with other wolves. The jungle people are very busy in the spring, and Mowgli could hear them grunting and screaming and whistling according to their kind. Their voices then are different from their voices at other times of the year, and that is one of the reasons why spring in the jungle is called the time of new talk. But that spring, as he told Bagheera, his stomach was changed in him. Ever since the bamboo shoots turned spotty brown, he had been looking forward to the morning when the smells should change. But when the morning came, and more the peacock, blazing in bronze and blue and gold, cried it aloud all along the misty woods, and Mowgli opened his mouth to send on the cry, the words choked between his teeth, and a feeling came over him that began at his toes and ended in his hair. A feeling of pure unhappiness, so that he looked himself over to be sure he had not trod on a thorn. More cried the new smells. The other birds took it over, and from the rocks by the Wengunga he heard Bagheera's hoarse scream, something between the scream of an eagle and the neighing of a horse. There was a yelling and scattering of banderlog in the new budding branches above, and there stood Mowgli, his chest filled to answer more, sinking in little gasps as the breath was driven out of it by this unhappiness. He stared all round him, but he could see no more than the mocking bandor log scudding through the trees, and Mar, his tail spread in full splendor, dancing on the slopes below. "'The smells have changed!' screamed Mar. "'Good hunting, little brother. Where is thy answer?' "'Little brother, good hunting!' whistled Cheel the kite, and his mates swooping down together. The two baffed under Mowgli's nose so close that a pinch of downy white feathers brushed away. A light spring rain, elephant rain they call it, drove across the jungle in a belt half a mile wide, left the new leaves wet and nodding behind, and died out in a double rainbow and a light roll of thunder. The spring hum broke out for a minute and was silent, but all the jungle folk seemed to be giving tongue at once, all except Mowgli. "'I have eaten good food,' he said to himself. "'I have drunk good water, nor does my throat burn and grow small, as it did when I bit the blue-spotted root that Oo the turtle said was clean food. But my stomach is heavy.' and I have given very bad talk to Bagheera and others, people of the jungle and my people. Now, too, I am hot, and now I am cold, and now I am neither hot nor cold, but angry with that which I cannot see. Ho, oh, oh, ho, it is time to make a running. Tonight I will cross the ranges. Yes, I will make a spring running to the marshes of the north and back again. I have hunted too easily, too long. The four shall come with me, for they grow as fat as white grubs. He called, but never one of the four answered. They were far beyond earshot, singing over the spring songs, the moon and sombor songs, with the wolves of the pack. For in the springtime the jungle people make very little difference between the day and the night. He gave the sharp, barking note, but his only answer was the mocking mayu of the little spotted tree-cat winding in and out among the branches for early birds' nests. At this he shook all over with rage and half drew his knife. Then he became very haughty, though there was no one to see him, and stalked severely down the hillside, chin up and eyebrows down. But never a single one of his people asked him a question, for they were all too busy with their own affairs. Yes, said Mowgli to himself, 
though in his heart he knew that he had no reason. Let the red dole come from the Deccan, or the red flower dance among the bamboos, and all the jungle runs whining to Mowgli, calling him great elephant names. But now, because Eye of the Spring is red, and more, forsooth, must show his naked legs in some spring dance, the jungle goes mad as Tabaki. By the bull that bought me, am I the master of the jungle, or am I not? Be silent. What do ye hear? A couple of young wolves of the pack were cantering down a path, looking for open ground in which to fight. You will remember that the law of the jungle forbids fighting where the pack can see. Their neck bristles were as stiff as wire, and they bayed furiously, crouching for the first grapple. Mowgli leaped forward, caught one outstretched throat in either hand, expecting to fling the creatures backward, as he had often done in games or pack hunts. But he had never before interfered with a spring fight. The two leaped forward and dashed him aside, and without word to waste, rolled over and over close-locked. Mowgli was on his feet almost before he fell. His knife and his white teeth were bared, and at that minute he would have killed both for no reason but that they were fighting when he wished them to be quiet, although every wolf has full right under the law to fight. He danced around them with lowered shoulders and quivering hand, ready to send in a double blow when the first flurry of the scuffle should be over. But while he waited, the strength seemed to ebb from his body, the knife-point lowered, and he sheathed the knife and watched. "'I have surely eaten poison,' he sighed at last. "'Since I broke up the council with the Red Flower, since I killed Shere Khan, none of the pack could fling me aside. And these be only tail-wolves in the pack, little hunters. Ah, my strength is gone from me, and presently I shall die. O oh, Mowgli, why dost thou not kill them both? The fight went on till one wolf ran away, and Mowgli was left alone on the torn and bloody ground, looking now at his knife and now at his legs and arms, while the feeling of unhappiness he had never known before covered him as water covers a log. He killed early that evening, and ate but little, so as to be in good fettle for his spring running. And he ate alone, because all the jungle people were away singing or fighting. It was a perfect white night, as they call it. All green things seemed to have made a month's growth since the morning. The branch that was yellow-leaved the day before dripped sap when Mowgli broke it. The mosses curled deep and warm over his feet. The young grass had no cutting edges, and all the voices of the jungle boomed like one deep harp-string touched by the moon, the moon of new talk, who splashed her light full on rock and pool, slipped it between trunk and creeper, and sifted it through a million leaves. Forgetting his unhappiness, Mowgli sang aloud with pure delight as he settled into his stride. It was more like flying than anything else, for he had chosen the long downward slope that leads to the northern marshes through the heart of the main jungle, where the springy ground deadened the fall of his feet. A man-taught man would have picked his way with many stumbles through the cheating moonlight, but Mowgli's muscles, trained by years of experience, bore him up as though he were a feather. When a rotted log or a hidden stone turned under his foot, he saved himself, never checking his pace, without effort and without thought. When he tired of ground going, he threw up his hands, monkey fashion, to the nearest creeper, and seemed to float rather than to climb up into the thin branches whence he would follow a tree road till his mood changed, and he shot downward in a long leafy curve to the levels again. There were still hot hollows surrounded by wet rocks, where he could hardly breathe for the heavy scent of the night flowers and the bloom along the creeper buds. 
dark avenues where the moonlight lay in belts as regular as checkered marbles in a church aisle, thickets where the wet young growth stood breast-high about him and threw its arms round his waist, and hilltops crowned with broken rock where he leaped from stone to stone above the lairs of the frightened little foxes. He could hear, very faint and far off, the chug-drug of a boar sharpening his tusks on a bowl, and would come across the great gray brute all alone, scribing and rending the bark of a tall tree, his mouth dripping with foam and his eyes blazing like fire. Or he would turn aside to the sound of clashing horns and hissing grunts, and dash past a couple of furious sambor, staggering to and fro with lowered heads, striped with blood that showed black in the moonlight. Or, at some rushing ford, he would hear Jakala the crocodile bellowing like a bull, or disturb a twined knot of the poison people, but before they could strike he would be away and across the glistening shingle, and deep in the jungle again. So he ran sometimes shouting, sometimes singing to himself, the happiest thing in all the jungle that night, till the smell of the flowers warned him that he was near the marshes, and those lay far beyond his farthest hunting grounds. Here again a man-trained man would have sunk overhead in three strides. But Mowgli's feet had eyes in them, and they passed from tussock to tussock and clump to quaking clump without asking help from the eyes in his head. He ran out to the middle of the swamp, disturbing the duck as he ran, and sat down on a moss-coated tree trunk lapped in the black water. The marsh was awake all around him, for in the spring the bird people sleep very lightly, and companies of them were coming or going the night through but no one took any notice of Mowgli sitting among the tall reeds, humming songs without words, and looking at the soles of his hard brown feet in case of neglected thorns. All his unhappiness seemed to have been left behind in his own jungle, and he was just beginning a full-throat song when it came back again, ten times worse than before. This time Mowgli was frightened. "'It is here also,' he said half aloud. "'It has followed me.' And he looked over his shoulder to see whether the it were not standing behind him. "'There is no one here.' The night noises of the marsh went on, but never a bird or beast spoke to him, and the new feeling of misery grew." "'I have surely eaten poison,' he said in an awe-stricken voice. "'It must be that carelessly I have eaten poison, and my strength is going from me. "'I was afraid, and yet it was not I that was afraid. "'Mowgli was afraid when the two wolves fought. "'Akela, or even Fao, would have silenced them. "'Yet Mowgli was afraid.' That is true sign I have eaten poison. But what do they care in the jungle? They sing and howl and fight and run in companies under the moon, and I, I, my, I am dying in the marshes of that poison which I have eaten. He was so sorry for himself that he nearly wept. And after, he went on, they will find me lying in the black water, Nay, I will go back to my own jungle, and I will die upon the council rock. And Bagheera, whom I love, if he is not screaming in the valley, Bagheera perhaps may watch by what is left for a little, lest Chil use me as he used Akela. A large warm tear splashed down on his knee, and, miserable as he was, Mowgli felt happy that he was so miserable if you can understand that upside-down sort of happiness. As Chil the Kite used Akela, he repeated, on the night I saved the pack from Red Dog. He was quiet for a little, thinking of the last words of the lone wolf, which you, of course, remember. 
Now, Aquila said to me many foolish things before he died, for when we die our stomachs change. He said, Nonetheless, I am of the jungle. In his excitement, as he remembered the fight on Wingunga Bank, he shouted the last words aloud, and a wild buffalo cow among the reeds sprang to her knees, snorting, Man! Ah! Uh, said Misa, the wild buffalo. Mowgli could hear him turn in his wallow. That is no man. It is only the hairless wolf of the Sioni pack. On such nights runs he to and fro. Uh, said the cow, dropping her head again to graze. I thought it was man. I say no. Oh, Mowgli, is it danger? lowed Misa. Oh, Mowgli, is it danger? the boy called back mockingly. That is all Misa thinks for. Is it danger? But for Mowgli, who goes to and fro in the jungle by night, watching, what do ye care? How loud he cries, said the cow. Thus do they cry, Misa answered contemptuously. Who, having torn up the grass, know not how to eat it. For less than this, Mowgli groaned to himself, for less than this even last rains, I had pricked Misa out of his wallow and ridden him through the swamp on a rush halter. He stretched a hand to break one of the feathery reeds, but drew it back with a sigh. Misa went on steadily chewing the cud, and the long grass ripped where the cow grazed. I will not die here he said angrily. Misa, who is of one blood with Jakala and the pig, would see me. Let us go beyond the swamp and see what comes. Never have I run such a spring running, hot and cold together. Up, Mowgli. He could not resist the temptation of stealing across the reeds to Misa and pricking him with the point of his knife. The great dripping bull broke out of his wallow like a shell exploding, while Mowgli laughed till he sat down. "'Say now that the hairless wolf of the Sioni pack once herded thee, Misa,' he called. "'Wolf, thou!' the bull snorted, stamping in the mud. "'All the jungle knows thou wast a herder of tame cattle, such a man's brat as shouts in the dust by the crops yonder. Thou of the jungle!' What hunter would have crawled like a snake among the leeches, and for a muddy jest, a jackal's jest, have shamed me before my cow? Come to firm ground, and I will, ah, I will— Misa frothed at the mouth, for Misa has nearly the worst temper of any one in the jungle. Mowgli watched him puff and blow with eyes that never changed— when he could make himself heard through the pattering mud, he said, "'What man-pack lair here by the marshes, Misa? This is new jungle to me.' Mm, "'Go north, then,' roared the angry bull, for Mowgli had pricked him rather sharply. "'It was a naked cowherd's jest. Go and tell them at the village at the foot of the marsh.' The man-pack do not love jungle tales, nor do I think, Misa, that a scratch, more or less on thy hide, is any matter for a council. But I will go and look at this village. Yes, I will go. Softly now, it is not every night that the master of the jungle comes to herd thee. He stepped out to the shivering ground on the edge of the marsh, well knowing that Misa would never charge over it, and laughed as he ran to think of the bull's anger. "'My strength is not altogether gone,' he said. "'It may be that the poison is not to the bone. "'There is a star sitting low yonder.' "'He looked at it between his half-shut hands. "'By the bull that bought me, it is the red flower, "'the red flower that I lay beside before, "'before I came even to the first Sioni pack.' Now that I have seen, I will finish the running. 
The marsh ended in a broad plain where a light twinkled. It was a long time since Mowgli had concerned himself with the doings of men, but this night the glimmer of the red flower drew him forward. "'I will look,' said he, as I did in the old days, and I will see how far the man-pack has changed. Forgetting that he was no longer in his own jungle, where he could do what he pleased, he trod carelessly through the dew-loaded grasses till he came to the hut where the light stood. Three or four yelping dogs gave tongue, for he was on the outskirts of a village. "'Ho!' said Mowgli, sitting down noiselessly, after sending back a deep wolf-growl that silenced the curs. "'What comes will come. Mowgli, what hast thou to do any more with the lairs of the man-pack?' He rubbed his mouth, remembering where a stone had struck it years ago when the other man-pack had cast him out. The door of the hut opened, and a woman stood peering out into the darkness. A child cried, and the woman said over her shoulder, Sleep! It was but a jackal that waked the dogs. In a little time morning comes. Mowgli in the grass began to shake as though he had fever. He knew that voice well, but to make sure he cried softly, surprised to find how man's talk came back. Messua, oh Messua! Who calls? said the woman, a quiver in her voice. Has thou forgotten? said Mowgli. His throat was dry as he spoke. If it be thou, what name did I give thee? Say. She had half shut the door, and her hand was clutching at her breast. Nathu, oh hey, Nathu! said Mowgli, for, as you remember, that was the name Messua gave him when he first came to the man-pack. "'Come, my son,' she called, and Mowgli stepped into the light and looked full at Messua, the woman who had been good to him, and whose life he had saved from the man-pack so long before. She was older, and her hair was gray, but her eyes and her voice had not changed. Woman-like, she expected to find Mowgli where she had left him, and her eyes traveled upward in a puzzled way from his chest to his head that touched the top of the door. M "'My son!' she stammered, and then, sinking to his feet, "'But it is no longer my son. It is a godling of the woods, a high!' As he stood in the red light of the oil lamp, Strong, tall, and beautiful, his long black hair sweeping over his shoulders, the knife swinging at his neck, and his head crowned with a wreath of white jasmine, he might easily have been mistaken for some wild god of a jungle legend. The child, half asleep on a cot, sprang up and shrieked aloud with terror. Messua turned to soothe him, while Mowgli stood still, looking at the water-jars and the cooking-pots, the grain-bin, and all the other human belongings that he found himself remembering so well. "'What wilt thou eat or drink?' Messua murmured. "'This is all thine. We owe our lives to thee. But art thou him I called Nathu, or a godling indeed?' "'I am Nathu,' said Mowgli. I am very far from my own place. I saw this light and came hither. I did not know thou wast here. After we came to Kaniwara, Masua said timidly, the English would have helped us against those villagers that sought to burn us. Rememberest thou? Indeed, I have not forgotten. But when the English law was made ready, we went to the village of those evil people, and it was no more to be found. That also I remember, said Mowgli, with a quiver of his nostril. My man, therefore, took service in the fields, and at last, for indeed he was a strong man, we held a little land here. It is not so rich as the old village, but we do not need much, we too. Where is he the man that dug in the dirt when he was afraid on that night? He is dead a year. 
And he? Mowgli pointed at the child. My son, that was born two rains ago. If thou art a godling, give him the favor of the jungle, that he may be safe among thy, uh, thy people, as we were safe on that night. She lifted up the child, who, forgetting his fright, reached out to play with the knife that hung on Mowgli's chest, and Mowgli put the little fingers aside very carefully. And if thou art Nathu, whom the tiger carried away, Masua went on choking, he is then thy younger brother. Give him an elder brother's blessing. Hi, Ma, what do I know of the thing called a blessing? I am neither a godling nor his brother, and— Oh, mother, mother, my heart is heavy in me. He shivered as he set down the child. Like enough, said Masua, bustling among the cooking pots, this comes of running about the marshes by night. Beyond question the fever had soaked thee to the marrow. Mowgli smiled a little at the idea of anything in the jungle hurting him. I will make a fire, and thou shalt drink warm milk. Put away the jasmine wreath. The smell is heavy in so small a place. Mowgli sat down, muttering, with his face in his hands. All manner of strange feelings that he had never felt before were running over him, exactly as though he had been poisoned, and he felt dizzy and a little sick. He drank the warm milk in long gulps, Basua patting him on the shoulder from time to time, not quite sure whether he were her son Nathu of the long-ago days, or some wonderful jungle being, but glad to feel that he was at least flesh and blood. Son, she said at last, her eyes were full of pride, have any told thee that thou art beautiful beyond all men? Huh? said Mowgli, for naturally he had never heard anything of the kind. Masua laughed softly and happily. The look in his face was enough for her. I am the first, then? It is right, though it comes seldom, that a mother should tell her son these good things. Thou art very beautiful. Never have I looked upon such a man. Mowgli twisted his head and tried to see over his own hard shoulder, and Masua laughed again so long that Mowgli, not knowing why, was forced to laugh with her, and the child ran from one to the other, laughing too. Nay, thou must not mock thy brother, said Masua, catching him to her breast. When thou art one half as fair, we will marry thee to the youngest daughter of a king, and thou shalt ride great elephants. Mowgli could not understand one word in three of the talk here. The warm milk was taking an effect on him after his long run, so he curled up, and in a minute was deep asleep, and Masua put the hair back from his eyes, threw a cloth over him, and was happy. Jungle fashion, he slept out the rest of that night and all the next day, for his instincts, which never wholly slept, warned him there was nothing to fear. He waked at last with a bound that shook the hut, for the cloth over his face made him dream of traps, and there he stood, his hand on his knife, the sleep all heavy in his rolling eyes, ready for any fight. Masua laughed and set the evening meal before him. There were only a few coarse cakes baked over the smoky fire, some rice and a lump of sour preserved tamarinds, just enough to go on with till he could get to his evening kill. The smell of the dew in the marshes made him hungry and restless. He wanted to finish his spring running, but the child insisted on sitting in his arms and Masua would have it that his long blue-black hair must be combed out. So she sang, as she combed, foolish little baby songs, now calling Mowgli her son, and now begging him to give some of his jungle power to the child. The hut door was closed, but Mowgli heard a sound he knew well, and saw Masua's jaw drop with horror, as a great gray paw came under the bottom of the door, and Grey Brother, outside, whined a muffled, penitent whine of anxiety and fear. Out and wait! Ye would not come when I called. 
said Mowgli in Jungle Talk, without turning his head, and the great gray paw disappeared. Do not, do not bring thy, thy servants with thee, said Messua. I, we have always lived at peace with the jungle. It is peace, said Mowgli, rising. Think of that night on the road to Kanhiwara. There were scores of such folk before thee and behind thee. But I see that even in springtime the jungle people do not always forget. Mother, I go. Masua drew aside humbly. He was indeed a wood god, she thought. But as his hand was on the door, the mother in her made her throw her arms round Mowgli's neck again and again. Come back, she whispered. Son or no son, come back, for I love thee. Look, he too grieves. The child was crying because the man with the shiny knife was going away. Come back again, Masua repeated. By night or by day, this door is never shut to thee. Mowgli's throat worked as though the cords in it were being pulled, and his voice seemed to be dragged from it as he answered, I will surely come back. And now, he said, as he put by the head of the fawning wolf on the threshold, I have a little cry against thee, gray brother. Why came ye not all four when I called so long ago? So long ago? It was but last night. I, we, were singing in the jungle the new songs. For this is the time of new talk, rememberest thou? Truly, truly. And as soon as the songs were sung, Grey Brother went on earnestly, I followed thy trail. I ran from all the others and followed Hotfoot. But, O oh, little brother, what hast thou done? Eating and sleeping with the man-pack? If ye had come when I called, this had never been, said Mowgli, running much faster. And now what is to be? said Grey Brother. Mowgli was going to answer when a girl in a white cloth came down some path that led from the outskirts of the village. Grey Brother dropped out of sight at once, and Mowgli backed noiselessly into a field of high springing crops. He could almost have touched her with his hand when the warm green stalks closed before his face, and he disappeared like a ghost. The girl screamed, for she thought she had seen a spirit, and then she gave a deep sigh. Mowgli parted the stalks with his hands and watched her till she was out of sight. "'And now I do not know,' he said, sighing in his turn, why did ye not come when I called? We follow thee, we follow thee, Grey Brother mumbled, licking at Mowgli's heel. We follow thee always, except in the time of the new talk. And would ye follow me to the man-pack? Mowgli whispered. Did I not follow thee on the night our old pack cast thee out? Who waked thee lying among the crops? I, but again? Have I not followed thee to-night? Ay, but again, and again, and it may be again, Grey Brother. Grey Brother was silent. When he spoke, he growled to himself. The Black One spoke truth. And he said, Man goes to man at the last. Raksha, our mother, said, so also Akela, on the night of Red Dog, Mowgli muttered. So also says Ka, who is wiser than us all. What dost thou say, Grey Brother? They cast thee out once with bad talk. They cut thy mouth with stones. They sent Buldeo to slay thee. They would have thrown thee into the Red Flower. Thou, and not I, hast said that they are evil and senseless. Thou and not I, I follow my own people, didst let in the jungle upon them. Thou and not I didst make song against them more bitter even than our song against Red Dog. I ask thee what thou sayest. They were talking as they ran. Grey Brother cantered on a while without replying, and then he said, 
between bound and bound, as it were. Man-cub, master of the jungle, son of Raksha, lair brother to me, though I forget for a little while in the spring, thy trail is my trail, thy lair is my lair, thy kill is my kill, and thy death-fight is my death-fight. I speak for the three, but what wilt thou say to the jungle? That is well thought. Between the sight and the kill it is not good to wait. Go before and cry them all to the council rock, and I will tell them what is in my stomach. But they may not come. In the time of new talk they may forget me. Hast thou then forgotten nothing? snapped Grey Brother over his shoulder, as he laid himself down to gallop, and Mowgli followed, thinking. At any other season the news would have called all the jungle together with bristling necks, but now they were busy hunting and fighting and killing and singing. From one to another Grey Brother ran, crying, The master of the jungle goes back to man. Come to the council rock. And the happy, eager people only answered, He will return in the summer heats. The rains will drive him to lair. Run and sing with us, Grey Brother. But the master of the jungle goes back to man, Grey Brother would repeat. E? Yawa? Is the time of new talk any less sweet for that? They would reply. So when Mowgli, heavy-hearted, came up through the well-remembered rocks to the place where he had been brought into the council, he found only the four, Baloo, who was nearly blind with age, and the heavy, cold-blooded Ka coiled around Akela's empty seat. "'Thy trail ends here, then, manling,' said Ka, as Mowgli threw himself down, his face in his hands. "'Cry thy cry. We be of one blood, thou and I, man and snake together.' "'Why did I not die under Red Dog?' the boy moaned. "'My strength is gone from me.' and it is not any poison. By night and by day I hear a double step upon my trail. When I turn my head, it is as though one had hidden himself from me that instant. I go to look behind the trees, and he is not there. I call, and none cry again. But it is as though one listened and kept back the answer. I lie down, but I do not rest. I run the spring running, but I am not made still. I bathe, but I am not made cool. The kill sickens me, but I have no heart to fight except I kill. The red flower is in my body, my bones are water, and I know not what I know. What need of talk? said Baloo, slowly turning his head to where Mowgli lay. Akela by the river said it, that Mowgli should drive Mowgli back to the man-pack. I said it, but who listens now to Baloo? Bagheera, where is Bagheera this night? He knows also. It is the law. When we met at cold lairs, Manling, I knew it, said Ka, turning a little in his mighty coils. Man goes to man at the last, though the jungle does not cast him out. The four looked at one another, and at Mowgli, puzzled but obedient. The, the, the jungle does not cast me out, then? Mowgli stammered. Grey Brother and the three growled furiously, beginning, So long as we live, none shall dare. But Baloo checked them. I taught thee the law. It is for me to speak, he said. And though I cannot now see the rocks before me, I see far. Little frog, take thine own trail, make thy lair with thine own blood and pack and people. But when there is need of foot or tooth or eye, or a word carried swiftly by night, Remember, master of the jungle, the jungle is thine at call. The middle jungle is thine also, said Ka. 
I speak for no small people. Hi, my, my brothers, cried Mowgli, throwing up his arms with a sob. I know not what I know. I would not go, but I am drawn by both feet. How shall I leave these nights? Nay, look up, little brother, Baloo repeated. There is no shame in this hunting. When the honey is eaten, we leave the empty hive. Having cast the skin, said Kaa, we may not creep into it afresh. It is the law. Listen, dearest of all to me, said Baloo. There is neither word nor will here to hold thee back. Look up. Who may question the master of the jungle? I saw thee playing among the white pebbles yonder when thou wast a little frog, and Bagheera that bought thee for the price of a young bull newly killed saw thee also. Of that looking over we two only remain, for Raksha thy lair mother is dead with thy lair father. The old wolf pack is long since dead. Thou knowest whither Shere Khan went. And Akela died among the doles, where, but for thy wisdom and strength, the second Sioni pack would also have died. There remains nothing but old bones. It is no longer the man-cub that asks leave of his pack, but the master of the jungle that changes his trail. Who shall question man in his ways? But Bagheera and the bull that bought me, said Mowgli, I would not. His words were cut short by a roar and a crash in the thicket below. And Bagheera, light, strong, and terrible as always, stood before him. Therefore, he said, stretching out a dripping right paw, I did not come. It was a long hunt, but he lies dead in the bushes now, a bull in his second year. The bull that frees thee, little brother. All debts are paid now. For the rest, my word is Baloo's word. He licked Mowgli's foot. Remember, Bagheera loved thee, he cried and bounded away. At the foot of the hill he cried again, long and loud. Good hunting on a new trail, master of the jungle. Remember, Bagheera loved thee. Thou hast heard, said Baloo. There is no more. Go now, but first come to me. O oh, wise little frog, come to me. It is hard to cast the skin, said Kaa, as Mowgli sobbed and sobbed, with his head on the blind bear's side and his arms round his neck, while Baloo tried feebly to lick his feet. The stars are thin, said Grey Brother, snuffling at the dawn wind. Where shall we lair today? For from now we follow new trails. And this is the last of the Mowgli stories. End of The Spring Running Story number 10 of Mowgli from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling The Out Song This is the song that Mowgli heard behind him in the jungle till he came to Masua's door again. Baloo for the sake of him who showed one wise frog the jungle road, keep the law the man-pack make for thy blind old Baloo's sake. Clean or tainted, hot or stale, hold it as it were the trail. Through the day and through the night, questing neither left nor right, for the sake of him who loves thee beyond all else that moves, when thy pack would make thee pain, say, Tabaki sings again. When thy pack would work thee ill, say, Shere Khan is yet to kill. When the knife is drawn to slay, keep the law and go thy way. Root and honey, palm and spathe, 
guard a cub from harm and scathe. Wood and water, wind and tree, jungle favor, go with thee. Ka. Anger is the egg of fear, only lidless eyes are clear. Cobra poison none may leech, even so with cobra speech. Open talk shall call to thee, strength whose mate is courtesy. Send no lunge beyond thy length, lend no rotten bow thy strength, gauge the gape with buck or goat, lest thine eye should choke thy throat. After gorging wouldst thou sleep, look the den is hid and deep. Lest the wrong by thee forgot, draw thy killer to the spot. East and west and north and south, wash thy hide and close thy mouth. Pit and rift and blue pool brim, middle jungle follow him. Wood and water, wind and tree, jungle favor go with thee. Bhagheera In the cage my life began, well I know the worth of man. By the broken lock that freed man-cub, where the man-cubs breed. Scenting dew or starlight pale, choose no tangled tree-cat trail. Pack or counsel, hunt or den, cry no truce with jackal-men. Feed them silence when they say, come with us an easy way. Feed them silence when they seek help of thine to hurt the weak. Make no bandar's boast of skill, hold thy peace above the kill. Let not call, nor song, nor sign, turn thee from thy hunting line. Morning mist or twilight clear, serve him, wardens of the deer. Wood and water, wind and tree, jungle favor, go with thee. The Three On the trail that thou must tread to the thresholds of our dread, where the flower blossoms red, through the nights when thou shalt lie, prisoned from our mother sky, hearing us thy loves go by. In the dawns when thou shalt wake, to the toil thou canst not break, heart-sick for the jungle's sake, wood and water, wind and tree, wisdom, strength and courtesy, jungle favor, go with thee. End of The Outsong End of Mowgli, All of Mowgli's Stories from the Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling